This is our green vest. This is our conveyor belt. This is one of our photo experts. This is a brief history of B&H. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy. And it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories and over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, BNH, how can I help you? Or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkout. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. b &H is not a chain. b &H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are b &H. Oh, and here it is. I am very excited to introduce you to the Surface Book 3. With updated processor options, enhanced graphics performance, and available on either the 13.5 or 15 inch model, Surface Book 3 is the most powerful laptop in the Surface family. So what's new with Surface Book 3? Well, it's all about performance, with both the best battery life and graphics performance of any Surface. With Surface Book 3, you'll leverage the full power of 10th generation Intel Core processors for those pro-grade photo and video editing apps like Adobe Creative Cloud. Or immerse yourself in the latest gaming titles from Xbox Game Pass for PC with the optional discrete graphics card configurations. And of course, multitask between your mission-critical apps like Office, Photoshop, and AutoCAD without missing a beat with up to 32 gigs of RAM and two terabytes of SSD storage. Whether you choose the 15-inch or the 13.5-inch Surface Book 3, configure it to match your lifestyle and profession. And choose the best graphics option for you, including the remarkably powerful GeForce GTX 1660Ti with 6 gigs of dedicated graphics memory. In fact, when the performance enhancements are taken into account, Surface Book 3 13.5-inch is a whopping 50% faster than the previous generation Surface Book 2 13.5-inch. If you spend a lot of time unplugged, Surface Book 3 is a smart fit. It has the best battery life of any Surface device ever. Thanks to batteries, which are both in the display and in the base, Surface Book 3 can deliver up to 15 and a half hours on the 13.5 inch model and up to 17 and a half hours on the 15 Book 3 truly has been designed to power you through even your busiest days. Surface Book has always been known for its versatility, and Surface Book 3 is certainly no different, with both USB Type-C, USB Type-A ports, and a full-size SD card slot. Our engineers have been hard at work refining the build quality of Surface devices for years, and sometimes it's the smallest details that can make the most impact. For example, Surface Book 3 detaches from its base twice as quickly as Surface Book 2. That of course means you can quickly move between the different user modes of Surface Book 3 so that you can create your best work using Surface Pen or Surface Dial. Upload your best videos using the 1080p front-facing camera. Or kick back and use your keyboard and mouse or an Xbox One wireless controller to play some of the most popular and intense games available. So, are you hungry for power? Do you demand that tailored solution for your work? Are you not a fan of compromises? Then take a closer look at the most powerful laptop of the Surface family, the Surface Book 3.
Hello, and welcome to b and Depth of Field 2021 conference coming to you virtually this year, like so many other events across the globe. I'm David Brommer, your Depth of Field host and MC. We're here in the b and Superstore before it opens to the public. And let me tell you, it's a fun place to have to ourselves. Any camera, any piece of gear, it's all here. Now, it seems like a million years ago, the Depth of Field 2020 occurred and the pandemic was just starting to be discussed. We all gathered at the New Yorker Hotel, just a block away from here, from the Superstore. This is where Greg Gorman and Mick Kroc were our keynote speakers. We built a giant studio filled with lighting sets and multiple models. We had a main stage and two second stages, a workflow room and a one-on-one -on -one portfolio reviews. People flew in from across the country. It was the best depth of field we've hosted yet. And then everything shut down. So here we are, a year later, and a brand new world. We at B&H sincerely hope you, your family, and your business weathered the storm as best as could be. We had a rough go at it in New York City, but we stayed the course, modified our business to accommodate the pandemic, and are happily to continually serve you in this turbulent time. Now, how does one survive, and hopefully thrive, in times like these? Well, one thing that kept me on track was a quote from Frank Herbert's Dune movie. The hero, Paul Atreides, played by Kyle MacLachlan, is facing off against his nemesis, Fade Routha, played by Sting. It's looking bad for our hero. And then he focuses and says, I will bend like a reed in the wind. And with that, he rolls over and turns the tide, besting his adversary. Now, reeds are weaker than branches, but because they bend, they don't break like tree branches in storms. The lesson is to roll with the punches and come out up on top, adapt and overcome. That's what Paul did, and so has successful businesses and the new normal. We at B&H adapted the store, our shipping, and a way of serving our customers, like offering a brand new category, PPE. I've spoken with many of our professional customers and have heard of wonderful new ways that they adapted, where portrait sessions ended up being conducted on Zoom, looking for new customers outside of their normal wedding and portrait businesses to take on commercial jobs they would have walked away from last year. At our heart, we are artists, and the spirit of the artist is creativity. Being creative with business and navigating these uncertain waters was a task our customers took to heart and learned new ways to continue. And for that, we here at B&H, we salute you. Because you're the professionals who figured out how to survive in a very difficult time. And that brings us to the focus of the 2021 Depth of Field Conference. At our heart, we've always been about cultivating new photographers and reinvigorating veteran pro photographers. This year, our mission and curation of the Depth of Field experience is focused on helping you more than ever with your professional endeavors. Our 2021 keynote speaker, the great Mark Seliger, squeezed lemons of this pandemic and managed to publish a coffee table book on the silent streets of lockdown New York City, as well as a print auction as part of a collaboration with RAD, the Red Carpet Advocacy, working with Christie's to raise money for the fight against the ongoing pandemic. I do believe that his print sales and donations reached over $300,000. So watch this program later this afternoon to learn some more of this. It's really a great story. When working with awesome photographers and videographers, we asked for content that could benefit the working creative. This year's program is like a tool chest of ideas to help you navigate the time we're in. We invited back select depth of field alumni speakers, such as Dr. Tamaya Colvin, to speak about a very frequent question we hear asked, how to price your work, and Charmy Penna to offer disaster proofing your business. Utility classes like legendary Scott Kelby making the most out of just one light. J.B. Salih giving business tips in the form of golden nuggets. Matt Sutherland will speak about adding video to your studio's offerings. And just so much more, the undisputed master photographer, Jerry Gihonis is here, again. Depth of field newcomer and New York City photographer, Claudia Paul. Lawyer, politician, photographer, Kesha Lambert. The amazing commercial and portrait photographer, Victoria Will. The return of the dynamic duo and Depth of Field 2018 alumni shooting team, Creative Soul. Portrait photographer extraordinaire, Tracy Magalowski. Skateboard, sports photographer, Atiba Jefferson. And last but not least, 
professor and all around digital guru, Rafael Concepcion, AKA RC. We're all coming together on one virtual stage to bring you depth of field and help you grow. So before we go further, let's talk about the details of depth of field and some virtual housekeeping. Now we are here in the B&H store before it opens up and they're getting all the stock ready and making adjustments. So forgive us if you hear a little bit of noise in the background. There's a lot going on with depth of field and it's all very exciting. Here is how to get the most out of it. If you're watching me, then you're on the main stage. This is where you'll be able to watch the presentations from the speakers of depth of field. All of these prezos will be available after the debut for you to rewatch. Or if you missed any, don't worry, we have you covered. We're offering a live Q&A in the trade show after each speaker presents, so you can meet these titans of photography and have your questions answered. Look for the key card after each presentation to learn which trade show Zoom room they'll be in. There's three of them. Now, the main stage is only part of the shared experience. We have a vibrant trade show using Zoom with more speakers and programs, as well as you can find main stage presenters after the programs. The full schedule is on the Depth of Field homepage, so you can customize your depth of field day. Now one note, the trade show programs are not being recorded. It's happening live. So if you specifically want to see a program in the trade show, pick the trade show first. Remember, the main stage is being recorded. We got you covered. The trade show is like walking through depth of field at the New Yorker Hotel. We have our platinum and gold sponsors in the Grand Ballroom. These are big brands like Canon, Nikon, Sony, and more. Now in the Crystal Ballroom, you'll find silver sponsors that represent critical support brands. And we also have the B&H Experts Room, where smaller but still important support brands showcase their wares. The trade shows allow you to interact with brand tech reps and get a handle on the latest technology to help you make the best decisions possible. But take a look at the full schedule. You won't want to miss the myriad opportunities found in the trade show. And you can dialogue and ask questions with these experts. Who loves a good trade show? Well, we all do, because it's ground zero for what's new. So the Depth of Field show book is another place where you'll find special pricing good till March 13th. You can click on the tab to download the show book, as well as special content curated from the B&H Explorer blog. Don't know what Explorer is? It's a resource where you can find articles, gear reviews, and ideas about photography on the main B&H website. It's even home to the B&H Photography Podcast. So another gem in the show book is the lit word find. Seriously, the show book is lit. Check it out. Plus you can save some money on that new lens that you can't live without. Those new lenses. <laughs> so on a personal note, I'm very enthusiastic about the Depth of Field show book. It reads like a photo magazine of yesteryear and even features a gallery of images from the amazing speakers at Depth of Field. Pretty sweet. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did putting it together. Don't forget to check out that word find. Now, if you've been paying attention to Depth of Field, you'll know the fun started back in early February with a rollout of educational webinars featuring Depth of Field speakers, Atiba Jefferson, Luke Edmondson, Tisha Lambert, Charmi Penna, and Sabor Amarzati, as well as two amazing critique sessions, one featuring portraits and pro photography website reviews conducted by Jerry Gihonis. We have all those sessions for you to watch on your own time, and you can find them on the webinars and critiques tab. Now, I highly recommend the critique sessions. Back when I was learning how to shoot weddings for Lorston Thomas Studios in New Jersey, back in the late 80s, I recall my manager and mentor, Areste Delamico, taking stacks of proofs from weddings I had shot and going over each picture, making constructive comment on each one. Where's the cuff? Move the hands up. Center the bride. Exposure too hot. And a myriad of other photo mistakes that I had made. After a rest day pointed these out to me, I never made those mistakes again. Critiques are very important. It's really a great way for us to grow. Now, back when we were doing Depth of Field Live, we had a giant studio set up where you could shoot models on sets with the latest gear from our sponsors, tweak them in a pro photography workflow room using HP computers and Adobe software with pro instruction, and then make prints with Epson and Canon printers. We then asked you to submit your work that you just created to the Depth of Field Challenge. Well, since we can't meet in person, we took the Depth of Field Challenge and made it a massive photo contest where we created 12 categories and asked you to submit your best work for free where you could win big. We had thousands of entries and our Depth of Field speakers chose one winner in each of the 12 categories. Now, over the course of the next two days, we'll be announcing those winners. The work was stunning and the prizes are valued at over $18,000. 
you can check the schedule to see when each category winner will be announced. Good luck and congrats to the winners. The contest, by the way, was free enter and the prizes are really top shelf. So if you missed the announcements, we'll have a gallery of winning images published on the website by the end of the week. So you can check that out. The Depth of Field Challenge is back and it's back in a big way. Now we wouldn't be able to produce Depth of Field if it weren't for our amazing partners who sponsor Depth of Field. This year, we're proud to say we have over 35 industry giants who have come to be part of Depth of Field. The sponsors represent the state of the art in photo and video equipment. Please join me in saying thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, sponsors. Thank you so much. You've made it possible to produce Depth of Field. Come on, everybody, let's all hear it. Say thank you to our sponsors. We here at B&H fully support all our image makers of any race, creed, color, religion, background, or gender. Our speaker range has reflected that commitment over the past four Depth of Field conferences. And we are very pleased this year to host the first ever photography panel in support of International Women's Day. We've invited one of the industry's most important women, Lauren Wendell, to lead a panel on what inspired the women speakers at Depth of Field. It will be the last live program we offer tomorrow night and it's going to close out the show. I'm especially looking forward to the program as it supports a giant movement in photography by acknowledging the impact women had on a field traditionally dominated by men. Lastly, I would be remiss if I were not to thank my coworkers at B&H who came together to produce this event. Now, there are many moving parts and tons of passion found in the store, the offices just a block up from the store and the warehouses located over in New Jersey. During these difficult times, B&H was a security blanket of caring to its employees, and we found direction in continuing our work. We are a family, and families take care of each other. The B&H customers are our neighbors and our friends. We all work together. You come to us for advice and in support of the form of inspiration and equipment to realize your creative endeavors. We are honored to support you, and in return for supporting us, we truly appreciate your business, and we strive to be here for you in years to come. Now, after a long year, we can finally see the light growing at the end of this past year's dark tunnel. That light will guide us safely as we emerge from that tunnel and reach new heights with lessons learned and steadfast dedication to being the best and most professional we can all be. At Depth of Field 2019, I shared the wisdom from my father who I lost last December and felt it was important enough to share again. It was Ed Brommer's secret to success. And this wooden block sat on his desk. During his 43 years as a salesman and manager at Sears Roebuck and Company, the secret to sex, success is work. Honest, straightforward, ethical work. So thank you, Dad, for imbuing this ethic to me and finding this company that I could call family and be able to stand here sharing his wisdom and the accumulated wisdom of all who support Depth of Field. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the 2021 Depth of Field program. Let's get to work, shall we? And let's start the show. Thanks, everyone. B&H presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021. The Aerial Wedding Award, sponsored by DJI, featuring the DJI Mavic 2 Pro with Smart Controller. And the winner is... Autumn Love by Andy Rivera. Congratulations. At B&H, we found a way for you to save the tax. Have to have the latest Sony camera and save the tax? You got it. Need the new MacBook Pro? It's yours. How about a supersonic high-def telescope? We got you. Meet Payboo. You pay the tax, we pay you back, just like that. B&H.
they've called us. The Hunters of Light. We search for the things that have yet to exist. Challenging the traditions. Foraging through the shadows. Listening for the subtle changes. This is us. We are not as the others are. We do not see as the others see. From the distant shores to the far off worlds. We've made friends with the beasts. The wind. We've made vows to the land. Signed deals with the sky. Now let us write together a new chapter. Kesha Lambert is an international wedding and portrait photographer and lawyer based in New York. A Sony artisan of imagery and speaker, Kesha has had the honor of personally photographing hundreds of weddings to date for couples from all over the globe. Using the wealth of knowledge that she has gained through her experience as a photographer, business owner, and lawyer, Kesha enjoys sharing information with her peers and aims to be a resource to fellow photographers in the areas of business and personal development. Kesha brings passion, intelligence, integrity, and commitment to her work. Thanking Sony for sponsoring this first speaker and welcome to Depth of Field, Kesha Lambert.
you. <laughs> and I'm Kesha Lambert. Thank you so much for joining me at BH Depth of Field. I'm so excited to share on this topic. I'll be sharing today all about working under pressure as a wedding photographer and how to get amazing results even though you're working under pressure. Wedding photographer success under pressure. Before we jump in, a quick history. I am Kesha Lambert. I am the founder of Kesha Lambert Photography. We are a wedding and portrait photography business based out of New York. So we work primarily in the New York City tri-state area. We also travel for assignments. So we photograph weddings all over the country and internationally. I have been a wedding and portrait photographer full time for over six years now. And through the course of that experience, I have learned some amazing things about being able to produce at a high level, even under pressure. So let's talk gear quickly. What's in my bag? So being a wedding and portrait photographer, I, who works on location, I work on location primarily for weddings. We're usually at the wedding venue. We work uh, with a lot of portrait clients where we're photographing them on location. And so I do a lot of on the fly work. Uh, so for that reason, I like to keep things simple and lightweight. You'll usually find two camera bodies strapped to me via my whole fast harness with my two go-to lenses. And I'm usually shooting either very like ultra, ultra wide or with a medium telephoto. And right now I'm obsessed with the Sony 12 to 24 GM and the 85 millimeter GM. And so those are the lenses that you'll find uh, on my person when I'm working. And I am working with the A92 and the A7R4. For lighting, I work with splashes and medium strobes. So my go-tos are the A1 and the Profoto B10 and B10 Plus. I also and work with continuous lights. So I have the Stella Pro Light CLX10, which I love. I am a big user of Magmod, as are many, many wedding photographers, wedding uh, people who work on location and on the fly who need to be lightweight and compact. It's an excellent tool um, for modifying your flashes. And so I use the Magmod system. And uh, I'm usually working with an assistant uh, off cam for, for, for lighting to assist with lighting and other random things that may come up while working. And so I have all of the things that I could potentially need. Usually, although I like to be lightweight, I have all of the things on hand and I may not be carrying them with me. Um, and some of those things will include light stands and, and um, all the other wonderful things that help us to be able to do our job bring a bag of tricks. Here is a list of some of the things that you might find in my bag of tricks at any given client job. Gels. I love working with gels, the mag gels from Magmod in particular, because they're lightweight and portable and give me a tool to use to transform the look of a location. Gels can make an ugly space look beautiful and grand and uh, add a, a pop of wow to a, a portrait. Fabric for shoot through, clear umbrellas in case it rains, prisms, confetti, and other similar icebreakers because confetti, although extremely messy, is a great way to lighten the mood and get your clients to let their guard down. Tree lights, mirror for reflection photos, glitter, a bubble wand, atmosphere, smoke bombs, a spray bat bottle for faking rain or water droplets, mannequin dress torso, and steel wool. It's so random and the list goes on. It can You can update it and change it, but bring a bag of tricks. Wedding photographer life is all about working under pressure. We work under pressure because there's so much expectation and expense built into this one day. And after all is said and done, all the couple has are the photos and the film. They have their visuals when all is said and done. 
Wedding photographers work under pressure because they work under time pressure. We have to be attuned to capturing the day as it unfolds, to the emotion, to the moments, to documenting the story component of the wedding day. But also we have deliverables as wedding photographers. We have, whether you use a physical one or a mental one, we have a shot list. There are things that we need to deliver on for our clients. All of these things amount to pressure mental pressure of wanting to produce an outcome that will make your clients happy with knowing that there are no do-overs and then actual pressure like time pressure to produce what is your fail safe your couple has invested significantly in both a film team and a wedding photography team they care very much about both being amazing but both you and the film team need a lot of the same shots and need to be in a lot of the same places at the same time. You both need time alone with the couple. And guess what? You've just been told that you've got 15 minutes to do it all. What would you do? Your couple that has stressed to you over the course of the months leading up to their wedding day, how important it is that it is of the utmost importance that they have sunset photos out on this bridge. They've had their heart set on it for years and it's their wedding day and mother of the groom is late. She is nowhere to be found. She hasn't showed up and they do not want to start the ceremony without her. Here we are on the wedding day with our couple who really has their heart set on sunset photos, but their wedding is starting two hours late because they will not start without mom of the groom. You see, with weddings, they are an interesting hybrid of both predictable and unpredictable. On the one hand, they're predictable because a lot of the same things happen across weddings. Weddings are highly ritualistic. You may have variations here and there, but the format remains the same for the most part, and our couples tend to want a lot of the same types of shots. However, it can be unpredictable because a wedding day is full of tiny little cogs with a symbiotic relationship into working together. We're each interdependent on each of these cogs showing up when they need to be there, performing and functioning the way they need to, to, to function. We've got the makeup artist and the hairstylist and the florist and the officiant. We've got important family members, all of, who, all, all of whom need to show up at the exact right time that they're prescribed to show up, all of whom need to have a smooth functioning of providing their services in the case of a vendor. In the case of family members, we need them there and present if they're important. In the case of the wedding party, we need them to show up when, they, when, when, it's, time to, when it's time to go. Little tiny cogs that are each interdependent on each other. And what that means is that there's a certain degree of control that we might have over ourselves and how things function, but ultimately we don't have control over how the wedding day unfolds. And that's pretty nerve wracking for some, right? We want to feel like we can manage our risk wholly and entirely. But when, when it comes to weddings, we only have control over the part, the role that we play in making this wedding day amazing. Experience, mindset, preparation. Experience comes with time, but mindset and preparation are things that you can work on and start applying right now, even without experience. Let's talk about it. Some of the things that you need to train your mind for in order to perform under pressure confidence, resilience, and fluidity. You need to be able to improvise and be fluid. You need to be resilient and be able to keep moving forward even if you've messed up or even if things have gone out of whack and they're not unfolding the way you anticipated or planned for. And you need to have confidence. You need to be able to make moves and make decisions in the moment. And some of the things that you really need to eliminate are overthinking, self-doubt, and worry. These are some of the things that typically happen when things go off script on the wedding day. 
for those that are planners and preparers and really likes to cross all of our T's and dot all of our I's, it can throw you off and it, when things go left. Overthinking is crippling. Self-doubt will stop you from, from doing the thing that is necessary in the moment. And worry is the mo one of the most useless emotions. Yet all of these things are natural human inclination. And even if you are inclined to worry, even if you find yourself doubting yourself, even if you are inclined to overthink, you can train yourself to do otherwise. And so some of the things that you can do are do the things that build your confidence. If, for example, you worry about being thrown a curveball in terms of a lighting situation, then carve out time to educate yourself and practice um, with your lighting. When you have, when you, <clears throat> when you are equipped with experience, and when you are equipped with the knowledge that you have done this before, it builds confidence. Some of the other things that you can do is gain information. We are in a world of information. Information is right at our fingertips. The key in all of this is that information is empowering. Information equips you with what you need to build, to feel that you are prepared and ready. And this all takes a conscious effort. What you want to do is replace overthinking, self-doubt and worry with a conscious effort and information. And what do I mean? Even if you are inclined to overthink or, or worry or doubt yourself, you can train yourself to do otherwise. You can make a conscious effort to turn that switch off. It takes effort for some of us. Some people have the personality where they're just inclined to be, uh, to improvise in the moment. And they, instead of crippling them when things go left, it actually inspires them. If you are not that person, that's okay because there are so many people who are not that person. And that's where conscious effort comes into play. Information gathering is another way that you can get rid of overthinking self-doubt and worry. And what I mean is education and learning is a confidence booster. If there are things that have thrown you for a loop on the wedding day, or if there are things that you worry about, well, will I know how to do this? What what would happen if the timeline goes out of whack? What will happen if the bride's dress rips? What will happen if I can't set up in this particular spot because the film team also needs to set up there? Spending time in the days leading up to the wedding day, ingesting information. That means that you are walking into the wedding day prepared and a prepared mind is a mind that is ready to wow. Preparation means that you should have a blueprint. You should have a plan for the unplanned. And how do we develop our blueprint? It starts with the client. It starts with the client's expectations. The reason it centers around the client is because a lot of our worry, a lot of our concern surrounds itself around wanting to make our clients happy. We want to exceed their expectations. And expectations are such a nuanced, interesting thing. It's hard to ever fully know what the client really expects. That's like getting a window into their mind. And so we may think that because they chose us and they saw our, our beautiful websites and our beautiful work and the, that they know a little about us, they're really excited, excited to work with us. And we may think that coupled with the fact that they have shown us all of their Pinterest boards, they've shared their wish list, they've looped us in on all the things that are important to them, we may feel like we have a window into what they want. But it's not enough to have a window into what they want. It really is important to take steps to condition what they want. You as the photographer are uniquely positioned to influence their expectations for the outcome. This is a training of the client's expectation. And it is so important to do this because this really lays the groundwork for the outcome of that client relationship. 
So what are some things that we can do to condition or train the client's expectation, to influence their expectation? Well, it, it starts with building trust and rapport because it's really important for the client to be able to trust you to be the expert and trust you to take the lead. And rapport is also crucial because when those mishaps happen, when those things, when things go left, that client rapport is going to be the thing that helps you to get through it successfully. We also want to, the client to feel prepared by you. We want to provide them information and guidance about the flow of the experience and what the outcome of the experience is likely to be. We want to give them a narrative that sounds optimistic and beautiful, but also realistic. It means framing this narrative as something positive. The narrative that things could go left, things could go off script, but there are opportunities when things go off script. And if they remain open to the possibility of the magic that we can get when things go off script, that is going to be a wonderful thing. They'll be very happy. Well, how do you build trust and, and rapport? You build trust first by collecting information from your client. Learn all the things about your client. There's so many ways to do this. You can connect with them uh, through phone calls and, and Zoom meetings. You can also use questionnaires, which I speak about often because I love them. It's a, they're a great way to get a, a quick crash, a crash course on who your clients are. And ask all kinds of questions, all kinds of questions that you might be curious about to gather as much information as possible to give you a window into their minds and what is important to them and what makes them tick and what makes them light up. You build rapport by being intentional about the way you connect with them. You should have a game plan for the client communication. You should have a blueprint for how many times your client, you and your client connect in the days leading up to the wedding. This does not have to be a hundred times. The important part here is that your client has connected with you in the days leading up to the wedding beyond say the engagement session, that's one touch point beyond the initial consultation. That's another touch point. You want to interact with your client throughout. And another part of rapport building is keeping your word. If you say that you're going to do something, do that. Keeping track of the communication that you engage in with your client and being a person of your word are the simple ingredients to building trust and rapport. You also want to provide information because when you provide information, it puts nervous minds at ease. When you provide information, it puts the micromanager's mind at ease because they know that you have a plan. They know you not only have a plan, but in that plan, you're telling them that things will be okay if things go off script. And that should be a part of your narrative in your welcome kit, your what to expect, framing this conversation in a way that sounds optimistic and also sounds realistic. Once you've done that, when you've exercised intentional efforts in building trust and rapport, in providing information to your clients and connecting with them, you still need to cover your bases. And what does that look like? It means asking for what you need. So for example, if you need an hour for your wedding party photos, ask for that hour and make it a contractual obligation. If you need hair and makeup to be done and complete at the time of your arrival, ask for that. If you know that guest photography, people shooting over your shoulder while you're working, will interfere with your ability to produce, then ask for carved out time alone with the couple where there are no distractions and a space, a designated space for that to happen. Now, will that happen in actuality, in real time? 
Asking for what you need serves two purposes. It's really about planting seeds for what you need to get the optimal outcome, to get that outcome that the client has their heart set on. Well, these are all the things that we need to do that. It's setting the tone. It's letting, putting them on notice that these things are conditional without making it negative. They're now agreeing to provide these things to you. And no, we don't necessarily expect that all of these things will actually happen on the wedding day. We hope they do. And many times they do happen. But what we are doing is planting the seed that if we want this outcome and we do all, we need to do all of these things, then we will get that outcome. We will get that photo at sunset that you have your heart set on. So it's important to ask for what you need so that you can set the tone for what is needed for everything to work smoothly. Asking for what you need shifts the expectation for who is responsible to produce this happy outcome. We're both responsible. We're both need to do something in order to get here. And we're going to do it together and we're going to get it done. We're not framing in this, we're not framing this in a way that sounds confrontational. We are putting it in our contract. But we're framing it in a way that this takes a team effort and we are excited to work together collaboratively, a collaborative effort to produce this outcome that will wow you and make you happy. Once you've asked for what you need and you've put it in your, you've documented it, you've put it in your contract, you need to remind them repeatedly. Sometimes people skip on reading things. Sometimes things go into one ear and out the other. Whatever the case might be, this is where repetition comes into play. And so what repetition looks like is that these seeds that you're planting appear, make an appearance in all of your touch points with the client. So if there's a welcome client gift or a what to expect magazine that you send out at the start of a client relationship, well, some of this information should be in there as well. If there are email confirmations going out about engagement sessions or, or confirmations going out about the wedding day, confirmations or updates about the wedding, this information should be infused into those places as well. Each and every space that you touch and have a communication with the client should infuse this information, the what I need information. Do it in a way that is natural and makes sense, but Fit it, infuse it into every part of your communication plan with your client. So now that you have planted seeds and you have infused all of the reminders throughout your communication with the client, it's time to talk about preparing for the wedding day. Let's talk the practical things first, the timeline. How much input should you have in that timeline? How much control should you try to exercise over that timeline? I'm of the mindset that the timeline should be in the control of the client or the client's wedding planner. And so when it comes to the timeline, my involvement goes to providing the client and the planner as the person that is sculpting out the timeline for their wedding day. I provide them the information they need to sculpt that timeline out. I let them know how I work how much time I typically need to do getting ready shots or how much time I typically need to photograph the couple alone, how much time I need for wedding party photos, what my needs are in terms of time throughout the day. I also, if, if, to the extent that this is a client flying solo, we all know that many clients have no clue what they're doing when it comes to planning out their wedding day. They also tend not to be aware of how quickly time can evaporate by the sneakiest little things. Something as simple as trying to adjust something on your dress could make 10 minutes evaporate. Something as simple as trying to move your wedding party from this side of the street to the other side of the street can take 20 minutes. It's just so fascinating how the tiniest little, sneakiest little things can consume time on the wedding day. And these are some of the things that the, may not be on the couple's radar when they, if they are in control of planning out the timeline. So one of the things that I will do for the couple that is planning the timeline on their own is I will send them a form that kind of puts them on notice for what 
I need in terms of time, but also gives them a general idea of these, puts them on notice of the types of things that can consume time. So putting in that buffer, I make recommendations. I recommend that you carve out two hours for this. I recommend that you give yourself buffer between these locations. And I'm not taking over the planning and the structuring of the timeline, but from a photographer's perspective, I'm letting them know how much time these things can really take because a lot of the disconnect, a lot of the mistakes that people make with the timeline and planning it has to do with not anticipating those tiny little variables that can make things go longer. It's super important to get a timeline and lay eyes on it because although we know that things don't always go as planned, you need to have a game plan because that gives you a point of reference to look to. And if things do go off script, it gives you a point of reference to know where you can get regain some of that time back. It's the wedding day. And it's super important. The first thing you need to do is just breathe. And what I mean by that is on the wedding day, make sure that you do the things that will keep your mojo intact. Yes, this is a service. We are businesses. We are providing a service. We are, this is a business transaction, but this transaction is not being run by a machine and it is being run by human beings. And in order to get your most optimal, highest performing, most exceptional creative outcome, your mojo needs to be intact. And what I mean is if you know that you need a boost of energy in the morning and you need to have your coffee before you get started, make sure you have your coffee. If you know that you need energy bars, make sure you bring energy bars. If you know that you need a certain amount of rest, get that rest. Whatever those things are that help you to arrive feeling fully energetic, do those things. Now that you've arrived ready, feeling great, and, and feeling inspired, feeling energetic, the next thing you wanna think about is arriving ready, ready to go. So this is one small tip. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. It's one of my favorite things to say. I arrive on the wedding day set with two camera bodies and the lenses that I'm most likely to use as or need to use as I start already mounted and ready to go. My light is set for the environment that I believe I'm going to be entering into. So I'll have my assistant with me and they have uh, light off camera. I'll have everything set up with that light. I will arrive so that I don't have a whole bunch of setup time needed. I also know that I need a moment to breathe when I arrive and get a lay of the land. And so I arrive very, very, very early. It allows me to roll into the wedding day, not scrambling, not sweating about whether or not I'm gonna get caught in traffic. And so I arrive about three hours early um, or more sometimes just so that I can be in place and my mind can be at ease. When you arrive, read the room, scan and observe, pay attention to the people in the environment. What are the family dynamics? You've had all of this lead time to connect with your client. They're your partners in crime. They're the ones that they are going to be your go-to in terms of navigating through the ins and outs of the wedding day and navigating through all of the curveballs that you may potentially be thrown on the wedding day. So you have that in place, but you have not had any time to connect with any of the people, any of the supporting cast on the wedding day. So the wedding party, the family, the other vendors that you'll be working with. So scan the room, read the room, observe. That should be turned on when you uh, arrive. Once you've observed and you've scanned, you're figuring out who's the who's the who's the jokester in the group, who's the who's the matron of the family, who are the important players in the group, what are their personalities like, what's the energy that you're picking up, do they have nicknames for each other, are there any school buddies, are there children in the mix, are there special dynamics? Now we would have asked about these things. I personally ask about a lot of things of the couple before the wedding day. Now you're, I'm starting to make the connection between the things they shared, the couple has shared with me and the people I'm seeing before me on the wedding day. Ask all of those questions beforehand, but now that you've observed, you can see it in real life and you can pull additional information about the people that you'll be working with. 
This is especially helpful from a creative perspective and from a camaraderie perspective. When things begin to go off script, you really need a pool of information to pull from so that you can connect with this extended group of supporting cast on the wedding day. So that you can find ways to rally them and build camaraderie and have everyone fall in line. If you've ever worked with a large wedding party, like my record is a 40 person wedding party and it, which is not the norm, it was humongous. And if you've ever worked with a large wedding party, then you know attention span can be a challenge. You know relationship dynamics can infuse themselves into whether or not we are able to execute a certain type of shot. When you've scanned and you know your audience, then you know what kind of thing, creative things you can pull off with them. And you know how to reach them when you need them, everyone will fall in line so that you can get things done. Next, it's important to remember that you are the expert. Be that, be the expert. You'll find that in many instances on the wedding day, there are a lot of bosses. There are a lot of people in charge because remember, there are so many cogs. There are all these parts and each of those parts have a leader. Your florist has a lead florist. The venue has management there. The, the cake designer, the everyone who is there on the wedding day is a leader in their role. And any one number of those people, even including family member, has potential to be someone that tries to infuse themselves into the photography process. Be the expert. If you know that what your couple wants, then you can make lean into that knowledge and you can influence how things unfold in terms of as it pertains to photography. Another important tip is to seize the little bonus opportunities. Now, what I mean by that is that you have this planned out timeline. And let's say everything's going smoothly. For the most part, everything's happening on time when it's supposed to. For the most part, thing, people are in the places that they need to be in. It's important to keep an eye out for little, tiny little opportunities that present in between. Because although your wedding day could start out smoothly, everything on time, everyone where they need to be, wedding day is the most unpredictable, predictable type of function, right? And so we know that things can start off one way and we have a beautiful sunny day with not a cloud in the sky and then all of a sudden downpour. We know that things could change in a matter of moments. And so seizing the bonus opportunities means that if you have an opportunity after the bride has just been zippered in her tour dress to make a beautiful formal portrait of the bride, seize that opportunity. If you are waiting it to, the ceremony is about to begin and everyone's in the, the groom suite and a relative from overseas happens to pop their heads in to say hello and you note that there's this amazing energy between the groom and this relative and you can pick up that this is somebody super, super special to the groom, then seize an opportunity not only to capture that moment candidly, but capture a formal portrait of the groom with that relative. It's off script, but there's an opportunity there, take it. And I firmly believe this. Many times people ask me, well, how did you, how much time did you have to get this shot? Many of the photos that I've done were done in 60 seconds or less, and they were stolen opportunities. And so I firmly believe in stealing those tiny little bonus opportunities that present throughout the day. And it saves you. It's like a bit of insurance. It's insurance so that if in the event something goes off script, in the event the unexpected happens, you've now gotten an extra bit of magic that wasn't a part of the plan, and you now have something, a bit of wow factor that you can add to the experience. Another very important tip, ask for help. Do not hesitate to ask for help. If you have a brilliant idea to do something cool and you need extra hands, all hands on deck. Everyone is invested in those photos. Everyone on the wedding day is invested in those photos just being absolutely incredible. And almost everyone will be willing to jump in. If you've ever been on a wedding trying to do something, you'll see how many people offer to help you. Um, so don't be shy about asking for the help that you need in the moment to pull something together.
asking for help might mean asking one of the bridesmaids who you happen to notice to be very close to that auntie who has a big iPad and that iPad is getting in the way. Ask them to ask auntie to put the iPad away. Asking for help takes on many forms. But what it means is don't feel that you have to go it alone. Don't feel that you have to be anything beyond the photographer. Yes, as wedding photographers, we become immersed in all kinds of family dynamics and we wear all the hats in many instances. But pulling the experts and the experts in family dynamics are often family members. So asking for help could also mean if there are really important relatives and there's a shot list of people who need to be photographed, asking the couple to designate a relative who's familiar with these people to hold that shot list so that you don't have to carry that shot list and that your attentions can be focused on the wedding and the magic unfolding in front of you. Asking for help takes on many forms. <clears throat> An important part of building your wedding day fail safe is mastering the safe shot. The safe shots are the things that you can do in 60 seconds with your eyes closed because you have so much practice and experience in executing this thing that you know you can get it done quickly. So I literally mean the safe shot, the safe perspective, the clean and classic sh perspective uh, that you might take. But when I say master the safe, safe shot, I mean master the things, really practice at getting your speed and execution uh, fine-tune on in the types of things that you're really good at doing already so if you're really great with doing a certain type of pose with the wedding party master that get your speed up on that shot get your execution fine-tuned on that shot you want to have an arsenal of those shots because that's going to be your fail safe it is not the space where creative innovation lies it is the space where client happiness lies. This is your client pleasing technique. You do the things that you know the client will love and you do those things that overlap with the things that you can do quickly and efficiently. And you know that once those things are done, then all of the contractual obligations have been met. And so that if things go off script, you are already set. And if things go off script, you now have space to do those creative, innovative things. You now have space to push the envelope because you've taken care of business. The last thing I wanna leave with you is to give yourself grace. We are not machines, we are human beings. And lean into that. That is both the connection to your magic and that is the space where you allow yourself the grace to fall, to fail, to misstep, but also know that you will grow from that and know that that is the space where you get even better than you were before. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this information helpful. This is where you can find me if you have any questions or if you'd like to connect. I'm findable by name, at Kesha Photo on Twitter, at Kesha Lambert on Instagram, and Kesha Lambert Photography on Facebook. Please feel free to reach out. I answer my DMs and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. So for this shoot, we really wanted to put the Godox VL series lights to the test in a professional work environment. We shot in an old vintage historic house.
Along with the lights, it's so important to have a really good location, talent, and set design. Fortunately for this shoot, we had all three of those factors. You know, working with the VLs, I really think they met the challenge when it came to the highest pace, high speed, high functionality of a light that you need to produce TV and film content or even high end commercial production. You know, they still have the power to overpower the sun and they're running on batteries, which to me is amazing to have that functionality in a light that's so portable. The lights were so quick and easy to use, you could dial in a shot in no time. So it really allowed us to play with the lights in each individual room and take our time throughout the process. Here's how we pulled it off. As a producer of film and uh, commercial content, I'm really excited about the VL series. And I think after this shoot, they've exceeded my expectations and uh, we'll definitely be bringing them to shoots in the future. The portability, the power, the affordability, so many reasons why they belong in every filmmaker's bag. Thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing what you create with the Godox VL series lights. This is our green vest. This is our conveyor belt. This is one of our photo experts. This is a brief history of B&H. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy, and it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories and over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, BNH, how can I help you? or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkup. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. b &H is not a chain. b &H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are b &H. And here it is. I am very excited to introduce you to the Surface Book 3. With updated processor options, enhanced graphics performance, and available on either the 13.5 or 15 inch model, Surface Book 3 is the most powerful laptop in the Surface family. So what's new with Surface Book 3? Well, it's all about performance, with both the best battery life and graphics performance of any Surface. With Surface Book 3, you'll leverage the full power of 10th generation Intel Core processors for those pro-grade photo and video editing apps like Adobe Creative Cloud. Or immerse yourself in the latest gaming titles from Xbox Game Pass for PC with the optional discrete graphics card configurations. 
And of course, multitask between your mission critical apps like Office, Photoshop, and AutoCAD without missing a beat with up to 32 gigs of RAM and two terabytes of SSD storage. Whether you choose the 15 inch or the 13.5 inch Surface Book 3, configure it to match your lifestyle and profession. And choose the best graphics option for you, including the remarkably powerful GeForce GTX 1660 Ti with six gigs of dedicated graphics memory. In fact, when the performance enhancements are taken into account, Surface Book 3 13.5 inch is a whopping 50% faster than the previous generation Surface Book 2 13.5 inch. If you spend a lot of time unplugged, Surface Book 3 is a smart fit. It has the best battery life of any Surface device ever. Thanks to batteries, which are both in the display and in the base, Surface Book 3 can deliver up to 15 and a half hours on the 13.5 inch model and up to 17 and a half hours on the 15 inch model. Surface Book 3 truly has been designed to power you through even your busiest days. Surface Book has always been known for its versatility, and Surface Book 3 is certainly no different, with both USB Type-C, USB Type-A ports, and a full-size SD card slot. Our engineers have been hard at work refining the build quality of Surface devices for years, and sometimes it's the smallest details that can make the most impact. For example, Surface Book 3 detaches from its base twice as quickly as Surface Book 2. That of course means you can quickly move between the different user modes of Surface Book 3 so that you can create your best work using Surface Pen or Surface Dial. Upload your best videos using the 1080p front-facing camera. Or kick back and use your keyboard and mouse or an Xbox One wireless controller to play some of the most popular and intense games available. So, are you hungry for power? Do you demand that tailored solution for your work? Are you not a fan of compromises? Then take a closer look at the most powerful laptop of the Surface family, the Surface Book 3. I feel like landscape is reflected in the people that inhabit it. Anytime I'm put on assignment to tell a story, I start to look for those similarities or those reflections of the place in the people and the people in the place. This is an ancient landscape. All of those things are connected by the textures that are represented in the faces of the people, in the textures of the horses, the dust that erupts to the bookshelf cliffs, and the way that the light scrapes across them at the end of the day. All of that is texture. In the evolution of photography, we've always searched for greater depth. We've searched for greater detail. In creating that depth, you are invited into a deeper emotional landscape, and that is the point of great photography. The file is so complete that you get those subtle textures, everything from the small shadows that pebbles create to the cracks in the mud to the huge hundreds of feet of undulation that wrap around the landscape in the background. The 14 to 24 to 8, the 24 to 70 to 8, and the 70 to 200 to 8 were the primary lenses that I had on my camera for the entirety of the shoot. Uh, it allowed me to be quick, nimble, versatile. These lenses are tack sharp edge to edge. With a single battery, I was able to operate all day long. If you add the vertical grip, you're extending the power of the camera and the, and the longevity of the batteries for another day, if not more. You can also use it as a vertical grip to shoot portrait orientation. In general, shooting backlit is incredibly hard on glass. The performance of the Z system was spectacular, largely because of the flawless nature of the Nikon glass. Specifically for this story, uh, 
backlighting subjects, the cowboys, the family, works incredibly well because it shows the dust and the grit that this, this landscape is known for. The Z7 II in every way delivers across the board what I expect from a robust mirrorless system in the field. I was never concerned about the dust that was getting into it because it just didn't get into it. I wasn't concerned about having these horses come by and splash, literally soaking me, drenching me. Uh, I was never concerned about the camera being affected. I was never concerned about the camera not being able to carry the amount of detail that I wanted to tell the story that I wanted. I was only concerned about my execution of it. One of the things that I love most about the Z7 II, the new system, is the speed at which it shoots, as well as the buffer. Now, I don't have to substitute any of the quality for the speed. The ability to shoot 10 frames a second as a scene unfolds allows you a much broader choice in your edit and allows you the ability to find that serendipity, to find those moments that bring all the elements together to make your viewers feel. I think what the Z7 II system allows me to do is move closer towards capturing what I feel versus just what I see. I am a relentless perfectionist. I demand perfection from whatever I do. I demand perfection from myself. In order to achieve the things I want to achieve, I have to have absolutely the best to achieve it, to make it look and appear the way I need it to. We are very happy to have the return of Depth of Field alumni Creative Soul, the husband and wife duo Regis and Karam Bethencourt. Their world-renowned Afro art series 
which showcases the beauty and versatility of Afro hair, was conceived as a way to empower kids of color around the world. Their best-selling coffee table book, Glory, brings to life past, present, and future visions of black culture. The duo specializes in child and lifestyle photography that incorporates authentic visual storytelling that serves hundreds of children, families, and top brands. The team's work is so compelling that they have been honored to be chosen as the latest addition to Canon's prestigious Explorers of Light program. And we would like to thank Canon for bringing them to the stages of Depth of Field. Welcome, Creative Soul, back to Depth of Field. So we're going to share just a little bit about our journey for those of you who are not familiar with us, um, and then we're going to get right into it. So again, um, we are a husband and wife duo. We're based in the Atlanta area. Um, we've been at this for about 11 years, and um, I have a background in technology and marketing, and Reg um, and I both have a background in graphic design. Uh, I like to say that I'm one of those weird left brain and right brain uh, type of people. Uh, I started out in computer science, uh, and so I still love uh, numbers and data and all that weird stuff, <laughs> but I also have the creative side, uh, and we call Reg the magic maker, so <laughs> yes, he makes the magic happen, uh, so he is usually um, helping put everything together, making sure everything is running smoothly, um, customizing some of our props and our wardrobe, uh, handling lighting. Uh, so he, you know, helps make everything come together magically. Uh, <laughs> just this year, or last year, um, we became uh, New York Times bestsellers, which we are super excited about for our coffee table book, Glory. Um, and we also were honored to become Canon Explorers of Light. So I'd like to start out with this quote. Uh, it's a quote that we, I love uh, because it definitely represents uh, what it is that we are trying to do. And it says, fearlessly being yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you into something else is the greatest accomplishment. And I think we can all agree with that, right? <laughs> um, you know, there are so many outside pressures when it comes to, um, you know, how we need to, what we need to look like, how we need to act, what we need to do, um, especially with social media now. Um, and and the younger generation, uh, I feel like they have so many um, different things coming at them from different directions. So, um, you know, it's hard to really step out there and be yourself. And so, um, you know, that's something that we try to convey with our imagery. Um, and we try to encourage them to really step out um, and be proud and confident um, of who they are. 
So um, when we first started out, we were like a lot of photographers. We were doing a little bit of everything. Uh, so anything that you would pay us for, we were uh, shooting. <laughs> um, and it uh, you know, kind of came a point in time where we just said, gosh, if we are going to build a business, why are we going to build a business that we would hate? And so, um, you know, we decided that we, um, we knew we loved working with children and, um, you know, just decided that we wanted to photograph kids. We didn't know at the time that we could even make a living from photographing children. Uh, we just knew that we had a passion for it. Um, and we knew that, um, you know, we wanted to incorporate fashion and other things. We knew that just, you know, kind of taking kids out and letting them run around the field wasn't really our style. Um, and so we decided to get into the kids fashion industry because we thought we could be a little bit more creative there. Um, and at the time uh, we did, we realized that number one, it wasn't very diverse. Um, and number two, a lot of the kids that would have natural hair would come in to get their headshots um, and they would have their, the parents would have their hair straightened um, because that's what um, they thought they needed to do to get into the industry. And so, um, you know, we thought about it and we were like, wow, it's really sad to think about the fact that you know we are teaching these kids at an early age that um you know they're not acceptable um and that they're not good enough and it's, it's messed up that it's coming from the outside but once it's in your house and your parents are pretty much telling you that's that's how you have to look to be acceptable it's kind of yeah. uh bigger problem. Yeah. Um, and so we decided to do something about it. We started to um, do our own personal projects. Um, and, um, you know, we just started to tell our own stories. Um, you know, one of the things that we realized uh, as well was that, you know, a lot of times um, there were like certain designers that you had to use or, you know, there were, um, you know, we had to kind of use the, the typical name brand pieces that people were familiar with. Um, and we knew that there were so many other designers and so many other um, talented people out there that we wanted to work with that, you know, maybe did not have um, the, I guess the in <laughs> into the industry. Um, there were, you know, designers in Africa and other places that we wanted to work with. Um, and, you know, they maybe just didn't have that platform. And so we started to incorporate them into our work um, and just started to tell our own stories our own way. Um, and I like to say that we started to disrupt an industry. Um, and, you know, it was because of that, that I think our, um, I guess our brand began to flourish. Um, and so when we started to step out of the box and, you know, kind of do things our own way um, and build a brand that was um, really targeted and um, had a specific niche, then, um, niche, then, um, you know, our brand started to grow. So we started to carve a new path. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, it was just uh, the, the feedback was amazing. <laughs> um, we started to get um, um, so many people that reached out that said, oh my goodness, you know, these are, you know, images that we'd never seen before. Um, around 2017 was when we started a series called the Afro Art Series. Um, and that was a series that just really showcased the beauty and versatility of Afro hair. Um, and we started to travel all over the U.S. Um, and we would do different themes, um, you know, in each city that we would visit um, and just create some really striking portraits from them. Um, and towards the end of the year, um, you know, we had a blogger that reached out and said, hey, I would love to, to feature your series. Um, and from there it went viral. Um, and, you know, we had so many opportunities come, uh, you know, just from that. Uh, our book deal came from that, um, as well as, you know, just tons of press and other opportunities that came with that. So, you know, really it was just about us stepping out and doing something that we were passionate about. Um, and we were just blessed and lucky that, um, you know, it was something that um, many people um, responded to favorably. So now um, our current brand kind of looks like this. <laughs> um, and uh, we um, like to say that we are definitely more than just photographers. Um, you know, we've kind of expanded into more of an empowerment brand for kids. Um, and so, um, you know, we have a, um, 
a um, back to school line that's based off of our photos. Um, we had, you know, some of our photos turned into illustrated characters. Um, we have a, a calendar that we do every year. Um, this one, uh, this year, it will actually be, um, we have a, a calendar deal with Workman Publishing and um, we'll have it actually launched worldwide. Um, and then, you know, we will have other products um, such as party, um, party accessories and other things. So we are super excited about, you know, just kind of expanding beyond just um, photography and um, prints and really expanded into um, other things that our clients um, can relate to. So now let's get into the fun stuff. Uh, I really wanted to make sure that we're able to give you guys lots of tips about um, not only working with kids, but um, for creating your own stylized portraits, uh, whether you are actually working with kids or adults or anyone else. Um, you know, I just wanted you guys to have all the tips uh, that we use for putting these shoots together. So um, first, I wanted to talk about uh, personality types because I know that's something that a lot of you guys are thinking about, you know, just how we get these kids to, to do different things. <laughs> um, and I will start by saying that not all kids are created equally. Uh, they all have very different personality types. Uh, they are not the same. <laughs> um, and so you really have to figure out each child's personality type early on and use it to your advantage. Uh, and so um, there are a couple of things that I like to do first uh, with our questionnaire that we send over to the um, parents. I usually, um, you know, just ask them to give us a little insight into their children's personality. Um, and so that kind of gives me an idea beforehand. Um, and then um, during the shoot, I usually will talk to the child, um, you know, while they're getting their hair styled or they're getting ready. Um, you know, also while I'm kind of prepping them and while we're setting up um, on set. I'm usually, you know, just kind of talking to them to fill them, fill them out um, and just get a sense of their personality. Um, this little girl on the left is a great example of, uh, <laughs> you know, just kind of going with the flow. Um, mm -hmm. She was definitely, she had um, just a big, big personality. And I noticed that, you know, she was kind of doing her own thing uh, from time to time. And you know, she actually did this look um, and we all looked at the camera and was like, oh my God, like we love it. <laughs> and it's not something that I would have ever been able to direct, um, you know, so again, you know, sometimes we just kind of go with the flow and let them uh, do their own thing. So there are obviously different, very different personality types. Um, this is one that we run into a good bit um, and that's the shy one. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are lots of kids that are, you know, need some warming up um, that are pretty shy in the beginning. Um, I like to give them space um, and give them a moment. Um, you know, we're not gonna kind of attack them and, you know, <laughs> be in their face right away. You know, we're gonna give them a little space, um, you know, and time to warm up. Um, um, and then, you know, again, I'm going to find out things they like um, and try to ease into conversation. So if I can pick up on one thing that they like, you know, that will kind of give me an end to be able to, um, you know, just have a conversation with them. Um, and then again, you know, scaling back, uh, not, I don't want to be too over the top with this type of child. Um, so I'm definitely not going to have like a super high pitched voice and, you know, be all in their face and extra like, you know, that's probably not something that's going to, um, you know, just really resonate with them. Um, and for them, I like to look for those in between moments. Uh, so for instance, the picture here, um, the little girl, um, this was the, her first time actually doing a professional shoot. She was very shy um, and, you know, I caught this really sweet, um, you know, just innocent moment in between shots um, that I love and I thought just captured her personality so well. So, um, again, you know, look for those moments with them. And also, like, sometimes just showing the kid the, the picture mm -hmm. and also, you know, let them know that, you know, they're doing, they're doing it really well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this was... Uh, you know, one of those those moments that, you know, just definitely happen and, you know, she warmed up over time. Mm -hmm. Then you have Mr. or Mrs. Personality. <laughs> so this is actually my favorite, favorite personality type. Um, I, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier for me to reel a kid back in um, than to try to pull it out um, sometimes. Uh, and I also just kind of like the unexpectedness of, of Mr. and Mrs. Personality because 
somehow we always get these random shots that we just would have never thought of like this kid uh Joh <laughs> johan oh my goodness he gave us so so many faces um and you know just had so much personality uh and so i like to for those types i like to just let them be um you know again i will you know just kind of let them be i can reel them back back in the moments where i need them to be a little bit more serious um but for the most part i'm just kind of letting them do their thing and I'm kind of going with it. Um, I use a bit of bargaining and negotiation with these personality types. So for instance, um, you know, if they're, you know, just really wired <laughs> um, and really out there um, and I'm trying to get something that's a little bit more serious, um, then I will usually bargain with them like, okay, I'll let you do, you know, three things that you want to do if you can give me three of my shots. Um, and they're usually okay with that. So we kind of go back and forth like that, kind of like a game. Um, and I really just, you know, kind of use that to, um, to let them, you know, kind of feel like they're still doing their thing and, um, you know, I can still get what I want. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is keep shooting uh, because again, you never know uh, what you're going to get with these personality types. They can, you know, do something that you never thought of. <laughs> um, and so you want to be able to capture that moment. And you don't want to force them to be something that you you know that you want them to be on a camera too much because it breaks their spirit and they yeah. kind of <laughs> either do it they either act out even more or they just kind of just shut down right so, right and i usually tell yeah. the parents too like you know just to kind of step back and you know let them do their thing and you know we'll we'll reach out to them if we need any help but you know usually um i just kind of give them advice to you know not be too harsh and let them let the kids just be during the session and then finally we have <laughs> the one who doesn't want to be there so um you know we don't get this as much I, I actually used to get this more when we were in the kids fashion industry um i found that you know there were definitely lots of parents who kind of pushed their kids into it um but you know for the most part now usually we get it with um boys a lot of times <laughs> um because boys are like what photo shoot what are we doing <laughs> um and also teens um because teens can be a bit picky and you know they're like what are we doing and why are we doing this teens are always on the defense yes. so, like they're just wondering what's going on right and they want to know like? um so you know a few things that i do for for these types of kids um one is i give them plenty of breaks um and so I, I noticed that, you know, sometimes they kind of wear out during the shoot, um, meaning, you know, they're like, oh, is this almost over? Um, and so I'm giving them, you know, time to go and, you know, be on the iPad for a little while, you know, reset. And then that way they're feeling like, you know, they're not having to go straight through the shoot. Um, and I'm still able to kind of come back and get what I need. Um, but I keep it quick. Um, so definitely if I feel like, if I get the sense that a kid, you know, just kind of doesn't really want to be there, I know that I'm not going to drag that shoot out to be super long. Um, you know, definitely with, um, you know, the Mr. Personality types, we can, you know, go for a while. <laughs> um, but for these types, I'm definitely going to get in there and get the shots that I need and get out. Um, and really, I'm usually telling them like, okay, you know, if we can get these in, you know, you can, you can go back and be with your iPad or whatever you want to do. <laughs> um, and so I'm usually, you know, just kind of, using that to to kind of motivate them as well um and then i like to show them the wow shots right so show them a couple of shots that uh i think are awesome and that that usually kind of gets them going as well um, when they can see some of the shots that um you know they didn't think was possible especially with teens right <laughs> because you know definitely even up until um you know, right before the, the shot, um, I find that teens are kind of skeptical and they're kind of like, wait, what is it going to look like? Um, and so when you show them the shot, then we're like, okay, you know, and well, this is going on. Instagram. Right. Yes. And so then they're pulling out all the Snapchat <laughs> and the IG poses right. and, you know, TikTok dances and everything else. Right. Um, and, you know, also I like to give them some control. Um, and so definitely with this type, um, especially with teens, um, I like to kind of give them a little bit of control. So if I can, you know, have options for them um, for clothing, you know, okay, here are a couple of options. Let them feel like they've made a decision. Um, and then that way they have, you know, some say in the process. Uh, you know, for the younger ones, it might be like, 
all right, which, which of these accessories do you like better? Or which of these props do you want to use? Um, you know, which, which one, you know, do you want to use right now? And it gives them, you know, a sense of feeling like they've kind of made a decision and they've done something that is, you know, something that they actually want to do. All right, so um, finding inspiration. So we always get questions about, you know, where do we find our inspiration? Um, and I always say everywhere. <laughs> and that is definitely, that is the truth. We find it from everywhere. It can be from hairstyles to fashion, movies. Um, Reggie even got inspiration from cartoons before. Um, you know, just so many different places that we can get inspiration from. It's all around you. Um, and we use that in our sh everyday shoots. Um, so um, this is actually a, Perfect. All right. So um, I wanted to talk about, you know, just our planning process um, for some of the shoots that we do. Um, and one of the things that we do in the beginning uh, is we create a, um, a mood board um, and that just kind of gives us and the team a sense of what we're what we're going for for the shoot the overall look and feel you know it doesn't have to be too detailed sometimes i get super detailed with these um, especially if i'm working with you know maybe team members that are new or you know if i have very specific things that i'm looking for um, but for the most part it's just a few images just to kind of give people the overall mood and inspiration for what we're going for and we never really take an idea and just copy it, you know, straightforward. Yeah. You always try to make it your, your make own. it your own for sure. Yeah. So it's definitely the mood board is intended just to give you, you know, an overview. It's not necessarily to say, okay, I want exactly this. Um, so for instance, um, this was a shoot that we did um, for our glory book, um, and um, we knew that we wanted to do. We wanted this. Um, uh, the theme was like black girl magic type of theme um, and we wanted her to kind of look like a magician um, and so I kind of pulled inspiration from Pinterest and Google and other places um, and um, I knew that I wanted to have some type of hat that was made of hair um, and so this one, I knew that I wanted a hat made of hair. Um, I just didn't know, I was trying to describe it to the hairstylist. And so I literally just Googled hat made out of hair, right? <laughs> um, and found one that was kind of close to what I was looking for and then really just let her do her thing. Um, and so she created her own version based off of, you know, the overall mood board. Um, and then I knew that, you know, in post-processing, we wanted to do something with like cards in the air um, and, you know, just have a really, um, you know, kind of magical vibe to, to the actual scene. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the image in the middle is how it turned out. This was another fun one that we did um, and it was a cyberpunk theme. Um, and so, you know, I knew I wanted, you know, just really fun, like techie um, elements. Um, I wanted, we actually partnered with a body artist on this. Um, and I told her that I wanted this like cyber techie body paint um, on, you know, um, on the skin and the face um, and you know also for the hairstylist we were going for this like punk rock type of feel um, and just futuristic feel um, but also you know my team knows that even if I tell them cyberpunk we're always going to kind of put our spin on it um, so we're usually doing like um, incorporating Afrofuturism elements to it um, to make it our own so um, these are some images uh, from that shoot so that you can see how it turned out. So the fun thing about this is that we were literally um, in Home Depot <laughs> the night before. Yeah. It was the super fun. Team. Yeah, the yeah. whole team. So yeah. we had our hairstylists, the body artists. Mm -hmm. uh, we all were like, you know, just roaming around. Uh, we kind of made it like a little challenge. We were roaming around <laughs> Home Depot and everyone kind of looked at, looked up um, pieces that they thought that they could use um, mm -hmm. for the shoot to incorporate. Um, and we all came together in our hotel room and uh, <laughs> just, um, you know, just kind of vibed and put all these together and I ideas together. And, you know, this is how it turned out. You know, usually, like I said, we are usually piggybacking off of each other's ideas on set. Um, and so um, we don't plan everything down to the exact, um, you know, um, accessory or detail. Um, we usually are just kind of doing high level. And then on set, that's where a lot of the magic happens, um, where we're all just kind of um, putting the pieces together, the different elements, um, and, 
you know, just seeing how those work out. Um, sometimes it's just um, based off of, like I said, it can be from fashion. So this was one uh, where I knew we wanted to do this like denim on denim type of feel. Uh, and so I'd worked with a, a designer that we worked work with um, and asked her, hey, could you do like this recyclable, um, recycled denim fashion type of look? Um, and so, you know, a lot of times the people that we work with, they get inspired as well. So she's like, oh my gosh, like I've never done anything like this before, but you know, it'll be fun to see what we can come up with. So, um, you know, we're all just kind of coming up with different things. Um, the um, accessories on the right, you know, I say, you know, I like to um, collaborate with different artists um, and, you know, jewelry makers, accessory makers. Um, I actually just, I knew I wanted to, I was looking for um, some type of denim um, accessories, denim, denim jewelry. Um, and I think I just went on Instagram and just randomly searched for the hashtag like denim accessories or denim jewelry, something like that. Um, and this woman popped up and she just so happened to be in New York where we were going to be shooting. Um, and she was happy to, you know, when I showed her the mood board and everything, she was happy to lend us some of the accessories for the shoot. Um, so again, don't be afraid to ask. Um, one thing I will say is that I am, uh, you know, we are selective about the, the artists that we collaborate with, um, but we are always very good to our, <laughs> the people that we work with, um, because you want to kind of keep those relationships. So I, you know, make sure that I'm giving them quality images. We're making sure that we return the items in time. We're returning them in, um, you know, in great shape, um, you know, the way that we found them. Um, and that really just keeps it open and they are usually willing to go over and be on for us as well. And these are some of the other images for that shoot. So super fun. Um, and again, you know, everyone's just kind of vibing off of each other from the shoot and adding on their own their own elements. When I seen how the dress designer designed her clothes, I started just, you know, <laughs> that made me step up and right. you know, design the, the ones We're all like, did. we have to step our game up, right? <laughs> um, and so now I want to talk a little bit about wardrobe styling. Um, so we actually do a lot of the, or most of the wardrobe styling ourselves. Um, obviously, you know, most people work with a stylist, um, so that's fine as well. Um, we just, you know, we have a certain style that we are looking for um, and that, you know, we like to kind of put our own spin on things. And so um, we tend to do a lot of things on our own. Um, and so wanted to kind of share what that looks like. Um, this is an example of a shoot where we just, the only thing that I knew was that I wanted to incorporate gold butterflies. <laughs> um, so we wanted to, um, you know, just this was this little girl's birthday shoot. And, um, you know, I just love the idea of like metamorphosis and, you know, her evolving and, you know, kind of growing into her own. And so we um, purchased these, um, they were like gold, um, like wall 3D butterflies that you mm -hmm. put on your wall. Like stickers, <laughs> yeah, I like think. stickers. Yeah. Um, and they had like these little sticky things on the back. Um, I, got, I think I got them from Amazon for about 15 bucks. Um, and, you know, we just had work with our hairstylist said, hey, you know, here are some butterflies, use them as you wish. <laughs> um, Reg actually used some on her tights. Um, and, you know, we just kind of went from there and made it happen. So again, it doesn't have to be, sometimes it's not anything that's super elaborate. It's just a matter of, you know, incorporating certain elements into your shoot. Uh, this was a fun one. Uh, this was a football themed uh, shoot. And, um, you know, the inspiration for this was uh, we just kind of thought about like, um, what if there was like an a, a, a American style football team um, in Africa <laughs> and they came out with like they, they had they had their own, um, you know, um, certain um, uh, clothing and accessories and look uh, and so um, that was kind of our inspiration from it and we basically just took some uh, pretty plain pieces um, and Reg customized them using um, a paint pen yeah like a sharpie paint pen as well as um, you know gluing on some of the cowrie shells and fur and other things so um, you know you really just kind of using our imagination um, and coming up with our own characters um in our you know to kind of tell a story like we're really big into like recycling stuff so like yes like on a helmet you can see it right down the middle that's that's pretty much that's like a belt 
<laughs> and I just put carry shells over it. Right. Yeah. So yeah, we're definitely reusing uh, different pieces, you know, a good bit. I think this, uh, the fur came from a rug that yeah, we were, that we were yeah. using for something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so again, it doesn't have to be super elaborate. Um, you can just kind of make it look elaborate <laughs> during your, um, your shoot and your session. This was a fun one. Uh, this uh, little girl, I said, I love, one of the things I love about working with kids is sometimes it's just the simplicity of it all. This little girl, her name was Zoe. And so she said uh, she wanted a zebra theme because her name started with a Z. Simple as that, right? <laughs> so I was like, that works for me. Um, and so, you know, we definitely, like to find elements um, that really just go with the theme. So, uh, you know, I found zebra tights. We actually found these super cool zebra Adidas uh, shoes that we had. Um, and um, Reg actually customized the shirt. So it was a plain um, just top. And um, we purchased some, um, it was like feather trim. Um, and he just basically glued that on. It's a, we're not sewing or anything. We're just basically, he just glued that to the, the arms. Well, yeah, I always use like either uh, the glue gun or I either use the, use, I always keep Velcro mm -hmm. at the studio because we're like making fast adjustments. So we can't really sit there and let something dry. We need stuff that just absolutely, you know, that that's come up kind of almost instant. Yeah, but for us, details that are important. Um, and so we are thinking through all those little details mm -hmm. and, you know, just really um, figuring out how we can use the details to tell a story. Mm -hmm. Um, again, it doesn't have to be anything major. Sometimes it can be simple. This was um, one of our very first um, shoots, uh, you know, children's shoots that we did um, back in, I think, 2013, 2014. And we had no team. We had no hairstylists. We had no, you know, stylists, anything. It was just us and the kids. Um, and um, it was, um, you know, Reg just basically, we took some uh you know, I think they were old skates that we had purchased from eBay. They were old used skates and he just spray painted them. <laughs> um, and this shoot was actually one of the, I guess, the transformational shoots in our business. Uh, we um, were fairly new on um, social media at the time. Um, and I think this shoot just resonated with a lot of people for so many reasons. Um, and our, you know, social media following grew from about 2,000 to about 20,000 in about a month um, just from, you know, this shoot alone. So again, it doesn't have to be elaborate. You don't necessarily have to have a team. Um, really just a little bit of imagination goes a long way. Yeah, you know, it's like also about connecting people through your images, you know, to their childhood as well. You know, right, just their, just their, mem happened. their memories and just tapping into yeah. something that, um, into their feelings really. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for a lot of people, you know, this just kind of tapped into um, so many different feelings for them. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, and then, you know, again, just reusing and recycling. So, um, you know, sometimes we may not have the budget to um, create an entirely, you know, new piece or have a designer create a new piece. Um, sometimes we just have to kind of layer on. So um, this was like, I think a $20 dress that I got um, from Amazon. And we just basically um, had a, um, like a neck piece created for that um, to kind of save on cost. Um, and we came up with this really, really elaborate image that looked like something uh, that, you know, it was a dress that cost much more. Um, it ended up being the cover of our coffee table book, Glory, <laughs> um, because we liked it so much. Um, but I love the fact that I, I think it speaks to so much um, with what we do um, in terms of, you know, just kind of taking simple pieces and making it look much more elaborate on camera. So now I want to share with you guys um, just a little bit about um, how we do our client closet. Um, so we definitely um, just, um, we have pieces there for our clients. Um, so sometimes, you know, they can um, request and um, add on uh, like a custom wardrobe piece, but we also just have certain pieces in our um, client closet um, that they can, um, that we add to our packages as well. And for us, it just keeps it super simple um, so that the, the parents only have to show up. Um, you know, when we have our closet, we basically are using, we stock, 
reusable pieces that we can, you know, use for different things. We can make maybe switch it up with accessories or different tops or, you know, different pieces. Um, we incorporate layering pieces and accessories. Um, and again, you know, we're including that cost into our packages. Um, and then um, the thrift store and craft stores are your friend. <laughs> so you can take, like I said, a simple piece and turn it into something much more. Um, so again, you know, highly recommend it just, you know, we've tried it. We've done it so many different ways. You know, we started out, we were letting our clients bring things. Then we, um, you know, just let them um, choose to add it on. But I think where we are now is that it just, it's just much simpler if we can kind of control it because now we can, we know for sure that we're going to get the end result that we're looking for, for the actual shoot. Um, so, so one of the questions we always get is how we get the kids to hang in there with us. And one of the ways uh, is that we really like to let the kids be the hero of their own story. Um, so um, the main question that we ask on our questionnaire is um, we ask the parents to have the kids um, tell them if they could have the shoot of their dreams, what type of shoot it would be. And that has obviously opened up so many different uh, themes and ideas. Kids are so imaginative and have so many wild ideas. Um, and it really um, serves two purposes. One, um, for us, you know, they come up with things that we never would have imagined <laughs> um, sometimes. And uh, often it allows them to, um, you know, just really feel like they have a part in the shoot um, so that they actually want to be there. So um, I wanted to kind of give you guys a few examples of some of the stories um, and show you what that looks like. So um, we had Janae, uh, she was, uh, she came in for her 15th birthday and um, she says, I love animals. So I'd like to be a fairy tale lion with magical hair. I want to look fierce like a lion, but also soft. I want it to be creative. I would like long hair. I want a, bi a big dress, but not too big. <laughs> um, and so this, these are how the photos turned out. Really love the way that these uh, looked. We um, just got a um, you know fairly inexpensive um, dress, and you know just added on accessories to give it this um, you know really magical fairy tale uh, lion type of look. Um, Amaria says, "I love animals and would like to become a veterinarian one day." Uh, and so these are how the photos turned out. Um, we worked with our hairstylist and makeup artists. And again, you know, we are all kind of um, playing off each other's ideas. We knew that we were going to do some animal print um, and the hairstylist kind of took it from there um, with, you know, kind of animal inspired looks um, as well as the, the body paint on the face and arms. And um, Trey is a 10 year old boy that we work with. And uh, his mom says, Trey is a Renaissance man. He is a world traveler, lover of many languages, sports, and considers himself an ultra gamer. So, uh, you know, we were trying to figure out how to get in all of um, Trey's uh, interests. And so we decided to do this Renaissance man type of shoot um, and, you know, kind of got in his love for sports. Um, his, uh, you know, kind of sophisticated side as well as his gamer side. So super fun. Um, the, um, <laughs> the controller is actually one of, uh, one of Reg's game controllers, right? <laughs> uh, that we just kind of Velcroed onto, um, onto his top. So it was super fun. Um, this next one's um, Jazzy and Body Strength and fear Fierceness. So we love to see a girl on fire theme. Uh, we envision a warm glow around her body and orange flames so that it looks like she is the light source. Um, so this was a really fun one where we played around with um, um, a slow shutter speed to give us the, uh, the kind of cool lighting effects um, and, you know, just kind of let her, um, you know, do some of her dancer moves and um, just turned out really, really cool. My Dory says, I would like a dreamy, colorful shoot with wings um, and I want to walk on clouds. Uh, so we had to figure out, you know, how can we have a, some clouds on the set? Uh, and the Reg, we, we use uh, pillow fluff, right? Yeah, pillow fluff. <laughs> um, and and from like a Hobby Lobby or a Walmart. Yeah, and just actually just put that all over the floor and we had it on, the, on a stool. 
Um, and you know, that stuff is pretty cool. You can do so many different things with it. Um, we ended up getting the idea to actually, um, uh, make some hair out of the pillow fluff towards the end of the shoot. So um, our hairstylist did a really, really cool Afro style with uh, some of the pillow fluff. Uh, and we just had a lot of fun with this and even let her play with some of the, the fluff in between. She was definitely um, one of the types that I needed to have um, a few breaks in between. And so you know, that was kind of our bribe with her was that, uh, you know, in between some of the shots that we would allow her to, uh, you know, kind of play around with with the pillow fluff and uh, throw it around a little bit <laughs> during the shoot. So um, we are going to share um, a few behind the scenes videos before we leave of just a couple of our shoots. Um, so I wanted to quickly just kind of run through um, our equipment and what's in our camera bag. Um, so for cameras, we um, recently moved over to the Canon ER EOS R5, which we love, 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 love. <laughs> yeah. um, it is um, our actually our first mirrorless camera, and we are loving it so far. Just love the um, the um, image, the subject detection, um, and we love the the quality. Um, it's 45 megapixel, and just you know, gosh. The quality on it is amazing. Um, even when we zoom all the way in, <laughs> like no noise. Yeah, just loving it. Um, we actually still kept our Mark III um, just as a backup camera, um, and you know, if we ever need B-roll footage or anything like that, so we kept it around. Um, and then we have um, um, our go-to lens. Before was the Canon EF twenty-four seventy. Um, um, we moved over to the RF 2870, which is kind of our go-to lens. Um, we usually don't like to um, change around lenses too much during a shoot, just because we have to kind of keep things moving fairly quickly with kids. So the 2870, we find that it gives us enough, enough range um, and versatility for us to get a variety of shots. Um, and um, we also have the Canon control ring adapter mount so that we can continue using our existing lenses like the 85 millimeter, um, the 135 until you know we build up our RF um, lenses. So that was super helpful. Um, in terms of lighting, uh, we love, love, love the um, Pro Profoto B10 um, Plus, uh, as well as the B10s, and um, those are amazing, amazing lights. Um, we, it's kind of really changed the way that, <laughs> that we do our lighting, um, because we're able to really just move them around, They're cord they're, they don't have any cords or wires, um, we're able to use our app with them, um, they fit in our backpack when we travel, so we um you know just love using those so um the first shoot that you guys are going to see in the behind the scenes video um christopher is a little boy that we've worked with before who is um an aspiring astronaut and so um this was a super fun shoot that we did for him um we knew that we wanted to do um kind of an afrofuturistic af astronaut um shoot and you know, we customized the spacesuit. Um, Reg used like a Sharpie paint pen, I believe, um, to customize his clothing. Um, and then, do you want to tell them how you got the idea for the the wings? Uh, yeah, I used to love a cartoon called Silverhawk, so that's the where the idea for the wings came from. Super cool. So yeah, we're just really kind of pulling ideas from everywhere. Um, these are how the actual shots turned out. Um, you guys will see on there that. Um, we used um, something called atmospheric spray to get the um, the smoke effect. We knew that we wanted to play around with gels, um, and um, you know we wanted it to kind of feel and look like he was actually um, you know somewhere in space. <laughs> um, and so you know we played around with the gels um, and the atmospheric spray, and you know just got some really really cool effects with that. So Reg, do you want to go through the lighting for that um, that particular shoot? So for the, um, the light that's on the left hand side, it has a three foot octa box with a Profoto B10 Plus with an octa gel connector connected to it. And then behind it, behind the subject, we have the um, Profoto B10 with the orange gel connector. And on the right, we have the 17 inch umbrella reflector with a diffuser. And that's also a Profoto B10 Plus. Right, and then of course we're using our Canon um, R5 and the 2870 for the lens. So, you know, this just 
um, created just a really cool effect. We obviously moved the, the lights around a bit um, and played around with different setups, but um, this was the main setup that we had for the shoot. And then the second shoot that you guys are going to see is um, a mermaid uh, queen <laughs> shoot that we did. Um, and this shoot turned out super cool as well. Um, you know, I uh, tell people all the time that I actually um, don't like mermaids too much. <laughs> Um, and we get a lot of requests. I guess mermaids are like the end thing right now. So usually kind of find ourselves going over and beyond to actually make the mermaids look like something that I would actually like. <laughs> I don't know. I just find that they, you know, kind of look a little cheesy sometimes. So, um, so yeah, so we actually work with a designer to um, create this mermaid costume out of, you know, she had, um, she incorporated African fabrics as well as jewels. Um, Reg, we obviously are not underwater photographers, but through the magic of Photoshop, uh, Reg was able to make that happen. Um, so you guys will get to see the, um, the um, behind the scenes on set um, of us actually creating this particular shoot. Um, and then for the lighting, um, it was pretty similar to the other setup, um, except we didn't have the orange oh, gel behind yeah. them. Yeah. So um, we will um, let you guys look through the videos um, and hopefully you'll be able to get a sneak peek into, um, you know, what goes on um, on set with us. Really, it's, you know, like a big creative factory with everyone kind of working together. So we just wanted to give you guys um, some insight into that.
So we hope you enjoyed that preview into the behind the scenes of some of our shoots. Uh, so I just wanted to leave you with this thought. Um, it's something that we definitely live by. Uh, and the quote is, legacy is not what we did for ourselves, is about what we did for the next generation. Um, and that certainly rings true for what we are trying to do. Um, you know, when we think about our photography, we think about it um, as more than just photos, more than just prints. Um, we are leaving a legacy behind for the next generation and a blueprint for our next generation. Um, you know, we have uh, just been overwhelmed with the response from um, kids around the world, from parents uh, that, um, you know, talk about how um, our work has um, instilled a, a kind of newfound sense of confidence and pride in their children um, and how, you know, um, kids just kind of seeing themselves being reflected um, in the glory book and also in our work, um, you know, has just really opened up uh, new doors for them. So um, we hope that um, you know, that will be our legacy for years to come. And we ask you guys, um, what legacy will you leave behind? Uh, really think about, you know, with whatever work that you are doing, um, think about uh, what you want your legacy to be. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. We uh, have enjoyed talking to you guys today. Um, feel free to connect with us on um, any of the social media channels. We are at Creative Soul Photo. And if you would like to learn more about our glory book, you can find it at creativesoulphoto.com slash glory. Thanks guys. Thank you guys. <sighs> See, we did it. B&H presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021. The Group Portrait Award, sponsored by Canon, featuring the Canon EOS R6 mirrorless digital camera with 24 to 105 millimeter F4L lens. And the winner is... Winter Hats. Captured in camera by Richard Johnson. Congratulations. about a magical place where everything's amazing especially the people we can tell you everything there is to know about over 400,000 different pieces of gear tell them Lenny we have a 17 millimeter 24 millimeter 45 millimeter he does this all day we'll help you find the right thing which is often not the most expensive the A9 is great but I think the 6500 is better for what you need that's pretty rare and just like you, we love to explore and share our passion because we're creators as well. Israel and Jake like to make videos for the web. Oh, I love it when he does this. Oh, by the way, if you can't meet us in person, you can always chat with us online. Think of us as collaborators, production partners, problem solvers. This is Greg. He's made five gold records. You can play your voice high. And here's Jay, the king of the candidates. Wait, 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 I'm not ready, Jay. Sometimes we geek out and help each other, but mostly we're here to help you. Like Lenny, who's still going, because there's a lot to say when you're making some pretty important decisions. So now you've met 16 of over 1,000 employees. 16 reasons our customers like to do business with people, not algorithms. We are B&H.
They've called us. The Hunters of Light. We search for the things that have yet to exist. Challenging the traditions. Foraging through the shadows. Listening for the subtle changes. This is us. We are not as the others are. We do not see as the others see. From the distant shores to the far off worlds. We've made friends with the beasts. made vows to the land, signed deals with the sky. Now let us ride together a new chapter. I am thrilled to introduce the 2021 Depth of Field keynote speaker, Mark Seliger. I have been attempting to recruit Mark for years to come to Depth of Field, but his busy schedule has always prevented him from gracing our stages. But this year, we were able to secure this powerhouse of a photographer to come join us. I guess the stars were in alignment. Mark Seliger is an Amarillo, Texas-born photographer who shoots frequently for Vanity Fair, Elle, GQ, Vogue, and Harper's Bazaar. Seliger has published numerous books and is the recipient of the Lucy Award, Clio Grand Prix, Cannes Lions Grand Prix, ASME, and most recently, the 2019 Texas Medal of Arts Award. His photographs are part of the permanent collection of the Houston Fine Art Museum, as well as the National Portrait Gallery in London, and also the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. He had the dream job of being Rolling Stone Magazine and Vanity Fair lead photographer for many years. This is where he photographed iconic subjects such as Jennifer Aniston, Keith Richards, Nirvana, Brad Pitt, and so many more pop culture celebrities and artists. When I was in my 20s and finding my photographic style, I came across a portrait market shot of underground New York City East Village metal artist Axel. This image stayed with me as I enjoyed shooting fringe artist culture and Mark's work had a profound impact on my work. I hope he has also an impact on your work. It is with great honor that we welcome Mark Seliger to the program of Depth of Field. Thank you so much for coming, Mark.
Well, I grew up in Houston, Texas, uh, born in Amarillo. And uh, after about a year and a half of working as, as an assistant in uh, Houston, I decided that I was going to come to New York and spend six months to a year assisting and, uh, and then go back to Texas. And I never did. I ended up staying in New York. I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the... Uh, just the experiences that I was having and also the idea of editorial. And editorial to me seemed like, really like the, 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 the starting ground for where I wanted to go in photography. So yeah, school was a, a very, uh, school came with a lot of uh, pluses and minuses for me. I wasn't a, a great student in the early days, I, I, I was enthusiastic about school, but um, I had a limited attention span for sure. And uh, part of the problem was I hadn't really focused on something that I felt connected to. And when I was 13, my parents signed me up for two classes at the Jewish Community Center. One of them was life drawing, which I was the youngest student of. Uh, my brother was very jealous because we, uh, we had live nude models. And I'd come back and I'd show him my, my sketches, and uh, he was very jealous. And the other one was, um, was the darkroom. And just by having that relationship with art when I was young really brought me into kind of what I wanted to focus on as a, as a teenager. And from there, I went to the high school for performing and visual arts which was a, a magnet school very similar to the performing arts school here in New York, a, a little sister, if you want to call it that. And, uh, and I, I wanted to be in their art department, but I didn't make the audition. I didn't pass the audition. So I ended up going into their media program. And part of the media program was, was wonderful because it was really focused on photography in, in your junior year. And that was my sort of my second step. My primary teacher at HSPBA was a guy by the name of uh, Don Lawson, who was a great influence on me for many reasons, not only artistically, but just as a, a human being, a wonderful soul, charismatic, uh, just uh, a little bit um, uh, off color in, in the right way for a teenager. And then from there, I ended up at East Texas State University, which had a wonderful photography department and a design department. And the two people there that I think of as my mentors, and really my main mentors, uh, firstly was um, James Newberry, who came from Chicago, had an art background, and kind of reshaped our department, which was very commercial. And his real emphasis was on printmaking, which I had some experience in, and, uh, and documentary. And so my portraiture work that I do now really stems from my early work with Professor Newberry in terms of, you know, how I thought about, you know, the physiognomy, the environments, the, the, the depth, the tonality of the black and white imagery. And that, that moved me into a direction of thinking about portraiture, people, greats like Arnold Newman and Irving Penn and Abaddon and you know even some incredible printmakers like Minor White and um, Weston and you know the list goes on and on and on. Um, but you know all those factors led me to where I am now. And and education was really at the very height of, of what I needed to do in order to be able to become, you know, involved in photography and to feel that passion. Um, my, my best friend in college, Tom Connors, lives in Minnesota and has since we left school. And we always used to pour over books and think, wouldn't it be the coolest to, to publish a book? And so that was always on the, 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 the front of my thinking when I went into to making work was, you know, does this image really stand up in a, in a, in a, in a publication or in a, in a book? And making books is the extension of 
of editorial for me. Making books and creating a more tactile experience has always been that I take in order to end with the final result, which is the print. And the print still to me is the reason why I love photography. Um, I'm, I, I'm not too enthusiastic about spending a lot of time on computers, even though that's part of the technology and certainly a great resource of how we work now. But so what I stress to my assistants and to the people that are starting in photography is learn how to make a beautiful print. Learn the basics. Learn your own language in the dark room. And if it's not in the dark room, learn your language on Photoshop and master that. And that is the, the ultimate experience of photography is making a print. <laughs> um, so the John Malkovich picture was an assignment, a, a series of portraits for GQ magazine of uh, men of the year. And when I'm prepping for an assignment like, a, for instance, for the John Malkovich picture, I'll do a lot of research. I'll think about, uh, you know, the films that John's been in. I'll think about the, the character, the quirkiness of the character, and um, really anything that comes to mind, I put down on paper and then I'll start to um, eliminate ideas and come down to just two or three smaller ideas. Uh, sometimes I'll run them by the magazine or an editor and sometimes I'll just go do the assignment. But for the most part, uh, you know, a photograph, an idea comes from uh, something that is nonlinear or something that is parallel to who they are. Specifically, the idea with John Malkovich is, is, is no idea, right? It was more of this more surreal experience of having the subject in this pretty, I would say, pretty uh, uh, destitute-looking environment, a warehouse, and these pigeons that had lived there for years and years and years coming and just like hanging out onto him as if he was a statue. But there was really no concept. And so uh, when I'm working on an idea, I won't necessarily tell the subject what I'm doing. Um, I, I will usually have a couple of different ideas planned out so that if it goes wrong or if he doesn't want to do it or she doesn't want to do it, then I have something else I can do, which would be, when I think about it, probably a simple portrait. But concepts for me um, have always intrigued me from the simple fact that um, when I look at a, a, an idea or I look at a, a, a session with an artist, how can I photograph them in a way where they haven't been photographed before? So, so essentially to, to, to come back with something that feels unique or original. So much about what I do as a photographer is, is allowing a space for somebody to feel comfortable when they're working. Um, usually the sessions are short. Uh, in, in particular, the session with Robert De Niro and, and, and Al Pacino was very short. It was just 10 minutes. And uh, everything needs to be completely set up. The idea needs to be put together. The lighting needs to be put together so that when I'm on camera, my attention really can be to the subject. And, you know, typically what I'll do is go and introduce myself, warm up my subject in terms of what we're going to be doing. Uh, don't spend a lot of time explaining it because these guys have been photographed, you know, millions of times. But just to make them feel confident that what they're walking into is going to be 
you know, something that they can relate to in some way, even though photography is very unrelatable in terms of the subject to the photographer. And, um, and typically what I'll do is I'll observe their movements, talk them through what I'm doing, maybe direct them a little bit in terms of how I want them to, to move or pose. But I'm more aware of what they do when they're not on camera. I'm more aware of what their, what their natural reaction, what their, what their mood, what their expression is off a of camera, and then try to bring that back into the session if I feel like it's appropriate. But, you know, from, from that moment that I meet them to the moment that they leave, I'm always watching what they're doing. I'm always observing their movements, their just gesticulations, their, their posturing, their smiling, their, the way they relate to me, and sort of building on that so that the session has a little bit of inertia to it, a little bit of energy to it. In terms of going from a single subject or you know, doing a shot of two people. A big group is a different, is really a different kind of a uh, uh, situation. It's a different set of problems, a different set of things to solve. Um, again, it's all about preparation for me. It's, it's taking the time on a pre-light to actually mark out where everybody's gonna be, to do a little pre-setting with stand-ins, if I had the opportunity to do that. And once my subjects come on board, it's slowly building that photograph to where that, um, the way that I imagine it from the pre-light actually becomes the photograph. And sometimes you have to move things around a little bit because somebody doesn't want to be sitting, somebody wants to be standing, somebody wants to be and the, you know, on the right side, somebody wants to be turned a different direction. So there's always moments of trying to adjust it, but there is a little bit of spontaneity to it when you're working with groups, depending on the size of it. If it gets bigger than 15 or 20, then, um, you know, you do have the ability to swap ahead here and there with, with Photoshop. But for the most part, we try to keep everything in camera. I don't really think there's really anything true about having a difficult subject. I think all subjects are have their own set of problems. I feel that there's going to be that moment where the two, two of you are starting to have this level of trust. And that, to me, is um, a very important uh, moment to, to kind of break those walls down. And, you know, even if it's a very short shoot, they have to be able to trust you in order for you to get something that feels unique and special. So preparation is key. Being able to have a conversation with somebody is key. Being able to make them feel comfortable is key. And then being able to communicate what it is that you want to do without taking too much of their time is key. So those are all moments that I try to do on the front end so that when I'm working, I have the flexibility and the spontaneity to be able to move around, you know, with, with very little hesitation. <laughs> well, the Obama photograph is, is unique because I'd photographed him once before. Uh, this particular shoot was 100 days into his presidency. Um, he was comfortably in the White House, but he was also dealing with three wars. And uh, there was, you know, a lot of people on board. There was the editors from Rolling Stone. There was the White House staff and everybody was watching, but they were watching from a distance. And as I was going through what I wanted to do with, with President Obama, I had already taken the main picture, which was the cover picture, and that was him walking through the Rose Garden. Secondary photograph was somewhere was going to be somewhere in the Oval Office, but I had this idea to shoot the back of him. So I'd set up a 
half of a white seamless in the rose garden to the side. I, had, I then asked the president when he was alone if it would be okay if I did a diptych. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I want to do the front and the back, maybe the side. He said, okay. And as I was photographing him from the front, I could see that the people from the White House and the Rolling Stone people were watching me and continually talking. And then I asked him to turn around and then I was photographing the back of him. About 20 seconds into me taking the picture of the back of the president, I could see people getting a little bit restless. He was getting a little bit restless. I was still giving him direction in terms of the body position. And then he asked me kind of what was next. I could tell he was being restless. And I, you know, I, I said I was going to try a couple of things. He says, okay, that's enough art. And, uh, you know, it was just the perfect amount of time for me to be able to get what I needed to get in order to be able to do that photograph. Funny enough, they didn't actually publish that picture. That picture just sat in the archive until I was ready to, to put it out there. So it was like a, a, a fine bottle of wine. We just kind of kept it in the, in the archive till it was ready to, 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 to come out. Eight years ago, Vanity Fair came to me with the idea of doing an Instagram studio within their Vanity Fair party, which I was actually very reluctant to do because I, I knew it was going to be a tougher angle to set up the, the, the right kind of equipment, set up the right kind of scene that I wanted to, to, to work in. And, uh, and then also for them to be able to pull off bringing people in during this party, which is very exclusive and very, um, you know, it's intimate and a place that people probably don't want to do this. Much to my amazement though, people were very willing to come in and sit for one or two minutes. In that period of time when I was working, which was for about an eight hour stretch, every muscle that you have that you use in terms of getting people to, to pose, to directing people, is your arsenal when you're working under that kind of stress and that kind of situation. And uh, I would say that as a, a young photographer, that would have been pretty hard to pull off, but to be able to use all my tricks, all my different um, abilities as a photographer during that situation was, was, was the best tool for me to be able to, to have. So, um, yeah, I mean, those situations are pretty common in terms of most photo sessions. There's, there's uh, always going to be a certain amount of stress that you're going to go through in order to be able to get the kind of work that you want and to bring that quality up the way that you want it to. I, after I left the Vanity Fair party that night, I said never again. And of course, seven years later, uh, we have a, a pretty substantial body of work. And uh, what was so unique about it is that people were seeing these portraits come out that same evening. So it was, it was very instant, which is the total use of it, social media anyway. So very, very unique. And during those Vanity Fair sessions, there's sometimes four or five frames that you get. There's sometimes 10 frames you get. And, and, and probably more problematic than the number of frames you get, you also have subjects coming in to have their photograph being taken. You know, it's, it's kind of coming from all different directions in terms of your own uh, fulfillment of what you're doing and also the fulfillment of, you know, having a number of subjects come through at the same time, which is uh, uh, yet another uh, kind of interesting problem to have. Right after the Oscars, we came back to New York and, uh, and essentially the city started to shut down. And uh, that was a very, very interesting time for me too because it was, it was probably the only time in 25, 30 years that I hadn't been on the road or I hadn't been on assignment. And I just started to see the city from a different perspective. I saw it from a place 
that was unique from the standpoint that there weren't people out. There wasn't this, this kind of distraction uh, in, in these different areas that I had fallen in love with in New York City. And it was just these beautiful landscapes. And something activated in me that made me want to go out and record this time in the city, which I thought was, you know, melancholy was... Uh, at the same time, there was a certain beauty to it because the city was in full bloom during spring. The cherry blossoms were, were in full bloom in, in the West Village. Um, the streets had that, that incredible spring rain every morning, so there was these wet concrete everywhere. And there was a, a sadness, but there was also a bit of poetry to it, which, um, which really, to me, registered a lot photographically. And one afternoon as the sun was going down, I stopped in the West Village and I took a, uh, a, a couple of uh, photographs in the West Village and I came back and I looked at them and I thought, well, let me just, let me just put this out and see what's happening. And, and people really responded. The people wanted to know that we're seeing, people that were seeing this on social media wanted to know what was happening to their city, what, what they were not able to witness, whether they were in their homes, where they had moved out of the city temporarily, or people that had just left years before and had a relationship with New York. And as I moved through photographing day after day, I started to build this collection. And we got invited to go to um, the Javits Center to photograph there. Um, we picked up on different parts of the city that were that were really supporting uh, this incredible experience in the pandemic. Um, we didn't, I didn't really see it as a, a series of photographs that had people in it. It was more the absence of people. It's almost as if New York was at rest as well. I felt like at a certain time, the project would come to an end, but I wasn't sure when that end date would be. And then when, um, when George Floyd was killed and you had all these streets that had been empty suddenly ignite with the protests and with this uprise, th that was the end of the project for me. That was, it was time to move on and to kind of refocus my attention to what was happening at that moment. And fortunately, we were able to pull enough of the images out from the series to be able to put a book together that I've named The City That Finally Sleeps. And that, uh, to me, really appeared to be the, the right tone for what I was feeling at the, at the time of making those photographs. One of the things that I think is important to, to recognize, and, and I've done it a couple of different times, is that you don't have to go very far in order to be able to find photographs, especially living in the city, or any city for that matter. And if you just walk out your front door, you're going to find wonderful moments, wonderful experiences that are worthy of a photograph. And they may not seem worthy to other people, or you may not think that they're worthy to other people, but if you are connected to them, I guarantee you that probably somebody else out there is going to appreciate your efforts of going out there and making the work. The other book that, that, that is very close to me, which we did probably five years ago, is a book on the West Village, on Christopher Street specifically, where I was just asking people if I could do their portraits. And the reason why I got inspired to do that is because I could see the neighborhood changing. It was gentrifying, people were moving out, you know, different groups of people were moving in. But there was this theater that I had seen start to evaporate on Christopher Street. And that to me was worth going out and paying attention to. And once I started to get those portraits, and it was really randomly asking people if I could take their picture, uh, we, we kind of came to grips that it was more of a transgender story than it was just about Christopher Street. And then that led to documenting their stories and, um, and putting the work out there. I 
I mean, I love the idea of technology and how it can be used, but but technology is a paintbrush. You know, we, we decided to use the IQ because of really the, the resolution and because of the detail. So uh, it was probably a happy mistake for me because I went out there, just had it in my car and started to take these pictures in the West Village, you know, during bloom, full bloom of the, the cherry blossoms. And the detail and the, the overall mood that the camera gave me really seemed to be the right fit for the project. And once I start on uh, a project, I typically will just use one camera. I don't, I won't mix it. But uh, everything is different. For the Christopher Street project, it was a Hasselblad with, you know, Tri-X film. So I knew I wanted to have these few darkroom prints. So everything has its own recipe. It's like going into one of those great diners on you know, the West Side Highway where you open up the menu and there's Chinese and there's Mexican and there's you get know, a bagel and then you can go over here and you can get Swedish meatballs. It just depends what kind of mood you're in. The project with Christie's and with Rad came about from really the studio. The studio wanted to activate and do something that felt unique uh, during this time to be able to do our part for New York City and uh, and for other organizations that were you know really at the uh, at the front of this pandemic and and doing the hard work, doing the heavy lifting. So. The thought was to go in and activate the archive to auction off 25 prints, and we enlisted a wonderful organization uh, out of LA called RAD, which is the Red Carpet Advocacy. And uh, in kind of generating ideas with them, we decided to go to Christie's and, and pitch the idea to them to see if they might want to help us along with an auction. It, it, it just so happened that their spring summer auction was was at the right time for our, you know, acti activation, and so we were able to to join forces and 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 then we worked with uh, Sunshine Sacks to be able to do the publicity on it, and everybody just jumped on board. And what was so cool is we raised uh, a quarter of a million dollars in about three weeks that was distributed to all these different organizations. And a lot of the organizations were diverse because those were the organizations that the subjects wanted to sponsor. And that was part of the deal, that if they gave us the ability to use their image, then we would donate to their charity. Well, success is really having a career. And what I mean by that is by giving yourself a chance to grow as an artist and to experience different phases where, you know, business is cyclical and a career is cyclical, but a long career is success to me. And, you know, not giving up, um, being able to turn the page and reinvent yourself is, is by far, uh, the code to having a long career. Well, fashion photography for me came very late in the game. Uh, it became an interest for me as I wanted to step away from photographing, uh, you know, famous people. And I wanted to let the fashion be the hero. And, uh, and really to utilize the idea of stories in a much broader way. Uh, fashion photography usually has a little bit more real estate in terms of uh, how many photographs you can tell that story by. So fashion was really unique for me to walk into and, and, and not particularly easy to break into. 
Uh, and I'm still learning a lot about fashion photography. You know, you're, you're working with an incredible group of support. You know, you, you're, your right hand, if not your equal, is going to be your editor. Fashion editors come with a lot of, you know, specific ideas about what they want to do. So you have to be willing to, you know, be flexible in order to be able to, to do the, the, the type of work that I'm interested in doing. And that is storytelling. And storytelling is really the, the, the basis of, of what my, I think my directive is when, I, when it comes to an assignment. It's what is the story and fashion, it's the fashion, right? It's the designer's, you know, it's the designer's uh, vision of what they were thinking of when they were working on this collection. Or it is the imagination if you look at, you know, an incredibly, you know, tailored, coutured, you know, piece of clothing and what's the fantasy behind it or what's the story behind it and how to move through that in order to be able to tell a series of photographs ultimately to tell that story. Well, the Cobain picture was one that that is is very special. It was it was certainly a learning curve for me. Um, I had tested a specific type of lighting that I wanted to accomplish uh, at that time in my career, not necessarily with Kurt, but um, with with a few people. And it was using large format, which I was uh, kind of bending into in terms of portraiture, which is not necessarily that easy. It was a very shallow depth of field using a strobe. So everything had to be manipulated in order to be able to shoot at five, six, because I wanted the edge to fall off past the eyes. And then at that time, you know, there, there was no such thing as a, as a digi back. So what I was using was a Polaroid, type 55 to be specific. And when we did the test shot, which was a very quick session with Kurt. I was set up in this one small room where we had already photographed the group and I was shooting individual portraits. And I was using Type 55 Polaroid to make sure that my calculations were right with my lighting and to make sure the lighting was correct. Um, Kurt sits down and there was a very different experience than what you had heard through his recovery, that he was on the, a very, you know, kind of uplifted, uh, you know, more present experience. And I saw this kind of melancholy in his eyes, only in the Polaroid. So when I pulled the Polaroid and I saw what I got, I put it down and then I proceeded to shoot 10 pieces of film, moved on to the next subject, which was Dave Grohl, and then, out, and then after that was Chris Novacek. And so these portraits were done. I was loading up my equipment from the shoot, and I looked at that Polaroid, which I had already put into the, into the bucket, and was ready to carry it back on the plane with me. And I thought, man, I just hope I got something that, that is close to what this is. And uh, I better take damn good care of this negative on my flight home. And I remember like sitting there with that negative, just thinking about what I saw in that Polaroid. There was just this, it wasn't sadness, but it was more of emotion. It was that off moment. I, I would call it a caught moment, but I think of it almost as if he wasn't really expecting it to be a photograph. He was expecting it to be, or I should say, he wasn't expecting it to be a keeper. He was expecting it to be the test. And he let his guard down. And just from that experience, it taught me that even those in-between moments can have a moment of, of grandeur or of gravitas that you have to be aware of. And, and so 
that led me to feeling pretty specific about how I was going to treat tests and also how I was going to treat the negative from the 55. And uh, we're still trying to figure out if we can get some 55 so that we can go back to working like that. And the shape and the landscape has changed so much from film because, as you know, when you're shooting film, you don't have 10 people hovering around a monitor looking at the images and deciding what's good and what's not. It's really up between you and your subject. And there's an inertia and there's a momentum to a photo shoot when you're shooting film. And that has become somewhat lost in the digital world. You know, the, the idea that if you could step back in time and photograph somebody is the way I think about the ones that got away, right? Like to me, that's that's kind of how I think about that question. And uh, my attachment to music runs, runs deep. Like, a, I think a lot of people in this world, you know, music has a, an effect on all of us. And uh, I've been super, super lucky. I've been working with Rolling Stone and working with Vanity Fair and then, you know, all through, even in the fashion world of having some kind of a layer about music to it, to way that I think about photography uh, keeps coming back. So when I think about subjects that I wish I would have gotten, I can just name two right off the bat. Actually three. John Lennon wasn't really a photographer at that time. Roy Orbison, one of the great singers of all time. And then came close a couple times, but never happened, Prince. And that to me, oh, and uh, one person who I just thought about because Mary Wilson just passed away a couple days ago was Diana Ross and, uh, and the Supremes. So I would, I would say that would be a pretty great checklist for me to return to. Yeah, Keith, and Keith Richards, you know, I have to say that I, I've never met a subject that's more of a wise man and a rascal. He's, uh, he's just incredibly kind in terms of being a subject, but he's really, amazing in front of a camera and completely uh, involved in the process, which is kind of rare. You don't really think about a lot of musicians with, with the kind of energy that he brings to it. It's usually, it's more of like that facial recognition that you're getting you know, the, the recognition that you get from photographing somebody that's well known that can really lift a photograph, right? Like that can really make a photograph pretty special, not necessarily their, their, their physicality or their activity or their, but he is such a quirky, wonderful performer and person that he brings so much to the table. Uh, I, I've had, a handful of sessions with him and each time I get to photograph him, it's like the first time I've ever photographed him. It's, it's just magical. For those of you who don't know who an album is, it was before um, Spotify, Apple Music, uh, CDs, cassettes, Eight tracks. This is a record. So when I was a kid, one of my favorite singers was Leon Russell. My brother Yoel uh, turned me on to Leon. And uh, 
I became obsessed with his music and his piano playing. So deep into my career, I finally got an opportunity to go to Nashville and photograph Leon Russell before he passed away. And I got to meet him. And uh, I brought my Willow of the Wisp record for him to sign. And uh, I remember walking up to his front door, which is a very, very humble little modest, it was a very, very modest little house, little cottage he lived in. And uh, he opened the front door and there was Leon Russell standing there and he says, are you ready to make some photographic history? And I thought, God damn, yes I am. So anyway, this is, uh, every once in a while I'll bring, a, I'll bring one of my prize little albums or CDs and I'll have my heroes sign them for me. And I got, I have one by the Beatles, except for, of course, John Lennon. I have one from the Rolling Stones. I have one from Paul Simon and from Willie Nelson and from Glenn Campbell. Nice. Yeah. If I was going to do it all over again, I don't think I'd really change anything because pretty much the stars have lined up in a, a incredible way for me. And, you know, I was at the right place at the right time. I, I have always been passionate about photography. So, you know, I think probably living in the golden age of magazines was um, the, the, the gift that I got you know, to be able to, to go on this journey. And, uh, and then also, you know, my background, my family, the support for my family, and then also just, you know, enough foresight to respect that journey is something that I don't think I could have changed. You know, I, I don't have a lot of really good quotes, but one quote that I think, you know, I've passed on to the people that come to the studio is, there, there's very little room in the middle, but there's plenty of room on top. Set your sights high. Um, there's plenty of places to go in, in work and in passion. Especially now, it's a very infinite world. There's so many different Places you can go with photography, whether it's landscape or portraiture or fashion or, you know, still life, fine art, commercial, applied art, printmaking. Uh, it's, it's just, it's endless what you can do in, in our world. And, you know, the, the worst picture that you ever do is the one that you don't go out and take. And that to me is is how I've always set myself up. You know, I've sat in my apartment wondering what I wanted to do next, and then I'll look outside and I'll see an incredible environment happening right outside of my window, and I'll grab my camera and I'll go out and I'll shoot a couple of frames. And I never, ever, ever feel bad after doing that. I always feel like I've uh, accomplished something, even if the photograph is not, you know, worthy of a print. It's just going out there and, and having the action. B&H presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021, the Album Cover Award, sponsored by Sigma, featuring a Sigma 85mm f1.4 DGDN art lens. And the winner is... The Promise by Richard Johnson.
congratulations. This is our green vest. This is our conveyor belt. This is one of our photo experts. This is a brief history of B&H. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy. And it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street, then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories on over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkup. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. B&H is not a chain. B&H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are B&H. At B&H, we found a way for you to save the tax. Have to have the latest Sony camera and save the tax? You got it. Need the new MacBook Pro? It's yours. How about a supersonic high-def telescope? We got you. Meet Peibu. You pay the tax, we pay you back, just like that. B&H.
Tracy Maglowski is an award-winning portrait photographer, photography educator, and mentor. She's an Olympus visionary, pro photo legend of light, and Miller speaker team member, a studio owner in Cincinnati, Ohio, with a primary focus on portraiture, Tracy's creative concepts and vibrant imagery have earned her features in major publications such as Professional Photographer, Shutterbug, Rangefinder, Digital Photo Pro, Click, and really many more. Tracy's teaching style is described as entertaining, inspirational, and mostly informative. And she will be showcasing a wonderful resource for photographers to offer their clients, maternity portraiture. This category of photography will represent a great opportunity as I'm sure a baby boom will be occurring due to the lockdowns. Please pay attention as Tracy shares her work and wisdom. Welcome Tracy Maglowski, Olympus Visionary to Depth of Field. Okay, so we have Riley here in the studio and we have her against a white piece of paper and we're gonna create silhouette shots. And by using the strobes to light up the background and bringing Riley away from the background, we're going to keep her in complete silhouette and just light the white enough so that her silhouette shows up very crisp and clean. So we'll walk through a few silhouette shots and just see what it looks like. For right now, I'm using the 40 to 150 millimeter F2.8 f and I do have my two Pro Photos um, back there. I have Pro Photo B10s, uh, B10 Pluses with my two by three strips that are lighting that background for me. And right now I'm just gonna keep my, um, my shot from like right about mid thigh up and um, we'll create what we need to here by having Riley really shape herself using that front knee as a really good bend so that we can get some great um, triangles going in the image. So what Riley's gonna do is she's gonna go ahead and bend that knee, put that hand on the belly in the front. I'm gonna just draw back a little bit. Um, actually, let's put that one on your back. Great, and let's bring the other one up to create another triangle. We're just gonna try to remember to keep that face in that open space of the triangle on the upper arm, and that looks great. Just there, stay like that. The face is turned completely sideways. Gorgeous, love it, a beautiful shot. And the great thing about using the 40 to 150 for a shot like this is that it keeps her onto that background. It kind of compresses enough that even if you were using a small background, let's just say you didn't have an eight foot or a nine foot background, let's just say that you were using a five by seven, you'd still be able to compress enough to keep her on that background if you're using a longer lens for something like this. So Riley, let's go ahead and make our hearts the same way we did before. And we'll just take, um, we'll take that arm in the front there and we'll do the front hearts first. So the, yep, that thumbs together, heart tilted toward me. Great, perfect, just like that. And just turn your heart open toward me just a little bit more. Good, perfect. Just watch your thumb there on your right hand. Push it forward a little bit to give me space on that heart loop. Good, 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 just like that, stay there. Great, perfect shot there, just perfect. And then we're just gonna have Riley do this to stay in the same position. So she's keeping her belly forward facing, and then she's gonna bring those hands over the shoulder, put the fingertips together and the thumb together there on the bottom and just tilt that heart up toward the camera a little bit. Perfect, chin's gonna go this way and we're really gonna angle that heart back as far as we can and drop that front elbow as much as you can. Yes, push back as hard as you can. Here we go. Angle that belly toward me just a little bit more so you have more space. Awesome. You got it. Chin up just a little bit. Good. There it is. Perfect. Love. Now, there's a lot of things we could do here with this silhouette shooting, but you can see that we were very easily able to make the background look completely light and Riley to be completely in shadow. Now, one of the things that I see people run into with, with this and what they have problems with is that there's light on the front you're gonna probably have an issue getting complete silhouette. 
Another issue that sometimes people run into is if you use light clothing on the front. So we've chosen strategically to do a darker gown because if it was white, the light does reflect off of it more and obviously it's gonna be more difficult to make it fall into shadow. So when you're doing these shots, sometimes it's important to think, you know, make sure that the clothing that you're using is dark so you don't have to fight with the light so much. So let's just do a few more things here. Riley, we'll just create a couple more shots that could be really beautiful as well. So go ahead and just like you just had hands on the side of the belly, yep. And then that back arm, just drop it down beside you so that we can't see it. So bring it forward just a little bit more. Good, now we can't see it at all. Yep, chin straight forward, beautiful, just like that. We'll just create some beautiful shots this way. Now, Riley, think the same way, but this time I want your chin to come forward and down just a little bit. And I'm wondering if, um, if you have a ringlet that you could pull out in the back of your hair that could just come forward by your chin, the other side. Perfect. Yep. And just so it could come forward toward your chin, and we'll just let a little ringlet come down and create a little more um, accent there in the back. And just let it come down like right in the front there. If you can't, it's okay. No, it's okay. If you can get it, great. If not, it's okay. She's like, I'm taking that bun down. I mean, I can take it down. No, it's okay. We'll just leave it just like that. So, yeah, take it down. <laughs> Pull one ringlet out. Oh, really quick, Riley, let me show to this too. The, the reason why we don't leave the hair down, and I'm going to show you why we usually put it up in a bun. So, Riley, just stand there just like that. Put the hand on the on the waist again. It can get kind of confusing as to what's going on and it kind of hides the thinness of the neck when we do that. This is why I like, even if you wanna put a top knot in, you can, um, or just at the back of the nape of the neck, either way works for me, but just make sure that we have the hair up off of the neck so that the neck gets to be thin and we can see that she has a neck and it's not just like kind of weird, I guess, is like the best way to say it. Because remember, everything just becomes a shadow and it's very difficult to tell what something is. And this is why like, even when we took the shot with her hand behind her, we make sure that that hand is hidden behind the body so that we don't have to worry about it kind of not showing or whatever. And Riley, if it's easiest, you could take that up over your ear so that it hangs in the right spot. There we go, let me see what that looks like. So you're gonna lean your face forward so it's kind of coming forward. Yeah, just like that, looking down. Let's see if we see it. Oh, beautiful. I'm just gonna fix one thing. It's actually just that little one there that I need. And so we're just gonna wrap That's this one around and we'll let this one dangle down because it looks perfect, exactly what we're looking for. So we'll come back over here. We've got those lights going. We've got that little teeny curl coming down. Really bend that knee in the front and hide that, that back hand. Like don't, like put it on the side of the belly. The other back one, yep. Put it straight down your leg. Good, now it's hidden. Perfect. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love it. Gorgeous. There we go, really pretty, soft, simple, so maternal. This is the kind of stuff that you can do, like you can do as many different shapes as you can figure out to do in a scenario like this when you're using this backlight. So just remember the way to do it is to just have your, your white come down and use your lights, make it even on the background. And just so you know, like our lights right now are set to 4.5. And um, what we did is we just metered our lights for the back for the, uh, the white paper. And then we brought Riley far enough away for it from it so that the lights were not hitting her at all. The lights are only for the paper. And then when we bring her forward like that, we don't have to worry about the light spilling onto her and taking her out of that silhouette. So this is just an extra way that you can get your silhouette shots if you're not shooting natural light. Just remember, you can always take your strobes and point them at your background and create a beautiful, even light, just one on each side, kind of feathered in so that the light is even on the background. Now, when you're doing this, remember that 
you can use compression like I did today with the 40 to 150 if you have a small paper roll versus a large paper roll. So if you don't have a large paper roll or you're in a small space, use the compression of your lens to make sure that you can keep your subject on that background and create gorgeous silhouettes in this way. So I wanted to take an opportunity to give those of you who may not use studio, studio strobes or have a studio that you have access to an opportunity to create the same look against a window with natural light. And um, you'll, we'll see right away that there are a few issues that we're gonna have to kind of overcome as we're shooting in this natural light with a frame of a window. Now, if you were outside shooting against, say, the sunrise or the sunset, it might be a little easier to get those silhouette looks without having to worry so much about keeping someone in the frame. But in this situation, since we're shooting against a window and we have shears behind Riley, we're going to be careful that we use a lens that offers us some compression so that we can kind of shrink her into that frame there. Another thing that we want to be careful of is that we don't move Riley too close to the window because if we do, that light will make its way around her and we won't get her in full silhouette. And since this is a silhouette shot and we want to just get the outline of her body in shadow, we're going to make sure she's pulled away from the window just enough so that the light doesn't kind of wrap around the front of her as well. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, Riley is standing there now and we're going to have Riley bend her front knee. And no matter what, in every single scenario, when I'm shooting a pregnant woman, I always have her bend to the front knee. And the only time that changes is if she's facing forward toward the camera like this, I'll still have a bend on the knee and have it crossed over just so that we can still kind of thin out that bottom, have him really draw attention to the belly. So now that she's there in, the, in front of the window and you can kind of see the natural light spilling through, I'm using my Olympus uh, EM1X and my 40 to 150 and I'm gonna shoot this at about 80 millimeters um, to, to get her inside the frame and to make sure that she's outlined completely in light. Otherwise, I'll have to spill out over the window, which is fine if you like that look, but for me, I want her completely cut out with light. So I'm gonna have Riley bend the front knee and then I'll have her take her front hand and put it at the small of her back to really get that elbow there and let light shine through there. And then she's gonna push the elbow back toward the window as much as possible. And then the front hand is gonna come up into the hair and just on the side of the head. For these shots, I specifically like to have the hair pulled back in some kind of knot or up on top as a top knot. Either way works great. But when the hair is down and you're gonna see this, it kind of looks weird because it's also part of the shadow. So what we'll do here is I'm gonna have Riley bring that front hand up enough that we can see the outline of her face. So Riley, bring that hand forward more toward the temple of that back side of your head, yes. And then she's got her face completely face to the side of my camera view. And then that front elbow that's on the small of the back is gonna push back toward the light, yes giving me these beautiful triangles. Now you can see in this shot, we're gonna have some beautiful triangles to work with here on the knee, which we'll only see parts of, and then here. This is gonna count as a triangle for us too, even though there's a little curve on the belly. So we're gonna step back enough and I'm gonna get a little lower so that I can get all of Riley into that windowsill. Now, I am shooting at f4.5 right now, and I want to lighten up that background just a little bit more so I may change that. Yes. And I'm creating these gorgeous shadows of her body and still getting the beautiful back natural light coming in there. Now that I've got the shape of her body, what we want to try to do is create a bunch of different silhouette shapes here. Um, some of the time it's difficult to really kind of figure out how to verbalize what you're trying to tell people when you're doing posing. And so one of the things I love to recommend to photographers is specifically to show people what you mean instead of just telling them. Because often it can be very confusing and I'm sure you've experienced that yourself. Um, so we've done the pose with that in the front. We want to get a pose with Riley with one hand on the back and one hand over the belly. And we'll just go ahead and do that really great tip of the knee again. Yep, we haven't changed much here, but we may in post decide that we like this one better. 
Riley's doing a great job keeping her face turned completely sideways to the camera. Awesome, I'm loving the way that looks. Great, now, another thing I like to do here is to create an image where we make mom give some hearts so that I love to do a three piece canvas of this and it's one of our best sellers. So we'll create this really quickly and see how we do with it. It can be difficult sometimes for moms to get into this pose just because it's kind of a little bit confusing. But Riley is going to turn her belly the way that it is now. And she's going to take one hand, the back hand out this way to create one part of the heart. And then the front hand is gonna come meet that thumb and the heart is gonna be down, yes. Take one tiny step backwards. There we go, bend that front knee still. And we're gonna work really hard to get that heart to kind of have its point at the bottom. Yep, and then your fingers, just make sure they're laid against each other, really flat, so I'm actually seeing a heart. Yep, good job. Thumbnails together, good. Turn that heart just a little more toward me, and I know it's really awkward, but I swear it looks really good in post. Good, 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 just like that. Stay just there. Put your fingers together to touch as much as you can on your back hand. Just make them lay against each other. Good. Just there, just like that. Perfect, okay, great. Now, stay there, but take one step forward. We're gonna do one over the shoulder. Sometimes this is the one that we, it can be interesting. So you're gonna keep your belly facing that way, but you're gonna take your hands this time and make a heart this way. And you're gonna push it over this shoulder. Awesome, beautiful, perfect. Now, yep, a little further if possible just because of your pony. Good, great, gorgeous. Push your chin forward as much as you can. Forward towards your front part of your body, yep. More, more, more with that heart. Push it back as far as you, yes, good, great, got it. Fingers together as much as possible, lay your nails on top of each other, good. Beautiful. Sorry, one more time. Really round those fingers. Pinky, oh, you got it, good, gorgeous, love it. Chin up just a little, good. Got it, love, okay, perfect. So we've created that and then the, um, the one with her hands on her belly. And I usually use those as a three piece and we create a beautiful saying and I'll show you a picture of that in just a minute. So here we are against the natural light and we've done this. It would seem like we don't wanna just move away from this just yet because we have an awesome opportunity to use the natural light and show her body as well in light. So I wanted to talk a little bit about using natural light versus strobe in a situation like this. And we're gonna do both so you can see the difference between what happens when you're shooting in a situation where you're using natural light as backlight and bringing light to the front. Um, so for this next part, we're gonna bring in a reflector and I'm gonna show you what you can do with a reflector. And then we'll bring in a light and we'll show you what you can do with a studio strobe as well. So hold on just a minute and we'll be right back with you. Okay, so we've moved into a natural light scenario and I kind of, we started to play with this and I wanted to show you some of the problems that we're gonna run into. We have a lot of natural light flowing in through this window and I wanna show you what happens when you're trying to use just natural light. Now, we brought in and I specifically used one of the reflectors that is very inexpensive. This is literally a insulation sheet from Home Depot or Lowe's and it was like $8. And this side is silver and the side that you're not seeing is just white. So um, I prefer using white whenever possible because I think that it creates a nice soft pushback of light and it doesn't have very much contrast. When I'm shooting for a maternity session, one of the things that I'm looking for is a nice soft ethereal look. So in order to do that, I kind of tend to stay away from contrast as much as possible. So we have Riley here against the wall and I wanna show you what we were running into at the beginning when we moved over here, just so that you know, these are some of the things that you're gonna to have to solve for when you decide you're gonna shoot natural light without any studio strobes. 
So I'm gonna have Riley lean back on the wall like there and bend that front leg and put both hands on top of belly. I am switch my lenses to a one-two lens so that I can get enough light in to make sure that um, I get Riley lit up. And we also, if you noticed, we moved this reflector really, really close to Riley so we can get as much pushback from it as possible. So as you're shooting in natural light, one of the things to think about is that the closer your reflector is to your subject, the more light you're gonna be able to produce from it. And that's just because the light doesn't have to travel as far. So just think about that. If you're missing some light and you need a little more, push that reflector as close as you can without getting it in your frame. So we've done that here with this reflector. Now, one of the problems that I'm running into is that as I'm photographing Riley, to get her exposed properly, one of the things I'm having to do is to let go of my highlights that are coming from my windows. So as soon as my high, if I get her exposed properly, I'm letting my highlights be totally blown out. In a minute, I wanna show you what this looks like if we decide that we're gonna bring a studio light in and create the, the exposure that we want on Riley and let the background be what it is. So I can then take my highlights from my window, tamp them down and still get enough light to Riley because I'm producing the light, not relying on the natural light to do it. So here we are, we have this window here that's in my shot and in the background, we have that window in the back and then we have some shears hanging back there. One of the things you're gonna notice as well is that my white brick walls are gonna turn a little blue because black, the, the natural light is does have a blue shift to it. And then I also have, thankfully in our studio, these really beautiful original floors, but they have a very orange kind of feel to them. So we've got warm coming from the floor, we've got blue coming from the outside. So let's just see what it looks like. So we're gonna let the highlights go. We're gonna perfectly expose for Riley. And then I'm gonna give you another option that you could potentially use. Riley, really bend that front leg as much as possible. Yep, good. Eyes right here, perfect. Okay, so now we've gotten that and you can kind of see in these shots how this front curtain is very bright, the back curtain is very bright. And one of the problems with that is basically that when there's something brighter than the subject in the image, your eye is drawn to that, unless it's everything in the, in the whole entire composition is brighter than the subject. Then your eye's drawn to the subject because your subject's the only thing in the image that isn't kind of in that bright space. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna have Riley step away from the wall in the window and not use these as a part of what we're doing today. I'm just gonna move this reflector a little bit forward so that Riley can step forward as well. And instead of having her lean on the wall, step forward one more tiny bit. Good, I'm gonna have her bend that front leg. I'm gonna have her bring one hand underneath the belly, put one hand on top. One of the other little quick posing tips is that with um, my pregnant moms, one of the things that I highly recommend trying to remember to do in each of your poses is to have them close the thumb. Lots of times you'll have this on the belly and one of the problems with this on the belly is that later you're looking at that thumb wishing that you had taken it and pushed it down. So just try to remember to push that thumb down as you're working. Now we've pulled Riley away from the wall so that we don't have to include our highlighted areas as much if we don't want to. So we're gonna take a few shots like this, allow that natural light to be there, but not blown out in our frame. So just to give you a, a, an idea, my settings here are ISO 200, 1 200th of a second, and I'm shooting at F1.2. So I switched lenses, if you remember when we were shooting into the window to add compression so that we could make her sink into that backdrop more and stay in that frame. Now we've switched to the F1.2, and this is the 45 millimeter F1.2 from Olympus. So what I've done here with this is given myself the ability to gather a little more light with that F1.2. So let me see if I can just get a couple more shots like this. Good. And Riley's gonna turn her chin all the way to that shoulder. Just another really quick thing is that a lot of times when you have people turn their chin to the shoulder, they wanna bring that shoulder up to meet that chin. And what we're looking for is a really open space here. The more space we get in the neck, the longer it looks. And that's always what we're looking for is that nice open shoulder. 
Riley, switch your hands, put um, one on, yeah, just like that. Really drop that shoulder space, good. Eyes here with those banging blue eyes, awesome. Good. Okay, so you can see in these shots, what we've created is an opportunity to take these highlighted areas just out of the frame. And what we've done by doing that is kind of tamped down what looks like too much light. Now we could do some different poses here, which we'll do really quick, just so I can show you what I would run through in each scene. Because many times what happens is you get into your maternity session or your senior session or your wedding and you run out of things to do. And then you're standing there trying to figure out what poses you should do next. So I'm gonna run through really quick and just give you a couple that you can try. So go ahead and get that knee uh, forward again, great. And maybe I should show this without the reflector. So really quick, I'm gonna move this so you all can see exactly what's going on with Riley. I'm actually gonna turn Riley this way so that you all can see exactly what we're doing. So light notwithstanding, let's just run through a few poses. So you okay? You falling? Yeah, I'm a little tangled. <laughs> okay. Okay, so she's got that front knee always, right? And remember, we're gonna close those thumbs down. So we're gonna have Riley put both hands on the top of her belly. So both hands on top, great. And now, the other thing that we're looking for here is remember, we're always wanting a little space. So it's okay if these hands air this way, because this back arm doesn't need to be in the shot at all, but we do want this right here. So um, we're gonna do this, and then we'll just push that elbow back, right? Riley at this point can bring her chin to the shoulder, drop the shoulder a whole bunch, which she's already doing. She can also look that way just a little bit and then bring eyes down to what I always say, eyes down to the chest. But a lot of times when we do eyes down to the chest, the chin comes down too, so bring the chin down. This is not always flattering to everyone, so we always say chin back up and then just the eyes coming down, right? Almost like connecting with baby. So there's that. And then another thing she could do is look directly at the camera, so look right this way. Beautiful, just like that. Now, Riley, go ahead and take your front hand and bring it down underneath belly. This is exactly what I would run through. Yep, and again, this hand going underneath doesn't have to be all the way underneath because a lot of times people will be like this, right? This hand can come back here and have the same exact effect. So don't be afraid to let this hand come forward a little bit. And then you can run through the same thing. We can bring the chin here and look down the arm. Beautiful, that is such a gorgeous pose there. And then same thing, eyes this way, chin this way, and then eyes down, right? We can look right at the camera and smile. And one other thing we like to say is that you can look up to God or heaven, right? So just push that chin forward, right? And eyes up just a little bit. That's great. Now, we've done both hands up. Let's do both hands down and see what that looks like. So both hands under belly, great. Now, when you remember, if you remember when we were in the window, another thing that we can try is take this hand up to the hair, really extend that, right? And Riley's chin can go forward for this one. She can also put this, this hand here, either here or here or here. Totally up to your preference, which one you think looks the best. So feel free to use any of those. Um, and then the other thing that we can do from here is we're gonna turn Riley forward facing because I want to show you um, what I do with my moms that are, um, that are pregnant. Just because we're facing forward, what we'd like to do is take that front leg, yes, bend it a bunch, and then we're just gonna push the knee over the other knee. And you can already see that we've created a way thinner front area. And um, just for the shadow today, we're gonna have Riley switch legs once and let's see what that looks like coming in from the window, I can see. Yeah, I like that. Now, she's got both hands down, thumbs closed. Do both hands up, perfect. Yep, and she's lifting her elbows just a little, maybe a little less, good. And for this one too, she can turn her chin to the side, drop that, oh, that shoulder a whole bunch, eyes down, right? And then chin toward us with a big smile chin toward us with a tiny smile, eyes here to heaven, beautiful. We can connect with baby, chin out toward us, just the eyes go down to the belly. Perfect, love it. Now we can do both hands underneath. And this is where this really kind of, this one comes in handy. 
and just kind of flatten your body toward us just a little more by pushing that shoulder. Good. Lift the elbows just a tiniest bit. Yes, very good. And now again, we can go through those looks again if we like to. Um, one of the things that I want to point out too is that don't be afraid to get different angles. So it could be that in this shot and in this series, I'm on a stepping stool above her shooting down into the belly. And we'll do some of that in a little bit. So I just wanted to run through those things with you now, Riley. Another thing you can do is kind of give baby a hug. So one hand's going to go up, one's going to go, yes, just encircling. And um, kind of let this shoulder drop even more and bring that hand around even further. Yep, good, perfect. This is a great chance here to really look down and connect with baby. Maybe a tiny smile, chin back up, just the eyes down. Good, perfect. And I love the idea too of her turning her chin the other way over that shoulder and then eyes down from there. Little less of the turn of the chin. Perfect, just there. And so you can see as we're walking through this that if I did this in every single set that we were on in the studio, and let's just say that we work on four different sets, and I can work through and walk through all of these different poses, I've got plenty of deliverables, and I haven't run out of anything to do. And then I save my specialty shots, like one's laying on the floor or one's sitting down or any of that for a specialty shot, but I know I have plenty of deliverables even if those shots don't work out. Because being honest, some moms can't get into all poses. So it's just something to think about as you're moving forward. Okay, so we're gonna move next into going back to this space and seeing what we could create if we brought our own light and we weren't fully relying on the natural light. So give us just a minute and we'll be right back with you. Okay, so we're here back in the exact same spot that we took the natural light shots in and I wanna really quickly run through what we're gonna be using. So we have our Olympus EM1X and we're using the 45 millimeter F12 again. And I wanna show in succession the difference between shooting with light right now, I'm shooting at um, ISO 200, one five hundredth of a second. And I'm using my shutter speed to tamp down the highlights that are coming in from the windows. And then I'm shooting at f1.2 still. So when we were doing natural light, we were shooting f1.2. And of course, we had to slow down our shutter a bunch just so we could make sure that we had enough light for Riley. But let's try this with our D2. We have a strip box, a one by six with the grid on it. So we can keep the light from getting too far all over everything. We just want it to be for her body and her face. And then back here, I have a, um, a deep silver uh, XL from Profoto with the diffuser on, and there's a D2 in there. We're using that just to make sure that that back curtain there doesn't just turn into a dirty, muddy, blue kind of mess. And so uh, we wanna make sure we get enough light on it so that it looks pleasing in the background. So real quick, let's take a shot like this. So Riley get in position. Good, just a real quick shot. Good, and now I, I want to turn off my, uh, my strobes really quick, and I'm gonna take the same shot so you can see what 1 500th of a second looks like with no strobes going off. So I'll get my 1 500th of a second with no strobes, and you'll see it's extremely dark, right? So in order to get this natural light shot with the same kind of appearance, I'm gonna have to shoot at 1 40th of a second. 1 40th of a second is really, really, really slow shutter. So let's just make sure that when we're doing this, you're using an Olympus because <laughs> the image stabilization allows you to shoot at 1 40th of a second and get a really clear, clean, crisp shot. So I can do it with my Olympus, but just watch as we get the same exact shot, 1 40th of a second, no strobes. So, there we have it, the natural light shot, no light at all with the same settings that we would use to make sure that our curtains are not completely blown out and our highlights aren't lost with the strobes. So we used the pro photos to just bring in the light that we needed on the front, fill in the back and create a natural light look without having to rely on the light being exactly what we needed to be. And in my opinion, having that kind of control really does set me apart. And so I, I would love for all of us to be able to learn how to use strobes just in case that the sun isn't exactly where we need it when we need it to be there. Okay, so we have Riley in front of the window again and we're gonna do a few natural light shots. I wanna show you some things I would do in a seated position. And what we've had Riley do is sit on the chair 
and she's kind of toward the front edge of the chair and she's focused on kind of rolling onto her left hip. Yes, so that belly sticks out and she can elongate her legs and kind of push her heels and her ankles back toward the wall in a bent position so that belly kind of pops out and still able to get those hands on belly so that we can still see that connection there. So right now my settings are um, ISO 800, one one hundredth of a second, and I'm shooting F1.2. We've got a reflector coming in here to fill in a little bit and you're gonna see what we're looking for. Yes, Riley's bringing her chin over to the side there and we're just looking for that really ethereal look. So we're just gonna catch some beautiful moments there. Riley right here into the lens. And then one looking down to baby and just connecting there. Chin over to the shoulder a little more. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one. Good, chin down just a little more. Now, as we're here getting these shots, I love when we get this angle here where the chin comes this way just a little bit, eyes down, and I'm gonna use um, my articulating screen here just to like be able to get above Riley without like dangling precariously above her on a um, stool or something like that, which is always like a little bit on the dangerous side in my opinion. So we'll just kind of get above her a little bit with this articulating screen and be able to see exactly what we're getting without having to dangle above her. Get those really nice ethereal looks there. Create some really gorgeous shots. Another thing to think about as you're doing your natural light shots, and I'm just gonna fix this gown really quick right here and pull it down in the back is that another opportunity we have is just to see belly and mom's hands. So Riley, go ahead and lean back even further. Yep, you can kind of fall back almost into that. If you need to scoot back a little bit, that's totally fine. Good, yes, just let that fall there. Now, I'm gonna do what I would consider one of the shots that I think people are always looking for, which is just this connection with belly. And we're just gonna come here. Not even having mom's face in this shot is really nice. Gives us a beautiful shot of belly. And just that mom moment. Riley, take your front hand and put it on top of belly once. The other one, there you go. Just really flatten it on top, real soft. Yes, beautiful. And just for good measure, we'll back up and we're gonna put her face into one of them. So it's like, yeah, bring that head and just lay it there. Perfect, so soft, so lovely, gorgeous. And for those of you who don't know, when you're a photographer, you spend most of your time on the floor <laughs> because angles, right? Angles are everything. We can create some really beautiful ethereal images just like that. I wanna get one with her full body in. So I'm gonna have her come to the edge of the chair again, kind of rolling onto that hip one more time. We'll spread this dress out really beautifully. Um, and go ahead and use that hand. Yes, just like that. Just bend that elbow a little bit in the back. Perfect. You can use, yeah, you can even put your hand on the dress. I don't mind if it's inside the sleeve like that. Beautiful, and just really bend that, that elbow there. And this hand, oh, thank you. I guess we don't need to see your gym socks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go, yeah. And then pull back this way just a little bit more. Yeah, let that just fall just like that. And I just wanna make sure that like the flow of the dress is here as well. So we'll pull this over because it's in the back and we don't need it there anyway. There we go, so pretty. And just real quick, because I'm picky and I don't want to fix it later, we'll pull that down again. There we go, just nice and relaxed. We'll get that full shot in there, make sure we have all of the dress in. At this point, guys, I could switch to a 25 one too. But for the sake of argument, let's just say 
I'm gonna stick with this 45 one too. Beautiful, Riley. Gorgeous. I'm gonna get a full body shot and I am kind of fighting a little bit with that reflector because it's sort of in my shot. So I can either tack over, right, to get it out of my shot, or I could switch, if I was ambitious right now, to the 25 millimeter F12. And that would allow me to get closer to her and not have to fight as much with that reflector. Riley, that was beautiful. Look down again. Beautiful. Chin up just a little. Good. So if I got, if I had the 25 on, I could come a little closer and then that reflector would be a non-issue completely because it would be right out of the way. Remember, this reflector is just one that is a piece of insulation that was like $8 at Home Depot. <laughs> so good. Chin up again because I'm going to do an overhead shot and I am going to bring in my, um, my stepping stool for one just to get really so just remember when you're doing this you don't want to use a lens that you have to look straight down them because it is possible you could fall or any other thing so just remember to be really cautious when you're when you're working in this kind of way beautiful riley now this is where that depth of field is really going to come into play too so i'm shooting f1 too so everything's kind of falling off softly in the background that's exactly what I'm looking for. Wow, that is so pretty, Riley. Gorgeous. I love it. Eyes up here for one. Beautiful. I'm just going to go one more time for that. Wow, that is really, really pretty. Let me just get my... Oh, I love it. Okay, eyes down to belly again. Perfection. Beautiful. So all we're doing is just playing with different angles and using the natural light. Just remember, if you're using natural light, if you have a giant reflector like this, it's so much easier to like get a pleasing light and to let yourself play in this kind of a scenario. And a lot of times it's okay if that light is falling softly over the belly and it's okay if we don't always show the, the face and it's okay if it's just the hands really close up on the belly. It doesn't have to be so literal all the time. So I love using natural light shots like this for when I'm working with a, with a pregnant mom because I think it does really create a beautiful ethereal look. So um, in the next bit, we're gonna show a little bit more about what I would do with studio strobes against like a darker background. So we'll be back in just a few minutes. So here we are in the studio against this blue wall that's a set that we use often for our maternity sessions, mainly because we can toss fabric and stuff and it doesn't get lost and go off the edges. Uh, if you notice to the left of the wall, there's a window coming, um, window light coming in there. And that's the light that we're gonna use right now. We don't have any extra light that we're using. You see the strobe set up because we're gonna set, we're gonna do strobe light next. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let that natural light fall on Riley and on the back wall. And you can kind of see that it's already doing that right now. And my settings um, are ISO 800, 1 60th of a second F12. And if you remember when we were shooting against the window light, we were using the 45 millimeter F12 and I've switched to the 25 so I can be a little closer to Riley and still get that F12 because I really need that extra push of light because it's about 5.30 where we are and the sun has already begun to set and it's quite overcast outside today. So the natural light coming in is not very strong. So we're gonna shoot at F12. We're still gonna use that ISO to get what we need and then we're gonna shoot at 1 60th of a second. Just again saying that 1 60th handheld is actually really impressive um, to be able to shoot at that handheld and not feel like you're gonna get a muddy shot. And I promise these will not be muddy. So I have my, um, my camera turned so that I'm gonna get a portrait shot. And so as I'm doing the portrait shot, I kinda wanna keep the dark sides of the background out because I see shadow. If you look on the left-hand side where that light is kinda moving in, um, I'm gonna have a really dark vignette, which isn't terrible, but if I keep it to the exposed part of the wall, it's not gonna be distracting. So we'll keep it to the exposed part of the wall and we're gonna shoot here. We'll let Riley really get that front knee bent, chin around to the shoulder a whole bunch, drop that shoulder. Yep, chin down just a little bit, good. Just like that. 
We'll just make sure that we're getting the proper exposure on Riley's face. Right, beautiful. There we go. So what we can see here is that we have a beautiful, nice exposure. We might even pop that down to 1 50th of a second real quick just to see how I feel about that. There we go. I like that even better. Go to 1 50th. We'll try 1 40th and just see which one we prefer as we're looking at our images later. Beautiful, Riley. Change that front hand up to the top of the belly so we can see that flow of that gown on the sleeve. Gorgeous. I love it. And go ahead and look out the window for one. Chin toward me a little bit more, 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 more. So you're no, there we go. And all we're doing there, so your eyes can come to this other window that's over here. That, yes. All we're doing there is just making sure that that, that Riley's nose kind of doesn't break the cheek on this side. So Riley, turn once totally toward the window with your face. So there's a total profile. And now turn it back to where it was. Good. So much better in angle. And as you're looking through these, you'll be able to see the difference there. Gorgeous. Love the light there. Now we're just going to turn our strobes on and kind of look and see what we've got. I'm going to take one wide shot so you can see the difference between that dark vignette on the edges. And we'll turn this to um, a landscape orientation. Show you those dark edges and kind of where you can see that natural light coming in. Good. Really pretty still. But you can see that cut kind of even on the floor. If you're looking at the light, you can see that cut on the floor in that far corner. That's just going to be a little bit distracting as we're looking through the images later. Um, I'm probably going to really dislike that. That's why I decided to shoot that in that portrait orientation. Um, one of the things to look out for is like if I was shooting Riley here and I wanted to get a close up shot, one thing I would avoid probably using the, the 25 millimeter just because it's going to make Riley's face look wider than it is. So in most cases, if I'm shooting someone really close up, I'm going to use that 45 millimeter or that 40 to 150 just so I can get that compression on the lens so that the face doesn't become widened by the lens, right? So let me just kind of show what I mean. So there's that close up, but it, the closer I get, the more and more wide Riley's face will look. Now, if I was using a 45 millimeter, which I'll grab really quick and doing the same exact thing, really close up. I'm not going to get that same distortion that I get with that 25 millimeter. And also even this entire set, if I shoot it again with this 45 millimeter and I come back further from it, it's going to get a lot of compression and it's going to make it seem like I have more, a little more room. I'd be able to keep that light right where I want it. So we'll compare the two of those so that you can see them here. Good. Now we're going to switch to studio strobe and I'm just going to turn on my, my lights real quick and we'll turn on some modeling lights so we can kind of see where the light's going to fall. Let me just see what we're working with. Let's just see here. Take a really quick shot. And obviously this isn't exactly where I want it to be yet. So let's see if we can't fix it. Get a really quick skin shot. And let's see where we are with that. Oh, ha, rookie mistake. I definitely don't need to shoot at ISO 800 if I'm doing this setup. So let's go ahead and come back from that and bring our ISO back down to 200. And we'll shoot at f1.2. We'll go to 1 1 25th of a second. And I'm going to redo that skin shot real quick just to make sure that the exposure on the skin is right with my front light. That's better. And let's try that. And we can tweak as we go here. I know it seems like sometimes you watch people shoot and you think, or you see their images and you think, oh, they got it the first time out of the camera. There's some tweaking that goes on that's important to just kind of recognize. Let me just make sure I'm 
getting one for you. That looked like the natural light shot that we did. Man, it's so pretty. And of course, you know, my preference is gonna be with the strobe light. That's not always true of everyone. So if you're taking a picture of yourself, let's just say you're pregnant and you wanna take a picture of yourself, just remember like, if you can get that hand underneath here, just hold that there, bend this front knee a whole bunch. It's almost as though, and Riley's doing it so well, I'm gonna show you her gym sock. <laughs> She's really pointing that toe. And this doesn't even just go for um, maternity pictures. This is like all pictures. If you get that front bend, it looks really nice. It just elongates and there you go, Riley, good job. And then this hand, just kind of pull it back just a little bit. You can kind of bring that other one over to meet it almost. Yeah, pretty, pretty, yes. So now we've got our strobe going and we've got this perfect exposure on her skin. We still have that beautiful vignette that we've created. And just so you know, we've got, you know, this uh, strip box over here, the one by six, and then we have a two by three up top. And then this here is our key light, but it's almost like mirroring that window light that we were experienced before, experiencing before um, we turned any of the strobes on. And then we did bring a little reflector here that works both as a pushback for the natural light and for the strobe light. So just think about that as you're, um, as you're using your strobes. Now, one thing that um, we enjoy in the studio is proper skin exposure. And so we're always looking for how can we make sure that the skin is exposed properly and that we don't blow people out. And so uh, that's a really important thing to think about. And you can see how much easier it was for us to get to a really beautiful background and really beautiful skin tones as the light began to get lower and lower and softer and softer. So uh, for those of you who are shooting natural light, it's a good idea to think about when you're shooting as much as it is about where you're shooting. So it's possible that if you were to shoot you know, closer to sunset or sunrise, you're gonna have a way easier time getting the light that you're looking for than if you're shooting in broad daylight, like we, were, like we were earlier when we got started. The sun was really low, it was banging through those windows. It was really hard to tamp the highlights, but now you can see how soft the light is coming in when we're not using the strobes. So just something to think about as you're choosing your time of day, I would say that's one of the most important pieces if you're a natural light shooter. This is Tracy McGlasky. Thanks so much for joining us at the BH Depth of Field event. And thanks so much to Olympus for sponsoring us to be here. If you're looking for ways to follow us on social media, follow us at Tracy Dean Photo on Instagram, at Get Olympus on Instagram, and at Riley Varney on Instagram. And we look forward to seeing you at the QA after. This is a story about a magical place where everything's amazing, especially the people. We can tell you everything there is to know about over 400,000 different pieces of gear. Tell them, Lenny. We have a 17 millimeter, 24 millimeter, 45 millimeter. He does this all day. We'll help you find the right thing, which is often not the most expensive. The A9 is great, but I think the 6500 is better for what you need. That's pretty rare. And just like you, we love to explore and share our passion because we're creators as well. Israel and Jake like to make videos for the web. Oh, I love it when he does this. Oh, by the way, if you can't meet us in person, you can always chat with us online. Think of us as collaborators, production partners, problem solvers. This is Greg. He's made five gold records. You can play your voice high. And here's Jay, the king of the candidates. Wait, 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 I'm not ready, Jay. Sometimes we geek out and help each other, but mostly we're here to help you. Like Lenny, who's still going, because there's a lot to say when you're making some pretty important decisions. So now you've met 16 of over 1,000 employees. 16 reasons our customers like to do business with people, not algorithms. We are B&H. Oh, and here it is. I am very excited to introduce you to the Surface Book 3. 
With updated processor options, enhanced graphics performance, and available on either the 13.5 or 15 inch model, Surface Book 3 is the most powerful laptop in the Surface family. So what's new with Surface Book 3? Well, it's all about performance, with both the best battery life and graphics performance of any Surface. With Surface Book 3, you'll leverage the full power of 10th generation Intel Core processors for those pro-grade photo and video editing apps like Adobe Creative Cloud. Or immerse yourself in the latest gaming titles from Xbox Game Pass for PC with the optional discrete graphics card configurations. And of course, multitask between your mission-critical apps like Office, Photoshop, and AutoCAD without missing a beat with up to 32 gigs of RAM and 2 terabytes of SSD storage. Whether you choose the 15-inch or the 13.5-inch Surface Book 3, configure it to match your lifestyle and profession. And choose the best graphics option for you, including the remarkably powerful GeForce GTX 1660Ti with 6 gigs of dedicated graphics memory. In fact, when the performance enhancements are taken into account, Surface Book 3 13.5 inch is a whopping 50% faster than the previous generation Surface Book 2 13.5 inch. If you spend a lot of time unplugged, Surface Book 3 is a smart fit. It has the best battery life of any Surface device ever. Thanks to batteries which are both in the display and in the base, Surface Book 3 can deliver up to 15 and a half hours on the 13.5 inch model and up to 17 and a half hours on the 15 inch model. Surface Book 3 truly has been designed to power you through even your busiest days. Surface Book has always been known for its versatility, and Surface Book 3 is certainly no different, with both USB Type-C, USB Type-A ports, and a full-size SD card slot. Our engineers have been hard at work refining the build quality of Surface devices for years, and sometimes it's the smallest details that can make the most impact. For example, Surface Book 3 detaches from its base twice as quickly as Surface Book 2. That of course means you can quickly move between the different user modes of Surface Book 3 so that you can create your best work using Surface Pen or Surface Dial. Upload your best videos using the 1080p front-facing camera. Or kick back and use your keyboard and mouse or an Xbox One wireless controller to play some of the most popular and intense games available. So, are you hungry for power? Do you demand that tailored solution for your work? Are you not a fan of compromises? Then take a closer look at the most powerful laptop of the Surface family, the Surface Book 3. I feel like landscape is reflected in the people that inhabit it. Anytime I'm put on assignment to tell a story, I start to look for those similarities or those reflections of the place in the people and the people in the place. This is an ancient landscape. All of those things are connected by the textures that are represented in the faces of the people, in the textures of the horses, the dust that erupts to the bookshelf cliffs, and the way that the light scrapes across them at the end of the day. All of that is texture. In the evolution of photography, we've always searched for greater depth. We've searched for greater detail. In creating that depth, you are invited into a deeper emotional landscape. And that is the point of great photography. The file is so complete that you get those subtle textures, everything from the small shadows that pebbles create to the cracks in the mud to the huge hundreds of feet of undulation that wrap around the landscape in the background. The 14 to 24 to 8, the 24 to 70 to 8, and the 70 to 200 to 8 were the primary lenses that I had on my camera for the entirety of the shoot. Uh, it allowed me to be quick, nimble, versatile. These lenses are tack sharp edge to edge. 
with a single battery, I was able to operate all day long. If you add the vertical grip, you're extending the power of the camera and the, and the longevity of the batteries for another day, if not more. You can also use it as a vertical grip to shoot portrait orientation. In general, shooting backlit is incredibly hard on glass. The performance of the Z system was spectacular, largely because of the flawless nature of the Nikon glass. Specifically for this story, uh, backlighting subjects, the cowboys, the family, works incredibly well because it shows the dust and the grit that this, this landscape is known for. The Z7 II in every way delivers across the board what I expect from a robust mirrorless system in the field. I was never concerned about the dust that was getting into it because it just didn't get into it. I wasn't concerned about having these horses come by and splash, literally soaking me, drenching me. Uh, I was never concerned about the camera being affected. I was never concerned about the camera not being able to carry the amount of detail that I wanted to tell the story that I wanted. I was only concerned about my execution of it. One of the things that I love most about the Z7 II, the new system, is the speed at which it shoots, as well as the buffer. Now, I don't have to substitute any of the quality for the speed. The ability to shoot 10 frames a second as a scene unfolds allows you a much broader choice in your edit and allows you the ability to find that serendipity, to find those moments that bring all the elements together to make your viewers feel. I think what the Z7 II system allows me to do is move closer towards capturing what I feel versus just what I see. I am a relentless perfectionist. I demand perfection from whatever I do. I demand perfection from myself. In order to achieve the things I want to achieve, I have to have absolutely the best to achieve it, to make it look and appear the way I need it to. Widely regarded as one of the best wedding and portrait photographers in the world, Jerry Quijonas' name has become synonymous with excellence, mastery, and innovation in photography. The most awarded photographer in the Wedding and Portrait Photographers International Organization, WPPI, he was also its first Grandmaster, a Nikon ambassador and inventor of the ice light. Jerry was named one of American Photo Magazine's top 10 best wedding photographers in the world and was also a United Nations Leadership Award by the International Photographic Council. I've had the honor of working with Jerry over the years, first when he debuted the ice light at the B&H event space, just located right over there, and at countless photo events across the country. Jerry's had a profound impact on pro photographers and is the only speaker to be featured in depth of field for three years in a row. He's just that good. It's always a pleasure to work with Jerry and his wife, Melissa, since they are the epitome of professionalism. We thank Nikon for bringing Jerry back to Depth of Field and we welcome home on the stages of Depth of Field. Before he takes over, I just wanna share a quick memory of last year's Depth of Field. We had Jerry doing live demos in the trade show room. And the Nikon rep at the time said, you should create a little stage for Jerry because he's going to attract a crowd. Boy, was he right. When Jerry did his lighting demo, he must have had a sea of about 250 photographers surrounding him. It was an amazing sight to see. It was a lot of heads, Jerry standing on the stage, his model, and some ice lights. So welcome back, Jerry. Thanks for coming. Thank you, David, for that incredible introduction. And it's getting really awkward now if there was no introduction. <laughs> but either way, B&H, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak 
for the Depth of Field Conference uh, yet again. I think it's my third or fourth time, something like that. Uh, certainly it's a shame that we can't do it in person. Hopefully this is the last time we will do it remotely, but great to be here. Now, I was thinking, well, what can I speak about? I've spoken about several topics over the years, um, and certainly I can just show you the best photograph that I've taken of every single shoot, and that perhaps might be impressive, fantastic, great, but you could probably just go to my website or my Instagram and have a look at my latest work. The idea of this presentation is really getting to the heart of the details, the finesse. What is the difference between a good photograph and a great photograph? It's all in the subtleties. Now, here's the thing. You might think, well, your subjects, your friends, your clients, whoever you photograph, don't know the difference between the good and the great. So why focus on them? Here's the thing, people might not recognize those subtleties, but they know how they feel when they see it. So I'm here to actually show you many examples of how those subtleties will affect your work and therefore how someone feels. Now, I believe art is a form of communication. So if art is a form of communication, the more you communicate a stronger feeling, the, the more artistic it is, the more of an artist you are. So I don't care whether you are a hobbyist uh, watching right now, whether you're a semi-pro, uh, you're an enthusiast, you're a professional, I believe that we can impart some knowledge with you to give you some street smart knowledge on lighting and posing and certainly a bit of creativity and how to what I call recognize creative triggers in the environment. So let's get right into it. So let's say for example you're in, in a situation like this and you think well you know what do I do with this situation? <laughs> it's full sun, there's a basketball ring, uh, the sun's hitting a building, how can I create a really good shot here? Well, this is the thing. After shooting for professionally for 27 years and teaching for 20, you start to look at things a little bit differently. And I believe that's what our clients or you know, your subjects expect of you. They're expecting you to see the world a little bit differently and see the beauty in the environment. Now for me, I the way you are as a person. Okay, so if uh, you're not really a nice guy, it might show in your work. There's, there's no soul to the work. If you see the beauty in everything, which I like to think that I do, I'll walk into a room that's really shabby and not that great and actually recognize the beauty in it. So all I'm doing is looking for little pockets of light. I'm looking for negative space. How do I bring out the best of the situation? Now, if you're 40 plus years of age, you, you would have grown up with a TV show called MacGyver. Now, MacGyver was famous uh, for making something out of nothing. And early in my career, I challenged myself to go to very difficult locations and create something really cool. And it's funny because although I photographed weddings, portraits, fashion, boudoir, and performers, people have the impression that I photograph these high-end weddings and these high-end shoots, and I don't. I, in fact, I've just learned how to get more money from normal people. <laughs> so that's really it. So what I'm getting at is that I have the ordinary everyday challenges that basically everyone has when they photograph. How do you bring out the best in someone? And how do you see the world a little bit differently? And how do we practice our craft to the point where we are understanding these little problems, but recognizing it before we even click the shutter? So in this situation, as you can see, there is a basketball ring. I don't, that's got nothing to do with the photograph that I'm about to show you, but it's a, just a domestic environment. The full sun is hitting this building. Now, if I decide to put my couple in the foreground, in the shade, as you can basically see, then if I expose for them, then that background is going to be completely white. It's going to look really silly. So the idea, though, is that if I can get them close together, isolate a piece of sunlight hitting that back wall, then it's going to look really cool. Now, here's the thing, though. So you, can you picture it in your mind now? You're seeing a silhouette, a silhouette of a couple putting their foreheads together and it's looking really great. But what I normally do with my exposure, because I'm shooting with a Nikon mirrorless system, and currently I'm shooting with a Z7 II, but it, what you see is what you get. Exposure is so easy to read these days, but quite simply, what I do is this. I pick a, a safe shutter speed, I pick a desired aperture, so I'm shooting on manual, a desired shutter speed, uh, a desired aperture and a shutter speed that I can safely handhold. And I don't play with fire. I mean, I can handhold with a 30th of a second. I can handhold even a half a second now with the image stabilizer, but why would I even risk that? Because I personally have a very low tolerance for lack of sharpness. So I might choose a speed of 200 or 250. I might choose an aperture of, of maybe 2.8, 1.8 or four, whatever it may be. So I usually stick with a very similar combination of shutter speed and aperture 
And then what I do is I then increase or decrease my ISO. And then with what I see with my own two eyes and I'm seeing the live exposure, I'm looking for detail in the highlights, I'm looking for detail in the skin tone, and that's my guide. So going back to this specific example, if you look at the couple here, as you can see, that if I expose for them, the background's gonna go white, as we said, but if I actually expose for the background, as in I want detail in that background, then they're gonna be silhouetted and it's gonna look really cool. So what I did was this, where I usually shoot with a daylight white balance, I actually went with the uh, shade white balance, which will make everything warmer. What we're basically saying to the camera, hey camera, we're shooting in the shade of a building, it's a cool environment, I wanna add warmth in layman's terms. So I changed my white balance to basically the shade. I also changed my picture control to vivid, as you can basically see. So what do I get in camera with no Photoshop? I get an image like this. And I love the fact that you can see a little bit of beading on the upper chest of the bride. I love that you can see the sort of the rugged beard and, and the mustache um, of the groom here as well. But you would swear this was done in sunset. So if I literally basically shot with this with daylight and exposed for them, this would look horrible. So don't forget that you can isolate environments, you can isolate the beauty. Like I said, you don't have to just simply always look for the obvious. If anything, if you do the opposite, you will get you know, more applause from your, your audience than anything else. So a big difference between, again, the environment that we're basically in and then actually seeing what we can do with it in camera. It's also important that when you're uh, looking at an environment like this or you're posing a couple like this, very, very important. If you get their noses touching, the noses will bleed into each other. Therefore, you don't actually see the, 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 the soul of it. Because think about it this way. What does a silhouette mean? A silhouette means you, you're defining shape and form. So if the noses connect or they kiss, you're not seeing that beautiful silhouette. So to make this romantic, the foreheads touch so it can isolate and give your photograph a natural vignette but then you've got the breathing space between their noses and their lips and somewhat of a love heart when you look at the shape uh, a bit more intently there as well. Really, really important. Now, if you do a shot like this and the couple are smiling, the silhouette of lips parted with teeth looks really weird. Uh, if you do a, like a little pucker up like they're about to kiss, that looks really weird. So also remember, even a plus size guy as opposed to a plus size girl, girls, even a plus size girl has less of a double chin than usually a guy. And because guys are usually taller than girls, it's good because we've got the bridge of the, basically his nose fitting into the bridge, on the top of the bridge of, of her nose and her eye, and it forms a beautiful puzzle. Remember, when two faces or two bodies fit together like a puzzle, it basically, it's aesthetically pleasing. So always, when you think of posing, think of it like two pieces of a puzzle. If it fits together nicely, chances are it's aesthetically pleasing, looks really good. A lot of people ask me about what camera gear that I use. Um, I'm certainly a firm believer that the camera is only a tool and you make the difference. But rather than have to uh, look at my, the YouTube comments or whatever this is gonna be posted, I thought I'd just share with you the, uh, the gear that I basically use. I am a proud Nikon ambassador. Um, the cameras that I'm using right now are the Nikon Z72 and the 6.2. Um, dual processor, dual card slot, obviously reliable, incredible EVF, all that kind of stuff. The mirrorless lenses that I'm using right now, the 35, the 50, 85, uh, obviously you can see them all there. I just basically got the 7200 2.8 mirrorless, which is amazing. Um, probably I had this uh, love affair probably in the last couple of years with the 85 millimeter F1.8. I'm 47, I'm not getting any younger. With the small mirrorless body with the 85 on there, it becomes a go-to portrait lens. I believe the 85 millimeter F1.8 is the predictably the sharpest lens of that focal length and that wider aperture that I've ever photographed in my career. So I'm very thankful for that and my back thanks me as well. And then of course, I've got a whole bunch of F-mount lenses that work seamlessly with the FTZ adapter and of course the speed lights as well. So, I guess what I wanna talk about too now guys is the idea of being able to recognize creative opportunities um, where, wherever it is that you are. Obviously we're living in a difficult time. So if you're watching this in 2021, we are still going through a pandemic and, the, and we've got a vaccine on the horizon and it's happening and you know, things have been really tough. We just, we've all felt it. Let's just acknowledge it. You know, sometimes you have to feel something, allow yourself to just, you know what, that really sucked. That really sucked that year. You know, like that, those two years really sucked. We all lost a lot of money. We've all lost a lot of business. 
we've all been isolated and we need to make things work. So I guess what I'm getting at is that I'm always consistently, always consistently looking for creative opportunities and looking for projects that feed my soul. Because if you do work that does not feed your soul, it will end up not feeding your mouth. What I'm getting at is that you can do photography just as a business, and that's okay. You can make money just like any other business. But I think to be truly successful, you really have to love this industry. You really have to be invested emotionally in it. And especially if you photograph people, and especially if you photograph weddings or portraits, then, man, that, that beauty and that warmth and that empathy needs to come out through the lens of your camera with who you're photographing. So anyway, we, I photographed this, this girl and we did this really, really awesome shoot of her. We had this beautiful, think of it like a, a it's almost like a one piece sort of bikini per se that had a cape to it and it was metallic and shimmery and it looked amazing. Anyway, when I first met her, I just felt this beautiful vulnerability, this strength but vulnerability at the same time, but you could tell she was one of those troubled teens. Anyway. This beautiful girl, anyway, so we, we got her on a ladder and we we're throwing the cape around and this beautiful light shimmering and it almost looked like liquid metal, just like just literally melting away. Anyway, I saw that she had basically shaved her head on Instagram because I was following her on Instagram. So she shaved her head and, and normally, I mean, the, the classic example is Britney Spears when she was troubled at, at a point and she shaved her own head and it wasn't really a stylistic choice. She was obviously going through some stuff. And I thought maybe it's the same with her, but purely from an empathetic perspective, I wanted to reach out to her. But from another perspective, I thought, how cool would it be that maybe I can photograph her intermittently, like every month or every two months, and photograph her bald, and then to a point where she's growing her hair, and then we do a really cool, consistent project. And it's maybe a two, three, four year project. What's the payoff? I don't really know. Could it be a book? Could it be an exhibition? Could it be a special on Netflix? I don't know. I am very entrepreneurial. I'm very ambitious, but I'm telling you that I'm obsessed with the process. I love the idea of just going on with a journey with this girl. Anyway, lots of things happen, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to tell you the complete story, but ultimately I wanted a photograph to tell me or to, to remind her of the chaos in her brain because she was going through a lot of stuff. And I'm not gonna talk about it here on this platform, but let's just say that she's gone through a lot of stuff, especially in her 20 or 21 years. So what I did was I put the 85 millimeter F1.8 lens. I wanted to focus on her bald head and I wanted the follicles of her head to represent a problem or something that she's had to face in her life. And even when I was talking to her and her burying her her head into her hands as I was very empathetic. So what was happening is I put my camera on a tripod and I talked to her. I wanted her to release the pain a little bit. I didn't only want to show what she looked like. I wanted to understand who she is and was. So a portrait is not just to beautify. It's not just for flattery. It is who are you? So this, although people might dismiss it as what, what's going on? She's not in focus. I can only see her nose. And it's, rep, it's meant to represent chaos. And that's just the thing. If you were to ask me, Jerry, how would you define good posing and good lighting in 10 seconds? I would say good posing and lighting is either flattering and or it helps communicate the message you're trying to convey to the viewer of the photograph. This is meant to make you uncomfortable. It is meant to. So anyway, we came back, I think a week or two weeks, two weeks later because the, the shoot didn't end the way we thought it was gonna end. It was mainly a therapy session. But I wanted a purity to her. I wanted this vulnerability just looking into the camera with very simple lighting. And it was this one. Obviously, we have a beautiful quality of light, Rembrandt lighting. Um, as you can see, she's confronting the issue. So I've got her facing the camera. Her shoulders on, her, on a bit of an angle. You can tell that arguably that she's poised to, to move somewhere a little bit different. But there is a vulnerability uh, to this photo, as you can see. I just love the fact that I didn't really know where I was going with this, with this shoot. So it's almost like I wanted the almost virgin-like approach to this thing. And let's just shoot and let's just see how I feel as we do it. Cut a long story short, I ended up having the idea that we can photograph her in a similar way every month or two, you know, somewhat of a similar pose. 
and then let it evolve over time. Imagine doing like a slideshow where she evolves. And I use roughly similar lighting, it doesn't have to be perfectly similar, a similar pose, and then let it evolve. So wouldn't it be cool that every time I see her, I would love to photograph her as she is, no makeup with whatever she's wearing. She's a bit of a wallflower. I thought, I'm like, fantastic. So we do one shot of her, no makeup with what she's wearing, totally off the cuff, no rules, no perfection, no nothing. Then we do a beauty shot, not dissimilar to what you're seeing. And then we do a completely different stylistic shoot. So every time, three looks. And then over two years or three years, we'll get this incredible body of work and an incredible story we have to tell. And this is it. So this was the, the pose that we decided to, to, to focus on. So as you can see, she's bald, um, and, but a gorgeous, beautiful face. And then, you know, this was the slight beauty difference. And then at one point, we simply painted her with gold body paint. And you might ask, well, what lighting am I using in this particular light source? Well, what it basically was, it was a, I've got two Profoto B1s as edge lights with blue gels. So there I've got my, you know, my edge lights with the blue gels. I've also got one light above, um, a B1 above, uh, with a five foot Octobox, acting like somewhat of a beauty dish, um, but a little bit of a bigger light source. And that was it. And the modifiers were a Westcott uh, five foot Octobox and Westcott strip banks. So, and the body paint looked really cool. And I actually loved her hands because she's got these unusually big hands for her face and it almost looked like a different person. And in fact, when I was photographing her, the way I, want, I, I emoted her um, at one point when she was getting very beautiful and soft and vulnerable and even shed quite a few tears during the shoot was I said to her, I want you to close your eyes and pretend like your hands are the hands of a loved one and just hold your face. And now think of a time when you didn't have this person in your life, but then these hands of the person that you love now was actually there to, to support you and comfort you. And you can even see, I've given myself goosebumps because I remember the exact moment when this happened and, it, and such just purity came out and authenticity was just so beautiful. So don't, rem, don't forget that, you know, photography is so much more than just posing and lighting and all that stuff. It's empathy and connecting. And sometimes you just can't do that with burying your head into a menu. Know your camera. That's your calculator, like a calculator to, to an accountant. But spend time and emote with people. So the next shoot, um, part of this shoot was we said that we were going to do a raw shot out of camera, no Photoshop. So this was basically one that we did. And then I said to you that we'll always do that third look. And this one was simply done with the sun as a backlight, a black uh, velvety background and a reflector off the silver side reflecting back into her face. So you can see how we're trying to be versatile and basically I call it like an evolution portrait. Now then she came back the next time and she wears these really odd things, but somehow she gets away with it. And without makeup, you sort of, you know, she's certainly got gorgeous features, but she, it's that, that transformation from no makeup to full on model was, was quite amazing. But this was at a camera. Um, she, this is just her just sort of jumping and having you know fun um, on this little, little bench area. And that was it. It's meant to be quirky. It's meant to be raw. It's not meant to be perfect. Then this next one, this is no Photoshop, out of camera, a similar pose, but now you can see that actually her hair has grown. Now don't forget, we do one shot with her with just wearing what she's normally wearing, then we do a beauty shot, then we do something a little bit different. For this particular shoot, we had the full sun, and I thought how cool would it be that we basically dress her up in a men's suit, and you know, we have, I love the fact that we've got the shadow of the hat sort of giving you that little sinister undertone behind her. We've got that little bit of a brow pressure going on, quite a masculine pose, that sort of shadow and highlight. So why am I showing you this today? I'm giving you subtleties between these different things, but mainly also to inspire you that if you're in a country or a state or an area where you can't really do anything, as in you can't you know, work like you normally do, there's some projects in your area. You could go to frontline workers, you could go to a hospital, you can go to a supermarket. You can tell the stories of the people around you. We are historians, people need us right now. So make sure you do that. And just to see that, that at least the progression that you're seeing now, 
Look at the difference between her bald and then her confidence is sort of growing. And as I see her confidence growing and her evolving in this, I just can't wait to actually share with you the final product when it comes. But don't forget, guys, we're not always going to shoot models. We're going to shoot normal people, right? You know, this is uh, the husband of, of a makeup artist that I work with uh, quite often. And I was actually doing a commercial shoot, a fashion shoot, and he came over. And although I remember him very well, I'm like, man, like, you look like straight out of Game of Thrones. But he's very unassuming. He's a big teddy bear. But I'm like, I want to create something very dramatic in camera. How do I do that? Well, what I ended up doing, One, as you can see two, in this particular photograph, brow. is... I've got the window light coming from the side, so as you can appreciate, the shadow is already on his right side, or camera right, his left, but I want a shadow on the other side, like containing the picture and making this look very, very dramatic. So what I basically ended up doing is, as you can see in this photograph, I've got two mini reflectors, and they're basically shielding light from one side and shielding light on the other, containing that shadow. And what do we get? I'm gonna show you the out of camera photograph with no Photoshop. Now, what makes this photograph? The cool thing about the Nikon camera system, yeah, I'm not too sure if other ones do it, but basically you can shoot photographs in a 16 by nine format. So I went to my, pitch, my, my ratios in my camera, chose 16 by nine, contained him within his beard, and then asked for a little bit of brow pressure. And then we've got nice even shadows on either side. You would swear that it was, this was done in Photoshop. Now, the difference between out of camera and that little bit of finesse that you would add afterwards now, I don't do my own Photoshop. I think it's a waste of time. I should spend time on things that only I can do. Photoshop, anyone can really do. Um, and I just simply tell my vision to the, the people that I use, and uh, that's how we do it. So this is the, the difference. Now, let me show you the difference. Boom, boom. So as you can see, I'm, I'm after realistic Photoshop. In other words, you can see the pores of his skin. You can see the texture. Um, you can see the brow pressure and all that stuff, but I'm removing blemishes. The way I like to consider Photoshop is if something is temporary, as in if it's a temporary blemish and it's not going to be there forever, get rid of it. If it's a, you know, mole, hashtag beauty spot, <laughs> then maybe if it's part of your person and you'd look weird without it, you would keep it. But then with a simple change, if you drop someone's chin and then look up at the camera, first of all, two things will happen. If you drop the chin of a guy and envelop his eyes. So you've got the pupil, then you've got the iris, and then you've got the sclera, right? The whites of the eyes. So what happens is if you drop the chin, the whites of the eyes envelop the iris, therefore making the eyes appear larger. When you do this with a guy, it looks very <laughs> aggressive. It looks like he's gonna kill you, right? That was part of the theatrics of it. I wanted to make him look like a wildling from Game of Thrones, and I wanted this very aggressiveness. And I love the fact that he's perfectly sharp in the glass of the eyes, and then it fades away into his beard, so it lifts your attention right on his eyes. So you see how these subtleties can make a huge difference? Now, if you drop the chin of a girl, so chin forward and down with the eyes up, it's more of a come hither look, it's very inviting. But when a guy does it, he looks like a bit of a serial killer, so be careful of that. We all, don't forget what this seminar is all about, next level, posing and lighting, next level, and, and how do we get to the next level, no matter where you are, is you've got to pay attention to the surroundings. Look for opportunities like that evolution portrait that I, I'm, I'm, that project that I'm doing. Look for these subtleties that will really define your work and, and your subjects. Now let's look at this shot. This was basically done um, with a softbox behind me. So the, let, actually, let me, let me retrace my steps here. When I'm photographing in the studio, there's a few things that I do almost all the time. So my go-to setup in the studio, I'll usually shoot at 250th of a second, f8, 100 ISO, great. I want my, my work to look very similar, so I keep similar settings. Unless I'm doing like a, a sports person where I need a high-speed sync and I have to increase the, the, the speed for any unknown reason. But traditionally, if I can pose the person and they're static, great. 250th of a second, f8, 100 ISO. First, I start with my my main light, okay, my, my fill light, pardon me, my fill light. So it's usually behind me. I use a seven foot Octobox from Westcott. And then I take a shot until I can just see detail. Okay, so now there is my base shot. I can just see detail, which means no matter what ratio that I choose, no matter what contrast I choose, I can just see detail on it. Turn that light off. Then I'll actually get the backlight, okay, the hair light. So just a little hint 
take that shot until I can just see detail, turn that off. And then I get my main light, position it in a way, in this case, as you can see, it's coming from camera right. It's five foot octobox, usually the octobox will be around about sort of chin height. It'll just fade away and feather away a little bit, not pointing directly at the subject. And then I get this soft look. As you'd appreciate, um, if you photograph a girl front on, you're photographing her at her widest. I'm not saying she is wide, as you can see, she's gorgeous, I mean, she's got a great figure. But if you photograph a girl at her widest, then you have to get the light come from the side to give you the depth and dimension and shape that you're not getting from the angle. So, usually I recommend turn the body away from the light and the face back in for the feminine form and for the male form, turn the body towards the light and the face. And I'll show you some more examples of that later. Now, this shot is not that, it's not that special, right? It's, it's okay. But then I looked at the shape of the dress and I'm like, wait a second, I'm, I'm almost seeing a, a little fairy or something from, um, oh, what do you call it there, that, that movie? Um, I might think of it later. But anyway, Peter Pan. Okay, so you've got the little fairy from Peter Pan or whatever it is. But you see that, this little butterfly or little fairy sort of you know, buzzing off with her, with, her, with her wings. I'm like, well, wait a second. Where I would almost never shoot with a bare bulb strobe, let alone towards the ground or a bit lower than, than the face, this just was calling out for it. So that's what I did. So as you can see in this particular photograph, you've got this beautiful silhouette. You've got separation between her and her shadow. I've given her a beautiful parting of her feet so we get a separation there as well. Her, her elbows are off, so I see air between them. But really the dominant figure here is the shadow behind her. And again, it almost looks dreamlike. The extra little bit of finesse that I put, apart from changing my approach completely and breaking the rules and doing something that we don't normally do, then all I did was, as you can see in this photograph, I turned her face until I get a bit of a silhouette, as you can see, a little silhouette um, of her face. I didn't want her face in light. I wanted it in shadow, therefore adding to the mystery of it all. So as you can see the difference, go back from there. I quite like this one because you, you got a bit of a silhouette of her eyelash, but then if you go a bit further, you see a silhouette of her profile and it adds that little bit of finesse. Now let's go one step further. I thought to myself, all right, let me get greedy now. I'm getting, I'm getting excited about this. I got the strobe, put it down low, and then pointed it up to her. Now that's a bit of a faux pas, you don't do that. That's like you only do that if you're doing the Blair Witch Project sequel, where you've got the light torch underneath the person's face. If you light, illuminate a girl from underneath, you're gonna get shadows on the upper cheekbones and it's gonna be very unflattering. You, it's, it's considered very masculine or ghoul-like as we say. So what I have to do is, if I get the light down low, the girl's face has to be parallel to the, to the light because I wanted a dramatic shadow behind her. So this is what I did. We dropped her face, bent her knee over. I wanted basically a, a gap, a bit of a gap between her arms and the shadow. And I wanted her face and head enveloped into her chest. And then I see this beautiful figure amplifying the shape. And of course, there's harmony and repetition. Then I thought, I want to create even more movement. By the way, this is just a white paper roll. One light source, one strobe, boom, 250 F8, and that's basically it. Shot in camera with a 16 by nine um, cropping ratio in the, at the time, the Z7. Then I thought, wouldn't it be cool to just lift up her leg so we get a little bit of separation there and a little bit of intrigue. And again, I'm keeping her chin down and enveloping her head in her chest of the shadow and the gaps between the arms and the shadow behind her. But you can sort of see that if I played safe, I will get safe. Ordinary effort, ordinary results, extraordinary effort, extraordinary results. My suggestion to you is whether you're doing a commission shoot, self-commission, wedding portrait, fashion, whatever it is, do what's expected, do the safe stuff, get that in the can. Do what you have to do, then do what you wanna do. Okay, now let's go to the next portrait, this one. I'm curious to know how many lights do you think I'm actually using in this particular shot? You'll be surprised. In fact, this is just an open garage door. Um, so basically in my studio, so right now I'm in the casita of the RV parking in my house. And the RV parking is, is basically my glorified studio. There's two roller doors, okay? I, close, I left the roller door closed behind him, so it's basically a grey muslin background. And then right where he is, is basically a smaller roller door, so I allowed the light to filter through. So we have this beautiful direction of light. 
Of course, because I'm exposing for him, that grey background practically goes pitch black, which, I mean, that's, you know, that's just common sense in exposure and understanding what the inverse square law does and what that theory is, but that's perhaps for another day. I wanted to make him look like a man, as in he's a little boy, but he, he, he has the maturity and sensibility of a, of a little man, right? So I deliberately got him to bring his shoulders back, put his fists underneath his biceps, which gives him a bit more bicep, and then hang his body down. The light behind him is the ice light, okay? So if, if you don't know what the ice light is, I'm, I'm actually very proud to say that I invented the ice light and I made it in conjunction uh, with Westcott. So if you ever see a light that looks somewhat like of a lightsaber, that is the ice light. Um, so the ice light is just giving him a little bit of a tickle of light behind him to separate him from the background. Now, if you look at this a little bit closer, as you can see, Arguably, there's a little bit of light, too much light on his chest, and I want to bring that value down. Can you do that in Photoshop? Yes. Can you in camera? Yes. Let me show the difference. So here we have, you know, the, especially the left-hand side of his body with a bit of a shade. Now, what did I do? I just grabbed a piece of board and just placed it over so I can just cut some light in. But look at the difference side by side. It's actually quite a big difference, don't you think? In terms of how it makes you feel, once you see the difference, you'll gravitate towards the one with, I guess, artistic, how do I say, it? it's, it's a deliberate perspective. Boom, you want, that's, that's the one that's better. I don't really know why, but I like it. The thing is, we're not going to be doing before and afters for clients. You just give them a strong feeling or not, or your friends or your subjects, whoever you photograph. Anyway, so he is a, a performer. I photographed him um, and his mother, um, basically... He was in uh, Beatles Love, like the Cirque du Soleil show here in Vegas. And the mother was in uh, Le Rev. And unfortunately, that got cancelled. So, but she's incredible. She's an incredible dancer. But uh, anyway, we became friends. And I was doing their family portrait. So if you have a look at this, I quite like that we've got black on black. Um, there is detail between the black and the black. But um, I like that. By the way, this is out of camera. There's no Photoshop done to this at all. Um, obviously, he's got young, really good skin. Um, but I like the fact that we're positioning the hand there in a, in a way that's quite masculine. It feels really good. See, with guys, you can do this. You can show the back of the hand. It's got a strong feel to it. With women, it, it's almost masculine. It's too masculine. The thing is, I could do this, and then all of a sudden I'm showing the thinnest part of the wrist, and I can bend the, the joints, and it looks feminine. But then if I turn like this, what was feminine from one angle can look masculine in the other. So we have to recognize those little different things. Now look at the difference between passive look in the camera, as you can see, he's just got that very, I don't know, this very intriguing look about him. He's got a quiet confidence and, um, and parting his lips. It's just, there's something going on there, you know? And you can tell I haven't retouched it because I've, I would probably retouch the, the dryness of his lips. Now, um, for my whole career, I've been... I've been studying people, studying faces, and I'm like, well, how do you get mystique in the face? And I basically say to people, I, what I'd like you to do is give me a little hint of a squint, a little tension in the eyelids. Now, my good friend Peter Hurley popularized squint, and I'm like, damn it, if only I came up with that, that was friggin' so cool, and trademarked it. Mine just takes too long to say, but anyway, I'll, I'll keep my way for the moment. A hint of a squint. So what we're doing is we go from this to this. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that the first one is bad, but it's good for, for a different reason. Right there, there's a softness, there's a vulnerability. Then you get a little bit of confidence, a little bit of mystique. And if you put them side by side, I'll let you be the judge. Especially for adults, when you're not trying to show softness and youth and vulnerability, it adds that mystique and it breaks the, the, the stare that's really boring that we often look at. And we see that, of course, in this particular photograph, as you, as you can see, where there's a little hint of a squint. Uh, and so on. Now, what I want you to notice is this. There's a nice direction of light. Uh, we've got a beautiful shadow on the side of his face. The shooting on the shadow side of his face means we, what's been popularized over the last several decades is shooting on the short side, the shadow side, or creating a narrow side of his face. My suggestion, though, is that the catch lights in the eyes should be more on the iris and the pupil rather than the whites, the sclera. So in this case, you can see how the catch lights in the eyes and the iris are just so much more powerful than doing it the other way. So just be careful of that. Now, so there they, there they were. They wanted a sophisticated family portrait. 
Now, I've taught in many different environments and I often teach the idea of actually shooting to sell. Shooting with the end product in mind, not just, oh, let me just shoot and hope for the best and hopefully I sell it afterwards. So they wanted a sophisticated family portrait and we liked the idea of being black on black, okay? Now, this is quite predictable, okay? Get them all close and cuddly, looking in the camera, but there's not much soul, not much soul to the photograph. Now, if you know me, being a, <laughs> an Australian-born Greek heritage and now an American as well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a cheeky guy. Let's just face it, I, I like to be cheeky, I like to have fun, drop innuendos respectfully and have some fun. So I made them laugh, boom. And we've got, now we've got a passive looking in the camera, then we've got a little bit of laughter. Now, as you can see, I haven't retouched it. This is straight out of camera, it's a recent shoot. You can see a little bit of a bra showing and stuff. Of course, I'd retouch that out. Uh, we kept on trying to hide it, but it kept on revealing, you know, so to speak. Nothing, in, you know, nothing too, too obvious, but certainly I'm gonna retouch that. The next photograph, you can see that I basically posed them and I said, smile, we all do it. Hey, look at the camera guys, big smile, woohoo. Great, okay, it's nice, it's nice. That's really it. Then um, a friend, of, a mutual friend was actually at the shoot and knowing that he could probably say things that I couldn't in terms of getting away with them, he said something quite inappropriate. You can tell very clearly by the look on her face uh, of what he said. Now here's the thing, if you want warmth in the eyes, but you don't want to shoot at the peak of someone's laughter because they're either too teethy or too gummy, make them laugh and then boom, you take the photograph and then you see a big difference between that one and that one. They're smiling in this, but here you can see that it's a bit more genuine. So what I like to do is when I'm doing a portrait, I like to conduct it like a symphony. Think of it this way. So I have one subject there, I photograph them, and then while, why, not, why would I waste that? Then I grab them in, grab the partner in, grab the child in and, and keep on playing. But one note will string to the next to the next. So let me explain that a bit further. So I take a photograph of, of, um, of this gorgeous girl. As you can see, her elbows are bending slightly. That's really important. If she had her arm completely straight, it would look too strong, too straight, too masculine. Now, she's a, an athlete, okay? She's, you can tell she's ripped. Now, I'm not saying we can't show that. It depends on the actual purpose of the shoot. Do you want to show that you're ripped? Do you want to show that, you know, that, you know, you're a dancer and you're strong, but a little bit of, you know, some femininity going on there, some beautiful curves, we want to combine the two. So bending that elbow slightly, allowing breathing space between the arm and the waist, and those fingers very delicately and a gap between the chin and the shoulder is very important. Why would I waste that shot and then reset again? While I've got her there, let me just get him involved. Great, we've got him. Now you might say, well, what's that light hitting them from the back? That's an actual uh, Westcott flex light. It's a one by one foot flex light. And that's giving us a bit of a break um, uh, behind. So that little tickle of light on his face. Now she's got blonde hair. so. That, that gives me the separation already. But look at the subtleties now. This is straight on, very editorial. We're not trying to show mum and dad are in love and they look amazing. This is more about an editorial, fashionable talking piece. You put it on the wall, it inspires a conversation. This is badass, badassery right, is what we're doing right now. This shot, as you can see, that little bit of finesse, bringing her eyes down, turning his face on a bit of an angle is a big difference. Because if you look at him, he's got quite pronounced ears. Good looking guy, absolutely. Um, but, you know, simply turning the face a little bit, getting rid of one ear, enveloping his other ear into his head, adds a bit of difference. We can go one step further. She looks up a little bit. One step further, we can make them laugh. And w watch what happens. You, you make someone laugh and then the warmth is retained in this shot. So you have to remember that, that all these things make a huge difference. So remember, make someone laugh, wait to the end, boom, take the shot, life is good. Okay, so you might be asking, well, Jerry, what's the main light coming from the front? That's just a garage door that's open. So what I do is I've, I've worked out the times of day that's really beautiful to shoot in my, literally my house and my uh, surrounding uh, areas. So the sun hits an opposing uh, wall of my neighbor and then comes back in and that becomes like a go-to lighting setup. The background is simply just a black, uh, uh, a black sort of felty background that I got from Westcott that just gives me 
just, it swallows up light. I'm not looking for texture. I'm looking for black on black. I want something very strong and sexy and sophisticated. So while I've got them there, why would I waste this shot? I'm going to get the sun involved as well. Boom. So now I've got that shot. So look at the difference. We went from... <laughs> We went from that cute little predictable photograph on the left-hand side, which is great. Grandma will love it. But uh, you know what? That shot on the right there, there's the one that you're going to put a, as a 40 by 60 inch print on your wall. So what I always do, whenever I'm doing a, a portrait, whether it's commission or self-commission, I always sort of do what I have to do to do what I want to do. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I didn't enjoy this ride. I did, but I want to have some fun. So I ended up photographing her. Um, with this gorgeous dress. In fact, this was actually, this was for my wife originally. This is a 40th birthday shoot and I bought this gorgeous dress and um, it's a very revealing dress. That's why I photographed her from behind, but I put her on a pedestal. I wanted to emphasize her shape in a way that almost looked like a fashion drawing that was totally emphasized and it wouldn't be real. By the way, this is all out of camera, no Photoshop at this moment. I haven't had a chance to work it yet. This shot because she's a ballerina, why wouldn't I do something like this? Now, I've got some more shots. They're a little bit revealing, maybe a bit too revealing to, to share on, on this particular broadcast. Not inappropriate per se, but just respecting you know, the platform that we're on. In this case, um, I love the idea we've got the, you know, the, the black left and right, the, as in what they're wearing, and then flanking um, the mum and the wife with that beautiful red dress. And I pulled back a little bit for the background just so I've got something to contain to. The background, you might be asking, what is that background? That is uh, from Oliphant, famously used by Annie Libowitz, and a lot of Vanity Fair covers, you'll see it, and it's a beautiful textured canvas thing. And then you've got um, a fake <laughs> uh, floorboard ground. It's vinyl, and I'm sure B&H saw it as well, so it's really cool. But this is something, again, this elevates. We're, we're talking, today's conversation is about next level stuff, okay? Remember that. All right, let's give you, I'm going to rapid fire some tips at you right now. So if you blink, you'll probably miss it. We said if you photograph a girl front on, you're photographing her at her widest. This girl's not wide, but what did we say? Have the light come at least from the side and turn her body away from the light and her face back in. Now, if she turns her body towards the light, she'll look a little bit bigger and broader. The light's nice on her face, but you want a little bit of finesse. So what do we do? Turn the body away from the light till the shadow on the cleavage in the middle of the dress. We bring her shoulders back. We turn her, bring her shoulders right back. We point her toe, bend her knee, and bend her knee that's closer to the camera, shift her weight back away from the camera, and we get something like this. If she shifts her weight towards the camera, she will look like this, which looks terrible. Look at the difference between, again, I wouldn't even call that shot on the right good. It's just not good. Now, dare am I not saying that shot on the left is award winning. This is more for just instruction. I wasn't trying to get an incredible photograph. It is a simple perspective. Uh, and again, looking at straight front on and then looking on a bit of an angle. So let's go one step further. So what I, uh, I shot a music video recently. So I directed it and posed it and lit it. And um, actually, Jason, my partner, is actually producing this show, very show right now. He did incredible cinematography in this particular music video. Anyway, we shot a lot of these shots with ice lights. So we've got four ice lights with barn doors or barn doors, as you would say in America, uh, in case you don't understand my accent. We've got one light directly behind uh, the girl here. And then we've got the shots, uh, lights on either side, giving us a bit of a rim. And then we've got a bit of a hair light. So I'll show you the shots in a moment. This particular photograph, we've got two edge lights um, and then one light directly above the camera with barn doors giving us a little bit of focus. Now, for edge lights, to, if you, for you to understand an edge light and to see where that is and how that works, it actually needs to be quite bright. It needs to be brighter than the light coming from the front. I love that deep shadow underneath. A lot of people don't like that kind of stuff. I want it dramatic and raw and beautiful. This shot in particular, I love the idea of seeing a hint of him. This was meant to be like a voyeuristic sort of scene in the music video. So there was video within this but I love the fact that he's a suggestion and then you've got her face turned to him and then her eyes are back at the camera. This was photographed, um, I think from memory, with a five by four ratio in camera with the Z7 at the time and uh, with the black and white picture control. Now shooting raw, I can do anything I want afterwards, but it's fun for me to actually photograph in the format and the picture control that I see um, in the finished result, even though I can do anything I want. 
This, of course, he's got this incredible signature hairstyle uh, and side look. This was basically using uh, three lights. We've got one as the hair light from the side or edge light, one proper hair light from behind, and then one on her face. And then, of course, this was the original light source or the original shot that I showed you with the ice lights in particular. So we've, we've been talking about subtleties, finessing, difference between good and great. So let be, let, let's be a little bit even pickier right now. Okay, I'm going to be very picky. Sean, so Sean basically, uh, who's in, featured in that video, on a separate day, there's nothing going on here. Looking at the camera, it's very basic. There's nothing award-winning about this. This is no retouching. It is what it is. If he turns his face to his right, do you see how we've got a little hint of light um, falling just right on his ear? Do you see that? Right there. Boom. It looks a little bit weird. So my advice to you is that when you are photographing, um, like let's say with someone turning their face a bit to the right or left, just either get a, pro get a shot front on or get rid of the ear. The minute we start turning his, like his face towards the light, then that ear doesn't become a problem anymore. Let's go one step further. Do you see how it's quite masculine to turn the body towards the light source and to turn the face as well into the light source? It's masculine. Now you might say, well, what's masculine? He's just doing what he does. He just turned the body towards the light. That's obvious. Watch what happens when he turns his body away from the light source and his face back in with his chin to the outer shoulder. It's very obvious that one looks masculine and one looks feminine. So if you wanted to soften a guy, this is the way to do it. If you wanted to butch up a guy, <laughs> the left is the way to do it. Now, here's another perspective. Negative space behind a subject in textbooks will tell you that's the wrong thing to do. Well, that's just silly. For me, it's, a, it's a, a stylistic choice to have negative space behind the subject because that is, represents mystery. The negative space in front of someone represents harmony. So really, you've just got to choose what you want and go ahead and do it. He looks kind of... Looks kind of like Jamie Foxx, right? Anyway, next, what do we do? Now, watch what happens if you crop a head just before the hairline. Guess what? He looks bald. We've made a really good-looking dude look like he's bald or his head goes on forever. Now, I'm suggesting you either crop into the hairline or, of course, breathing space above it. Or if you want to crop close, um, breathing space above his brow, make sure you don't crop the ear out. But you can see the difference between, I wouldn't even call that good. It's embarrassing, that top left photograph and then a typical portrait there as well. Again, subtleties, look at these differences. Think in, in Australia, we call them one percenters, like 1% 1 here, 1% there, it makes up 30%. Your image could have been 30% better. Okay, this shot, as you can basically see, when you're photographing a profile, you're tempted, well, you're obviously gonna look where your face is pointing, but now you see more of the whites of the eyes, the sclera, it's not good. So I tell the subject, stay where you are, but I want your eyes a bit to the left. So now the difference between this and this is actually quite huge. So now you want to see more iris. You want to see more color. You don't want to see the whites. Look at the difference when you put them side by side. Big difference. You will never forget that for the rest of your career. Boom. Okay. Let's keep on going. So now we've got this portrait. This is a 16 by 9 out of camera. Shot with the 85 millimeter f1.8. Natural light coming through. Beautiful shadow in the background. Watch what happens when he brings his head down and I crop in the wrong place. Watch what happens if I crop the ear, how awkward that looks. Watch what happens when I do allow breathing space above his brow and above his ear and it's cropped correctly. There's a big difference between good and great, right? Let's keep on going. We're on a roll right now. Boom. All right. So now, you, have you ever had someone looking into your camera like this with a bit of a like deer in the headlights type of look and feel? Um, well, we said... If you ask your subjects to give me a hint of a squint, that adds that little mystique and it works well. Remember what we said earlier today, if you drop the chin, then you actually make the whites of the eyes appear larger. Um, but most guys look like a serial killer. This guy is a bit of a come hither look. He's like, you know, he's a bit inviting. Come on, let's get it on type of thing. So you have to work out what you're basically after, the difference between those different things. Remember we said that if you face the body of a guy towards the light, it's quite masculine. And certainly you can cross the arms and do things like that. And you can even, obviously, you can, I call this split broad. We're split lighting him as in light coming from one side, not the other. But we're shooting him on the broad side, the light side of his face. Shooting with light on one side only in profile, very masculine. You do this with a girl, it's going to make her look masculine. So you've got to be careful of that. 
And don't forget, you can simply pop a collar of a jacket, sink his body in, his face in, and now we've got a bit, bit of mystique, a bit of a James Dean vibe going on. If you have someone with a double chin or someone with a little bit of COVID chub over here, hashtag me, eh, you may want to do something like this. It'll soften his face a little bit. I love cropping in close. It just adds a mystique. Now remember, for some people, they think everything has to be in focus. I believe that if you're photographing a person, a portrait, then the eye that's closest to the camera is the one that should be in focus. Otherwise, everything else I'm totally fine with. I'm happy to crop like this as long as I don't, I don't crop the ear. I'm happy to crop like this. Um, for me, a facial feature should either be the, either in or out. Um, that's my rule. Now, imagine if you get a guy sitting down, and if any guy in the world watching TV for more than a minute is going to end up looking like this or, or slouching even further. It's just not very pretty. If you get him to basically sort of lean forward, there's a bit of intrigue. He's interested. The body language suggesting that he's interested in the viewer. The problem is it looks like he's going potty. That's not very good. So turn his knees a little bit. Watch what happens when you drop the knee that's close to the camera and the right knee goes up. He looks awkward still. He's, it's almost, it feels like he's got nowhere to lean. So if you switch it, if you get him to bring the, the, the knee that's close to the camera up high and get him flat footed and bend the knee that's furthest away, it looks better and a relaxed fist. Look at the difference between all of those shots and you can't compare. The shot on the, on the bottom right looks so much better. While you're there, introduce hands. While you're there, crop in close. While you're there, add a little bit of finesse with what he's doing and how he's sitting. Here's the cool thing about the Nikon Z system, the, the camera system. The in-camera sepia picture control is awesome. The cool thing is that, now yes, you might say, well, Jerry, it's raw, I can do anything I want afterwards, but you know, play with the picture controls, you'll have some fun. The, the sepia picture control in the Nikon system is actually a glorified mistake. It's not true sepia. Sepia implies monotone, brown tone. It's actually about 50% desaturated and then a sepia added. So because of his awesome skin, you can see that like, there's something quite not right there. Everything is quite monotone, but this is not true sepia. You can't really tell any color there because he's got dark skin, dark hair. The canvas is already dark brown. So there's a, bit of a, a beautiful vibe going on. So what has helped define my style over the last year or two, I've been playing with this picture style and I love it. Hope to you guys too. What about this? You get a guy sort of squatting down on the ground. This is just awkward. It, it's, it doesn't look right for a guy. If you get him sort of putting one knee up and one knee down, you're shooting into the crotch. It's awkward. If you bend one knee up like this and one knee down, it's, yeah, it's a little bit awkward still. So the way you do it, you don't have to get his knee on the ground because you might dirty it, especially for a groom. That's a problem. You simply get the knee that's close to the camera, bend it up, that will hide a gut if he has a gut. I mean, this guy's ripped, so it's not a problem. Um, but this is how you do it. He looks so much better. Look at the difference between good and great. Crazy, right? You have to work these things out. So guys, I'm gonna share a few more minutes of information um, and a couple of uh, really cool shots to finish off with. Before I do, if you feel I have value, if you feel like you'd like to learn more from me, and I'm, I cut the, the algebra out of photography and literally give you the street smart tips and advice, I'd like to give you something for free. So if you go to jerrygionis.info, um, there's a whole bunch of links to different things that I do and I often give away free stuff. So lately I've been giving away uh, my two hour tutorial on photography tips and tricks. So go to jerrygionis.info. If you see the word free, click on it, boom, have some fun and enjoy the ride on me. Okay, so let's have a look at this. This is Sean again. Now, what I've got basically here guys is that I've got the sun hitting a um, white wall, uh, a, a soft off-white wall. Now, <laughs> if I expose for him, it just looks terrible. Like you can sort of see what that looks like. Does this remind you of something that I showed you earlier? Remember that, that silhouette that we did at the start of the presentation today? So if I expose for him, oh, sorry, if I expose for the background a little bit more, then I see a silhouette strong. You've got that little hint of light in his chest. It looks really, really cool. In my camera, I change my picture style, my picture control to vivid and my white balance to shade. So all of a sudden I go from this to this in my camera. I could crop in close. I could probably do a couple of shots like this and this, but how cool would it be to, be, to do an in-camera multiple exposure? Now, on a separate day, it happened to be in a similar environment. What I did was I had him in the shade, in, 
just in the shade, just short of the sun, the sun hit a white wall, bounced across him, and then I had these little tickles of light on either side of his body. So again, it's something that we wouldn't normally do. We'd either shoot an open shade or maybe full sun, but we wouldn't quite get that perspective. And it's really important that we try something a little bit different. So, all right, let's, let's just move on here. So last couple of moments here of our presentation. Um, I want to show you that, you know, I simply love what I do. I, I, it, there's such a... There's such a beauty to be able to immortalize moments for, for different people. Now, this is actually a fellow Nicolet ambassador, Christy Odom. We had to hike up a, a mountain um, in Virginia for about an hour, and this is basically where we were. Now, the next series of shots, I can't believe I did this, but I was on a, maybe like a three, four foot platform with sheer cliff on the left and the right, photographing for the, for the other shot. And I just said to someone like, hey, when I put my eye to the camera, just be careful that I don't sway and I fall off and die. And even though I said it like tongue in cheek, I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty serious. But then when the drone footage came back, I realized like, if you look at those little dots in the middle of the frame there, as you can see, I realized that what the hell was I thinking? So that's basically um, us there. You got Jason there as well. Melissa was a celebrant for this wedding, but I got that shot out of it. I'm like, well, you know what? I think I would do that for that shot. Um, so I'm very passionate about what I do. You know, I do everything from impromptu, you know, shoots of a, you know, a YouTuber, an influencer. And, um, you know, I had a makeup artist just ring me up and say, let's do something. This is basically off camera flash. Then the sun was coming through my gate. And I'm like, wait a second. If we get you really close to that fence, we're going to get this gorgeous texture on your face, which would look incredible. Lately, I've also been playing with... Um, shooting with performers because I'm, I live in Vegas. So we have access to these incredible performers and unfortunately they don't have work at the moment, but it's allowed me to actually do these kinds of shoots that I would never really be exposed to. And now I'm getting very well known in the community. Um, this is on the dry lake bed. There's, there's two guys, two hand balances. And I thought taking that next step, wouldn't it be cool to bring a backdrop to this environment and have them framed and enveloped in that shot? So I'm glorifying the background not dissimilar to the likes of Patrick de Michelier and, and, um, and Herb Ritz and Annie Libowitz that show the background and even to make them look like they're old school performers, which I think was really cool. Had the pleasure and honor and privilege to photograph uh, one of the original performers of En Vogue. And um, I basically had 24 mirrors in the background and I shine old Hollywood spotlights illuminating on them to give me an idea that she was on stage. And then I had a flex light directly above her in this particular shot. This one, I use an ordinary ring light to illuminate her. And then we use some atmosphere aerosol to spray around and get that beautiful atmosphere going there as well to make it look like that she was gesturing a fan or something like that. One of my favorite shots of recent times was this incredible uh, Zumanity performer turned fashion designer. And we styled her in this incredible traditional African garb with her child and and this was that this one of those shots that you can't sort of stop staring at. And I, I, I'd like to think I have something to do with it. Uh, but really, I mean, she's compelling. The baby's just soft and vulnerable. And you've got the strength of the mother with the weight of the world on her shoulders, so to speak. Um, and then the, the, the beautiful tender nature of, of how she's uh, uh, touching the, the, the skin of her, of, of her mother as well. I want to finish off with showing you a really cool shot of the original girl, uh, Eleanor, from the beginning, the one that I, I showed you. Who, who had a bit of chaos in, in her brain and all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to show you the, the original shot and how it sparked my interest and in how I'm actively always thinking about the end product. So let me show you that little piece of video before we say goodbye. Yeah, that's beautiful too. Looks like a sculpture, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> Gosh, I think this is the most excited I've ever been. That's awesome. Ever been about a shoot. Well. So isn't it great to get that kind of feedback from your client? And then I was looking through the photographs and I finally thought, I know what I'm going to do here. Watch this. Oh, that's beautiful too. Wow, that's actually perfect. Look at that one. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you know what, what I'm going to do with that? I'm going to take, take your legs out and have you levitating, and there's gonna be a shadow of you on the ground. That would be so cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so 
how cool is it to do, to do something like that? And on the day, I knew what I was going to do. Now, I didn't do the post-production myself. I'm like, well, I'll just get it done. But I had the vision for it. But guys, I hope you enjoyed that. That was a rapid fire of information at the last sort of hour or so. And um, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with b and and to present on their behalf. Um, I just wanted to, to share with you that obviously we're living in a difficult time and it's tough. So whether you're photographing a friend or you're a semi-pro or a pro, just hang in there, be patient. We are on the verge of an incredible mini renaissance in our industry. And if you are doing this for a living, there's a, there's a promo that I recommend that you do that we all jump on with and you can copy this and do a screen grab if you like and use these words verbatim in your next promotion. And that is this, in these challenging times, we're reminded of the health, safety and the strength of our bond with our family and friends and the quality time we spend with them is the most valuable thing in life. What better way to celebrate these relationships than a meaningful portrait by, insert your studio name here. I wish you strength. I wish your, you and your family to be safe and healthy. And remember, there's only one thing more contagious than COVID and that is empathy. Make sure you catch that. Remember, you don't have to be the best. You simply have to be better than last week. We'll see you again. Thank you, BNH. BH presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021. The Wedding Day Award, sponsored by Nikon, featuring the Nikon Z5 mirrorless digital camera with 24 to 50 millimeter lens. And the winner is. Smokescreen by Aaron Murphy. Congratulations. Eli Infante is a native-born resident of the Rio Grande Valley who draws most of his inspiration for photography from the unique South Texas landscapes and historical structures. When he is not out shooting, utilizing the gorgeous South Texas sunset as his background, you can find him educating hungry young minds at a charter school teaching none other than, you guessed it, photography. Eli shares his skills and talents with all other eager photographers via YouTube and even in-person workshops across the country. Of course, under lockdown, he's not traveling, but he will be again soon. 
Eli is going to showcase Westcott Lighting, which is emerging as the go-to lighting choice for those seeking professional results while keeping an eye on a budget mixed with portability. We thank Westcott for sponsoring Eli to the stage of depth of field for the very first time. Eli, take it away. Welcome everyone, I'm portrait photographer Eli Infante and I'm excited to be a part of this year's B&H Depth of Field event where I'm gonna be talking about how to creatively use off-camera flash in the studio and on location. Those of you that haven't heard of me or seen my work, I love creating dramatic portraits outdoors using off-camera flash, using different light setups, whether that's a two light setup, three light setups, and even in the studio using four light setups, but I love to include color and texture and creating something interesting no matter what time of the day, whether that be morning, midday, or even at night. My goal for this presentation is for you to see the creative possibilities that you can create using off-camera flash. So no matter what genre of photography that you focus on, whether that be maternity, high school senior portraits, weddings, or even if you're a natural light photographer interested in off-camera flash, I'm gonna to try to make this presentation as easy as possible so that you are not intimidated by using off-camera flash. Before we start, I do wanna thank b &H for organizing this depth of field event, as well as Westcott. Without Westcott, I would not have this opportunity to be presenting in front of you all, so big thanks to those two. And last but not least, my friends, um, I would not be the photographer I am today without my friends, of course. And so teamwork makes the dream work. And so big thanks to Hector, Francisco Hernandez, Marco Gilpas, Rolando Sanchez, and Joe Sanchez. Here's a basic overview of what we're going to discuss today. And that is why use off-camera flash? What is high-speed sync? And that one's important because that's something that I use a lot in my outdoor portraits. And also more importantly, how do I balance the flash with my subject in the ambient location that I'm with. And that's the most common question I get on Instagram and on Facebook. Also trying to remove the intimidation of using flash because at first it can be very overwhelming and I'm gonna try to make that as easy and simple as possible. And then last but not least, we're gonna get into some photo breakdowns. We're gonna look at some photographs. I'm gonna give you some tips and some insight into how I'm seeing the composition, how I see the light in the scene but more importantly, how I style and how I prepare for my photo shoots. Let's take a step back and let's take a look at some of my early work using off-camera flash where I was intimidated because as you can see here, I didn't know how to balance out my flash with my scene. And one of the photographs that has always stuck in my mind is this scene from 2012 where I was asked to photograph a dance. And to play it safe, what I did is I used continuous lights throughout this dance. Up until this point where I was struggling because more and more people, bigger groups wanted to be photographed and my continuous lights weren't able to produce enough light to fill light on the subject. So I decided to try flash and of course I fell flat on my face because I had no idea what I was doing. I threw it up and just did a prayer and basically said, oh man, come on, let me just get the power correct. And sure enough, I overexposed the entire scene. And one thing that I wanna to stress to you all is don't be afraid to fail and suck because it's those moments that allow you to grow as a photographer. Reflect back, think about why this didn't work out. What could I have done to improve? And I could have easily just given up on off-camera flash, but within the past five to six years by using off-camera flash, it's allowed me to see what's possible using off-camera flash, but more importantly, why it's important to use it. So why shoot off-camera flash? What is this going to do for my work and how has it developed my style? Well, shooting off-camera flash has allowed me to create these dramatic skies in camera as well as dynamic lighting. I can use multiple light setups, whether that's a two light, three light, or four light setup on location or in the studio. And of course, with modifiers, I'm able to control the light and shape the light the way I want. And more importantly, I can shoot at any time of the day, whether that's the morning, whether that's the afternoon, golden hour, or even at night. Of course, you're in full control of the scene. You're able to use your artistic vision to create something out of nothing. And then of course, 
you can add dimension and a 3D effect in camera using high speed sync and multiple light setups. Now let's get a little bit technical and let's look at what is high speed sync because that's the technique that I utilize for my outdoor portraits. And you might have a flash or a strobe at home and you're wondering, well, can I use this to create the portraits that you're creating? Can I create that? And one of the things you have to understand is, well, what is high speed sync? Because there's a difference between a flash and a flash that can do high speed sync. So one of the things is that high speed sync allows you to sync your strobes to your camera when your shutter is faster than your flash sync speed, which is 250th. So a traditional flash sync speed is 250th. So what does that mean? What that basically means is that if I have a flash that can only allow me to do a flash sync speed of 250th, if I go faster than that at 320, 400 or 500, what you're gonna see is the shutter curtain is gonna block the flash. So that's where you're gonna get a black bar because the shutter curtain is completely blocking the light coming through, which is my flash sync speed. Now the flash sync speed is different on camera to camera. Some are at 200, some are at 250. But the point is, is that high speed sync allows me to fire off a sequence of flashes as the shutter moves across the sensor. So what's gonna happen is that when I use high speed sync, I'm not being held back by that shutter speed. That shutter speed is now able to go to 2000, 4000, 8000. And what you get throughout the process as the shutter is going through, you get these pulses of light from my strobe, which is your high speed sync, to fill in the subject. Now here's an illustration using natural light, standard flash sync speed and high speed sync. So what you'll notice the image to the left, the natural light, and one of the issues with natural light is that our eyes can expose for both, but our camera can't. So meaning if I'm out there looking at a scene, I can see all the detail in the sky, I can see all the detail in the subject, the lighting is balanced because of our eyes. But when we're shooting natural light, our camera can't because what happens is I either have to expose for the background scene and now my subject is dark, or if I expose for my subject, my subject is ex properly exposed, but now my background, I've lost all of the detail. Now, if I use a standard flash, which is my flash sync speed at 250th, I have to increase my aperture now to compensate because as you know, if I go above that flash sync speed, one, I'm either not gonna see the flash pop because the curtain's blocking it, or I'm gonna get those black bars. And what high speed sync allows me to do is it allows me to balance for both. I can meter for my background and then I can fill light on the subject with my strobe. And by using high speed sync, this allowed me to develop my style to create these dramatic portraits on location and include those beautiful skies in the background. Now that we know what high speed sync is, the next step is to set up our ambient exposure and also to add the strobe and figure out how to balance the strobe with our subject. So the first thing that we need to take a look at is the exposure triangle. We're gonna make this very simple. We're gonna keep the ISO at 100 because when we're outdoors, it's already bright enough. There's maybe some maybe rare conditions where I might need to increase it for blue hour or nighttime or indoors or maybe in the studio, but more often than not, it's gonna stay at ISO 100. Now the next one that we wanna set up is our aperture. Now if you're using high speed sync, the main reason why you wanna use it is you wanna be able to blur out the background with that depth of field. So we wanna be at 2.8 and below, anywhere between 1.4 and 2.8. You decide how much depth you want within that range and set that. So a good starting point is F2, but you can go 1.4, 2.2, whatever you feel comfortable with. Now the key thing is, is this is a question I get a lot as well, is am I in manual mode, am I aperture priority, or am I in TV mode on my camera? And 100% of the time I'm always in manual mode and also on my strobe. Now strobes can use something called TTL, which we're not gonna get into, but basically it's an auto setting that kind of figures out the flash power output for you. I never use that. I am 100% in manual mode on my camera and on my strobe. So now that we have ISO 100, our aperture at 2.8 and below, there's one final ingredient that we need to set up and that is our shutter speed. The shutter speed is very important in this process because the shutter speed allows you to capture your scene. And as you can see here, I have this illustration. 
the faster the shutter speed is going to be based on your light conditions. So the faster it is, that means we're in sun, daylight, and bright conditions. When we get into the middle shutter speeds, it's usually when it's cloudy and shade. And then when we get to the slower shutter speeds, that's typically based on the light condition, like blue hour, low light, indoors, or rainy or cloudy. So the key thing here, and the most important thing to remember is the shutter speed if I increase it, it's going to darken my background ambient. And if I slow down my shutter speed, this is going to allow more light to come through and it's going to brighten my background. And it's important to remember that as you're setting up your shutter speed, that this number is going to be different. You have to look at your scene. Everybody's light situation is going to be different. So decide how dark you want it to be or how bright do you want your background to be so that on the next step, we can now add the strobe into this process. Once I have my background exposure the way I want, I take a test frame and what you're going to notice is now the subject is completely dark. They're in full shadow. And so how do we fix this? This is now where we add our strobe light. Okay. Now this is the important part of why we need high speed sync. We're going to add something called fill light. We're going to add light onto the subject. And that's the big advantage of using high speed sync strobes outdoors is specifically for fill light. What this is going to do is this is going to brighten the shadows on the subject and the strobe is going to fill light where the ambient light doesn't fall. So here's an illustration of what it looks like when I'm taking my test exposure and then when I'm adding my strobe for fill light. Now here's one of my favorite photographs where I captured the dramatic clouds in the background using that shutter speed, increasing it to capture that background ambient. And of course my subject is dark and in shadow and I added that fill light on the subject, keeping the light in the same direction as the sun so that I can still preserve the shadows on the side of the face to make it look a little bit more natural. The next step is to balance out the flash with our ambient, with the power output of our strobe. And the strobes that I love using are the Westcott ecosystem, which is the FJ400, FJ200, and the FJ80. Now I choose these based on my light situation. If I know it's going to be a bright condition, 400 watts is going to be sufficient enough for me to be able to get as much light on the subject. Now the 200 is still great. I can still use it in shade. I can still use it in bright conditions if I want to, but I'm going to be pushing it a little bit to its max. And then I love using the FJ80 for the studio, but also for night portraits, which we're going to get into in a moment. Now, when we're trying to figure out the power output, there's so many factors that go into it. So if you're the kind of person that's like wondering, like, what's your power setting? You have to really think about all of these factors, things like the distance between the subject and the light. Okay. So things like the inverse square law, how you're tilting the light up and down, how you're feathering the light left to right, the modifier they're using, are you using a small modifier, a medium size or a large modifier, and then your strobe watt power. And as I just discussed, there's different power outputs on a speed light, which is like an 80 watt. Then you have a 200 and 400 watt. That's going to allow you to get more punch of light depending on how much power you need, especially when you're in these fast shutter speeds. So typically with this guideline that I have here, the faster the shutter speed that you have based on your ambient exposure, your light condition, the higher the power output you're going to need. And then when your shutter speed gets slower, the less power you're going to need for that situation. And so my best advice is when you're shooting outdoors is to try the different power outputs. Now I don't go out there and do power one all the way to nine. I did this mainly for an illustration purpose, but with enough practice, I've been able to figure out, okay, I can kind of eyeball it and get a general good starting point. Now, if you want to, you can start at power five. So with the FJ 400 series of lights, they go from power one to nine. Five would kind of be like the middle starting point. You can try power five and see and ask yourself, is my subject too bright or too dark? And do I need more power? So increasing the power output will make the subject brighter and lowering the number will make it darker. And if you're wondering if I use a light meter, I've never used a light meter for my off camera flash outdoors. So with enough practice, you'll be able to figure out the power output for yourself. Before we move on, remember there's two important steps that we need in order to create this photograph. Step one is setting our camera settings. ISO 100 aperture between 1.4 and 2.8. That stays the same. 
And then our shutter speed is the important one. This is gonna allow me to get those dramatic skies, increasing it darkens the background and lowering it lets in more light and brightens our background. So we get our background template first. Our subject will be dark. That's okay. We're gonna add fill light on step two with our strobe. And as we bring this in, all we need to do now is just figure out the correct power output, which can be anywhere from power one to power nine. Since we know about how to balance the strobe now and the power output and the settings in the camera, let's focus now on the light position. Now, one of my favorite styles is Rembrandt style lighting because it creates shape, dimension, and shadows. I'm a big fan of shadows and I don't like flat lighting. So in order to create this, I love using the 36 inch Rapidbox Octa M and the Rapidbox Octa L from Westcott. And those modifiers give me some beautiful, amazing soft light. And what I wanna do is I wanna position it 45 degrees to my subject and raise it up at eye level and tilt it down about 45 degrees. And as I'm shooting, what I'm looking for is I'm looking at the shadows and the catch light. So in my Sony camera, I have it programmed so that I have image review turned on. And so what happens is when I take a shot, the image will appear for two seconds and the things that I'm focused on is the shadows, where the shadow is lying on, and where the catch lights at in the eyes. So if you zoom in to the eyes, that is the secret ingredients to tell if your lighting is in the correct position. If you don't see any catch lights, that means your light is too high, raised up too high. If it's barely in the corner, I might need to move it a little bit more 45 and I might need to lower it down. So look at the catch lights because that is one of the secret ingredients in getting the nice lighting. Now, catch lights, if I don't capture them in a photograph, I'm always gonna go for expression and mood, but it's just something to think about when you're taking your photographs. As we look at this photograph, this is one of my favorite photographs to show because what you see is the shadows on the cheekbone. So I'm doing something called short side lighting. And what inspired me to take this shot was that sun bouncing off of the car. And whenever I'm setting up my subject to pose, I like to include them in the environment. So I had her lean up against the car, bend her leg a little bit to add some shape. But more importantly, the position of the light. Because at the beginning, we talked about how do we want to make the photographs balance out and look more natural in the image when we're using off-camera flash. And one of the ways I did this is that I positioned my light in the same direction as the sun because the sun in this specific situation it looks like it was really bright, but it wasn't. The sun was already meeting the horizon. It was already going to fade away. So in order to enhance the sun, but also to keep it more natural, I pushed it in the same direction as the sun, where the direction of the sun was coming from. And I was still preserved that shadow on the cheekbone to add that three dimensionality to the subject. And when I'm setting up a shot, I think of this 360 degree diagram and I have my students do this and I practice this myself because what this allows me to do is study light, but more importantly, study shadows. And it never fails when my students are doing the back lit photographs, they're kind of scratching their head like, why are we doing this backlit situation here? Because now the subject has a bunch of shadows. Because now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into more of the creative setups now. Now we're going to go into multiple light setups and we can mix and match these different combinations to create multiple looks. So a lot of times when I get to a scene, I'll kind of think and close my eyes and figure out where is my ambient exposure coming from? Is the sun adding a rim light? Is there any color, and maybe if I'm doing nighttime, is there any color already acting as a natural rim light in my subject? And can I add fill light and do something called cross lighting, which we're gonna get into now. Let's go ahead and take a look at what my mindset is when I'm setting and composing a photograph. So one of the things when I'm thinking about my composition is that I'm looking for color, texture, leading lines, and where is the ambient light coming from? Where is the sun located? Can I use that sun as a natural rim light if I only have one light? Or is there any opportunities for reflective light, whether that's bouncing off of a car, bouncing off of a building, or bouncing off some windows? And most importantly, is there any interesting backgrounds that I can include 
in my composition and I'm always a big fan of using my surroundings and my environment to set the base for my pose. Now let's break down some of my favorite photographs and look at the different scenarios that I was presented with and the way I approach the way I see my lighting. So scenario one is when the sun's out, whether this is morning, afternoon, and golden hour. And what I want to do is I want to use the sun as my rim light. So my first approach is to possibly use it for cross lighting. So meaning my sun is going to be my rim light 45 degrees behind the subject. And then we use this circle reference. Once again, I can now add my light completely opposite of the sun. So I get that natural rim light with the sun and I only have to use one light 45 degrees to the subject. Then I add fill light. Now in order to capture this scene, remember that I'm using my shutter speed to capture my ambient exposure. But what inspired this photograph was the environment, sitting her on the tree. And as I mentioned, whenever I'm posing my subjects, I like to include them in the environment. And I also like to use props whenever possible. So I bought these flowers because it gives the hands something to do. A lot of times the subjects will tell me, it's like, well, what do I do with my hands? And if you give them something to either hold or up to lean up against, it allows you to be able to get a variety of different looks. And one of my favorite things about this photograph is that this was a photo shoot that I used a stylist for. So using a stylist can help you elevate your work and to make it stand out because of the styling. Now the next look, now because of the cross lighting, you might think to yourself, well, the physics of light kind of doesn't match. I would rather have a more natural look. Well, you can still get that natural look by keeping the light in the same direction as the sun. So let's take a look at a couple of photographs where I'm keeping the light in the same direction as the sun. So this photograph here was in the morning. So the sun's up high, adding that beautiful, nice rim light around the hair. And instead of doing a cross light, completely opposite camera right, what I did is I kept it camera left in the same direction as the sun so that I can preserve the shadow in the cheekbone. So I still want that three dimensional depth. Remember we talked about that, keeping it 45 degrees, positioning it and looking at the shadows first and not so much the light because I like to have my work feel three dimensional. On this next picture, you can see again, the sun is coming in from camera left. So I kept my light in the same direction, camera left once again, still preserving the shadows on the cheekbone but also using that bench to set the base for my pose once again. And then last but not least, keeping the same direction as the sun, the light again, but this time I'm looking at the reflected light in the window. So that's what inspired that photograph was noticing that I could get a reflection in the windows. And then I instructed my subject to lean up against the wall there to keep them involved in the environment. And then as a nice little bonus touch, I was, I got lucky. The wind came in, it was able to blow the hair. And once again, I'm a big fan of shadows. I've said this numerous times. I still preserve the shadows on the cheekbone to give it that three dimensional look. Scenario two is what if I'm in a situation when the day is cloudy, it's gloomy shade or blue hour. There's no opportunity for the sun as my rim light. That's totally fine. We could keep it simple. Do a simple one light setup like I did here. And remember that the most important thing here is the background exposure, getting my ambient exposure first and then adding fill light onto my subject. Now one tip and one of the things that stood out to me with this photograph is work with stylists. Think about collaborating with other people because it can help elevate your work like it did on this specific photograph. The styling is something that I would have never uh, come up with on my own and the stylist Yvette was able to help me out and you can just reach out to people on Instagram or Facebook and see what vision that they can bring to the table to help elevate your work. Mm -hmm. Another option is to use two lights. So in this specific scenario, it's already getting into blue hour. The sun is already going to set and it's already dark. If I just use one light, it's fine. But on the side of the body, it's going to be a little bit too dark for my taste. So what I like to do is I like to add a two light setup to make it feel a little bit more three dimensional and to add shape to the body. So in this photograph, I was using the FJ 400. And as I mentioned earlier, the 36 inch is a great portable strobe for on location portraits. But for my rim light, I use the magnetic reflector that comes with the FJ 400 and I simply attach this and I had to move quick. And so I just got my exposure in, locked it in. 
was able to get that beautiful dramatic clouds in the background and then directed my subject to sit down and then look away so that it felt a little bit more candid. Another example is one of my favorite photographs is one of Betsy and this was like an orange theme in the same scenario. The sun is about to set. I do a two light setup. Without that two lights, the hair would have been completely dark. The arm wouldn't have had that nice rim light. And so I'm using another two light setup and using the same modifier, that 36 inch as my key light. And more importantly, and you guys are probably tired of me saying this already, is I'm preserving those beautiful shadows on the cheekbone because what I want is I want a full tonal range of darks and whites in my image because that's going to help me and allow me to get more depth on the subject. And as you can see here, that this technique I like to use a lot whenever I'm in a low light or I'm in a sage situation, I'm going to add the two light because as a bonus, this is going to add that nice separation and that three dimensionality that I like in my images. And here's a couple more photographs of me using this two light setup. And when I'm setting up and positioning these lights, I set it up in a cross lighting position, going back to that circle reference that I talked about. I have my key light set up first, and then I set up my rim light. And it's important when you're setting up these lights is always start off with one light first, get that exposure first, and then see what your rim light is doing and add that into your photographs. This next scenario is one of my favorites and that's shooting at night or in a low light situation because now this provides me many unique options and even the possibility of using colored gels. Because we're shooting at night, the exposure triangle is going to work a little bit different than when we were shooting during the day with the sun out or a golden hour. Now the shutter speed, instead of it being a fast shutter speed because we were in a bright condition, is going to come down now because we're in a low light situation. So it's probably going to be around 250 and below. The aperture, I, I'm going to be a little strict with this. I do want it to be at the lowest aperture possible on my prime lens. So that could be 1.4 or 1.8. And then my ISO might fluctuate depending if I have background ambient to help out. So that can be anywhere from ISO 100, 200 to 400. But the key thing here is when I'm scouting for locations, when I'm doing my night portraits, is I'm going to specifically choose a location that has plenty of color to work with in the background and plenty of ambient color so that I can use the bokeh to my advantage. And one of the things that I like to use is telephoto prime lenses, lenses like an 85 millimeter, a 105 and a 135. That's going to give me some beautiful compression to help during my night portraits. And one of my favorite strobes to use for night portraits is the FJ80 because it's small and portable. And because I'm in a low light situation, I don't need that much power like an FJ400, even though I can use it, but I would rather go with something smaller and compact. And what's cool about this specific speed light is that it has a round head and it does have a modeling light, which helps because I can use that modeling light for two reasons. One, it's going to allow me to focus on the subject because it's nighttime. I'm going to be able to use it so I can focus and get the image tack sharp. And then number two, the modeling lights is going to give me a preview of what the final photograph is going to look like. And one of the most important things when you're doing night portraits is to think about your background. So think about scouting locations that are going to provide interesting color and some neon lights because we know we're going to blur out that background. I want to have beautiful, interesting color in my background because that's going to help for my composition. Not only is it going to work for as interesting background compositions, but if there's color, it might provide you with a free resource as a rim light if you get close enough. So if you only have one light, use the natural ambient in your location as rim light. And if you're too far away from your background ambient, you can still add a second light as our cross lighting, something that we've already talked about. And so you can add a second light into your scene. Now, when you're using your light sources for these night portraits, it's very important to use a modifier because we want to soften up the light. At least for my personal taste, I don't want hard light for these night portraits. So having a modifier, single diffuse or double diffuse is going to help improve your photographs. Now let's break down a couple of photographs where I set up these night portraits because of the location. So here I'm at the movie theater and so I have my beautiful background ambient. Now, once again, I'm going to use my shutter speed, slow it down to really capture all of that beautiful color. My subject is dark once again, so we're going to add fill light on here. 
But this is a three light setup and this is where it gets fun because now I can add colored gels to these lights. And I love using the magnetic reflector because it's real easy to set up and to attach these colored gels because of the magnets. And I specifically used orange and red in this scene because I'm looking at my background ambient and I already had red and orange in the background. And in order for it to blend just right, I felt like this made a lot of sense to add those two colors. And after I add my rim lights with colored gels behind the model 45 degrees, this is where I'm gonna add my third light, which is the key light right in front of the model, angled up high, boomed down so I can still get some shadows underneath, but also making sure that I preserve some shadows behind the model because when I'm using colored gels, colored gels are gonna show up more in the shadow areas. In this next example, I'm taking advantage of the lens compression. And I talked about this using an 85, 105 or 135 is gonna help for these night portraits because it's gonna really emphasize that bokeh and the color. So I use the 135 in this photograph and I like to add layers of clothing because it gives the hand something to do and to further enhance the lighting. This is where I decided to add a two light setup doing the cross lighting technique that we've discussed numerous times. Now you'll notice that the rim light though is not completely filling in the left side of the cheek. Remember that I still wanna preserve that shadow to give it that three dimensional look. So placing your rim light is very important because we don't want to fill light on the, the entire face because then it's gonna flatten out the face and I don't like that in my work. I still wanna preserve shadows. And so here we're doing the cross lighting, but I'm making sure that my background light is positioned in a way where it's just adding that nice rim separation. In this next photograph, I'm using a three light setup, creating something out of nothing. I'm in this dark abandoned warehouse. There's no lights whatsoever. So I need to use lighting to create the vision that I have in my head. So when I saw the graffiti in the background, I knew that I wanted to add color to really make that pop. So I added a blue gel to my FJ200 and I used the metal reflector. So I'm adding that, sandwiching that together to light up the background. So I, in my process when I'm using multiple lights, by the way, is I'm building it up one light at a time. I don't turn on all three lights and try to figure it out all at once. I'm gonna set my background light first, which is the blue light in the back. Then I'm gonna add my rim light. I'm gonna assign that to B, and I added an orange gel to that one. And once I have that figured out and I get the correct balance using the old method of power one through nine, figuring it out, then I get my key light, which is my main light with the beauty dish. And now I add light and fill light on the subject to get the final results here. And on this last image, I'm in the same situation. It's completely dark. I add my key light, but the problem with the key light is I felt like one light just really, it was just still too dark. I wanted to kind of add a little bit more atmosphere. So I asked my friend Marco to use the FJ80 with an orange gel and to shoot it down the stairs to kind of illuminate the location and make it feel like it's daytime, but also create my own atmosphere and my own twist to the scene. One of the things I wanna leave you off on before we get into the studio portraits is when you're doing high speed sync, one of the mistakes that I used to make was always just doing the sun as my rim light and the light as fill on the face. And then of course doing the cross light. And there's nothing wrong with that. The results look great and it's something that I'll always do, but also think about adding colored gels. When I started adding colored gels, that's when I started opening and expanding my creativity. And I like to refer to it as these LUTs, these lookup tables. And you wanna develop as many looks as possible. So whenever you get into a scenario, whether it's nighttime, it's in the morning, in the studio, you wanna have as much knowledge as possible to be able to create something. And that's what the studio has allowed me to do is I've learned a lot from using different modifiers like the beauty dish, the strip box, and also using reflectors in the studio. So now let's go ahead and break down my process in the studio and let's look at some creative fun setups. As we get into the studio, it's important to remember that for the past couple of years, I had been doing high speed sync, but I wanted to evolve my photography and the studios allowed me to do that. It's basically my playground where I get to try different light setups and use different modifiers. So lately I've been obsessed with colored gels because it not only adds color, of course, but it adds a different mood to the overall image. Let's go ahead and break down two different photographs using color gels and a three light setup. 
Step one in this process is to set up our exposure. Now with high speed sync, we're using faster shutter speeds and we were using the shutter speed to control our background. But in the studio, it's kind of the opposite because what we're going to do now is the shutter speed is going to stay now at 250th of a second because we don't need high speed sync when we're in the studio. We want to stay in the flash sync speed so we can maximize the power of our strobes. So 250th is typically going to stay the same. ISO 100 because I'm gonna, I want the cleanest image as possible, but we also have control in the studio. So the opposite now is the aperture. The aperture is gonna be the one that we're gonna control the most in the studio. And there is no right or wrong here in the studio. It just depends how much detail and how much depth you want in your image. So typically I'm anywhere between 3.5, 5.6, but you can choose any aperture that you feel looks best for your image. And the most important step in this process is to make sure that your ambient exposure is completely dark in the studio because we want to be in full control with our strobe lights. On this next step, this is where I add my rim lights and I work with my rim lights first when I'm in the studio. Because I'm adding color gels, I want to see how these color gels are going to affect the image. Now your color choice is going to be very important. You can either go with a complementary color scheme or you can go with analogous. It's really up to you but decide on your colors because that's going to help affect the mood of your photograph and you can never go wrong with orange and teal but feel free to mix and match different colors. The modifiers I like to use in the studio for color gels are either the Westcott Deep Umbrellas or the Westcott Reflectors. Now the advantage with the umbrellas is that I can still use the magnetic reflector and I can sandwich different color gels in the modifier because it's an open access modifier, I can swap easily different color gels and I don't have to use gaffer tape and kind of just make it an extra step. So it's really up to you. There's no right or wrong. But when I position these, I put these at 45 degrees behind the subject, going back to that circle reference, right? We're mixing, matching different combinations of colored light setups. So when I add these at 45 degrees behind the subject, the most important part is now using the modeling lamps to help get a preview of the final results. When I'm using color gels in the studio, I make sure I turn off all the lights in the studio because I want it completely dark because on this next step, what I want to do is I want to turn on the modeling lights of my strobe. So typically my background light camera left is going to be set to B. The background light camera right is going to be C. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my trigger and I'm going to make sure that I turn them on individually because this gives me an awesome preview of what the final results are going to look like. So now I'm at a huge advantage. And what I'm going to do though is that I don't want you confused thinking that I'm getting the shots with the modeling lights on. I'm still using the strobe to get the final image, but now what you're going to notice is that the skin tones are going to be full of color, whether that's orange, yellow, or purple, whatever colors that you use. But I like to kind of mute those colors. So what I like to do is I like to either use a beauty dish or a small soft box, a one by two. And what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to kind of try to tone down the color on the face because I just want to keep the shadows on the edge or behind the subject because in order to see the color gels, you need to have shadows. So I'm going to use a smaller modifier and I might use a grid. So I'm going to put a diagram here with without a grid. You'll notice that the light kind of spills everywhere. And then once I attach a grid, it really concentrates the light. And what I want to do here is I want to concentrate the light only on the face so that I can still preserve the shadows so that I can see the color gels in the final image. <clears throat> what you're going to notice in the final image is that I used the same light setup both lights at 45 degrees behind the subject with different modifiers an umbrella and a reflectors. And then my key light is both different using a one by two Westcott softbox and then the Westcott beauty dish. Now the only difference is this on this photograph, I wanted color on my background. So one of the big advantages of using color gels is that if I use a gray background, I can now add some color. So this photograph here is a four light setup. Now this one, is now aimed instead of coming right at the subject, I had it aimed at the gray background, which is the savage gray background. And I added a teal gel just to add a little bit of color to the background. So as I mentioned earlier, the studio is just like my playground. I can really kind of mix and match and do so many different light setups in the studio. And I've really been enjoying it. So let's go ahead and take a look at one more photograph. For this final setup, it was a four light setup and the concept for this was just all about having fun. It was really just a test shoot and I had no idea what the final results were going to look like. And as you know, I love using color, 
But this time I didn't use color gels. I found this color powder and I figured I can use this in the studio. Let's give it a test run. This was literally a test shoot. I just wanted to see what we could come up with using this color powder. And for this shot, we're using a four light setup. And for a setup like this, I love using the Westcott FJ400s in the studio because not only do they give me enough power and great recycle time, but you can plug them in the studio and still shoot and charge with the light. So that's like a huge bonus. And this is what I was using here. I was using four Westcott FJ400s. And going back to this diagram, I have two lights at 45 degrees, but this time I'm using strip boxes because I really want to concentrate the light, add some nice rim light behind the subject. I added some grids because I want to control the light. And then the key difference here is I have two front lights, okay? The only difference with the front lights though is that I have one angled up, coming down at 45 degrees, and I have a beauty dish. And then because there's a little bit of shadows underneath the neck, I have a one by two softbox going up to fill in those shadows. I'm not getting rid of the shadows. I still want the shadows there, but I'm just controlling how dark or bright I want those shadows with my one by two softbox. So what I'm gonna show you here is a shot buildup. What does it look like when I only have the key light? What does it look like when I add the fill light, my background light camera left, and my background light camera right? And this is what the final image looked like. And I highly encourage you all, if you are not doing any fun shoots or at least once a month, try to do some fun shoots because this is what kind of results you can get by just playing around in the studio, even though we created a mess uh, at the studio, sorry, Roland, uh, but it was totally worth it. And I can't wait to go back to try it again with a full on concept. One important thing to remember is when you're working with multiple lights is that you work with each light individually first. You don't add all the lights and try working with them all at once. You build it up with light one, then light two, and then light three, and then you get the final results. Never ever go into it turning on all three lights and try to figure it out with all three lights on. Work with them individually and then build it up. Now that I've broken down my process as to how I use off-camera flash outdoors using one to two lights and then going into the studio using three and four lights, there's one important aspect to my work that I noticed when I was looking at my favorite three photographs. And I think it's an important exercise to look at your favorite work and notice the trends. What is drawing you to those pictures? So as we look at three of my favorite pictures here, what I noticed is that there was a common trend with these three photographs and it had nothing to do with the setting, the camera, the lens, or even the lighting. It all had to do with the styling. And my favorite memory from these three photo shoots was the fact that me and my friend Marco went out to either work with a stylist or we personally went to a store and styled these photo shoots ourselves. So paying attention to a little detail like styling can help elevate your work. And that wraps it up, everyone. And one thing that I wanna leave you all off with is that remember that learning is an active process. Those of you that are new to off-camera flash or maybe wanting to get into the two or three light setups, remember that only knowledge that is used is going to stick in the brain. And if you all don't have a chance to ask me a question here in this Q&A, remember that I love helping the photography community. You can reach out to me on Instagram or on YouTube. Just search Eli Infante. Thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of the B&H's Depth of Field. B&H presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021. The Strobe Lighting Award, sponsored by Westcott. Featuring the Westcott FJ400 400 watt second strobe with AC-DC battery, iLight battery kit. And the winner is... Lost Ideas by Richard Johnson. Congratulations.
They've called us. The Hunters of Light. We search for the things that have yet to exist. Challenging the traditions. Foraging through the shadows. Listening for the subtle changes. This is us. We are not as the others are. We do not see as the others see. From the distant shores to the far off worlds. We've made friends with the beasts. The wind. made vows to the land, signed deals with the sky. Now let us write together a new chapter. we found a way for you to save the tax. Have to have the latest Sony camera and save the tax? You got it. Need the new MacBook Pro? It's yours. How about a supersonic high-def telescope? We got you. Meet Paybu. You pay the tax, we pay you back, just like that. b and Oh, and here it is. I am very excited to introduce you to the Surface Book 3. With updated processor options, enhanced graphics performance, and available on either the 13.5 or 15 inch model, Surface Book 3 is the most powerful laptop in the Surface family. So what's new with Surface Book 3? Well, it's all about performance, with both the best battery life and graphics performance of any Surface. With Surface Book 3, you'll leverage the full power of 10th generation Intel Core processors for those pro-grade photo and video editing apps like Adobe Creative Cloud. Or immerse yourself in the latest gaming titles from Xbox Game Pass for PC with the optional discrete graphics card configurations. And of course, multitask between your mission critical apps like Office, Photoshop, and AutoCAD without missing a beat with up to 32 gigs of RAM and two terabytes of SSD storage. Whether you choose the 15 inch or the 13.5 inch Surface Book 3, configure it to match your lifestyle and profession. And choose the best graphics option for you, including the remarkably powerful GeForce GTX 1660Ti with six gigs of dedicated graphics memory. In fact, when the performance enhancements are taken into account, Surface Book 3 13.5 inch is a whopping 50% faster than the previous generation Surface Book 2 13.5 inch. If you spend a lot of time unplugged, Surface Book 3 is a smart fit. It has the best battery life of any Surface device ever. Thanks to batteries, which are both in the display and in the base, Surface Book 3 can deliver up to 15 and a half hours on the 13.5 inch model and up to 17 and a half hours on the 15 inch model. 
Surface Book 3 truly has been designed to power you through even your busiest days. Surface Book has always been known for its versatility, and Surface Book 3 is certainly no different, with both USB Type-C, USB Type-A ports, and a full-size SD card slot. Our engineers have been hard at work refining the build quality of Surface devices for years, and sometimes it's the smallest details that can make the most impact. For example, Surface Book 3 detaches from its base twice as quickly as Surface Book 2. That of course means you can quickly move between the different user modes of Surface Book 3, so that you can create your best work using Surface Pen or Surface Dial. Upload your best videos using the 1080p front-facing camera. Or kick back and use your keyboard and mouse or an Xbox One wireless controller to play some of the most popular and intense games available. So, are you hungry for power? Do you demand that tailored solution for your work? Are you not a fan of compromises? Then take a closer look at the most powerful laptop of the Surface family, the Surface Book 3. This is our green vest. This is our conveyor belt. This is one of our photo experts. This is a brief history of B&H. The year was 1973. The Mets went to the World Series. The first cell phone call was made. And Bleamy and Herman opened a specialty photography shop at 17 Warren Street, New York City. They had a simple philosophy. Be honest, treat people right, and they will come back. Thanks, Irving. Also, free candy. And it worked. Over the next 20 years, we expanded and moved to West 17th Street then 34th Street and 9th Avenue, and added more products. Lighting, binoculars, telescopes, audio, video, tripods, computers, printers, mobile, televisions, projectors, drones, and even more free candy. Now it's three stories and over 400,000 products and over 1,000 employees. We take millions of orders online and ship to 179 countries and counting. You can talk to us in person, on the phone, BNH, can I help you? or online. Check out our checkout baskets. Also check out our checkout numbers. Also check out the flare on Marais' vest. And everyone's favorite part, our conveyor belt. The benefit of the conveyor belt is you don't have to worry about the product or schlep it around anymore until checkout. Nice. These are the owners. They still come to work every day. They're around here somewhere. Anyway, this is Jeanette. Oh, sorry, she's busy. This is our warehouse. This is Yakov and Levy fighting over lighting kits. B&H is not a chain. B&H is open every day, except Saturdays, of course. Now you know almost the whole story. We are B&H.
J.B. Selly and his wife, Viette, own and operate the award-winning Selly Photography Wedding and Portrait Studio. J.B. and Viette love traveling the globe, photographing weddings and portrait sessions for happy clients. J.B. and Viette have won the coveted WPPI Grand Award with one of their wedding albums, as well as several Kodak Gallery Elite Awards, Kodak Gallery Awards, and Fuji Masterpiece Awards and the second most awarded photographer of WPPI and grandmaster of WPPI. That's a lot of awards JB has won. Now JB prides himself in quality of imagery and the stories that they tell. B&H has sponsored JB as he travels, spreading his wisdom and expertise. Of course, we did that when it was safe to travel, but it's JB's first time presenting here at Depth of Field and JB is sponsored by Seagate. Now I love his presentation as is timely and fun. He is sharing not one, not two, not three, not four, but five nuggets of wisdom to help you grow your photography business. Welcome JB Sally to Depth of Field. Hey guys, this is JB Sally from Dallas, Texas. I want to thank B&H for hosting this event and also LaCie and Seagate for sponsoring. We're going to be talking about five golden nuggets for photographers today. We only have 30 minutes together, so I'm going to get right to it. We've been using LaCie for years and years because uh, we love their rugged hard drives, but we also love their, uh, their bigger dock stations. The best thing about LaCie that a lot of people don't know is that they work hand in hand with uh, Seagate and they have a rescue data recovery service that's included in many of their drives. So look for that little label on the front, which means if you purchase a drive, if it fails, they're going to recover the files for you, and they're also going to give you a new drive. So that's a great warranty to have. During the presentation, we're going to be giving away some hard drives. So text LACI to one 669 902 to enter the contest. I have a stack of hard drives to get give away, so enter there so you can win. So we are Salif Photography from Dallas. We were established in 2003. It's just my wife, myself, and we have three little daughters. Uh, we are a true mom and pop business. 2005, we purchased a storefront. So we worked out of our home for the first two years. This is our, our little storefront in Las Colinas that we call our gallery. And this is our location. We shoot a lot of our sessions in Dallas, Texas, or Las Colinas, Texas, within Dallas. And it has pretty little backdrops like this. We photograph our clients and set up some pretty light and sell them wall art and album. Here's our studio on the inside, 854 square foot. Uh, we have a TV for presentations. We only meet with potential clients for weddings and portrait sessions, and then we'll meet them again after the session and sell their session here. They'll sit on the couch. We direct from the chair. We have a fireplace set up back here, mainly to show off bigger wall art so we can sell uh, wall art. One thing I heard years and years ago from a presentation was, if you want to sell it, you got to show it. We also show off some awards that we've won over the years just to add to our perceived value. So number five for five golden nuggets for photographers, gain new clients. It's very important to not be a starving artist. So here's a way to gain new clients. Even though we've shot 18 seasons of weddings, not every single wedding client is going to come back to us for portrait sessions and keep our business going. So it's up to us to gain new clients and keep our business thriving. Great way to do it is through contests. This is a contest we did uh, last holiday season, a couple months ago, a free holiday mini session, some wars around the fire mini sessions worth $150. We advertise this on a Facebook group of moms in Flower Mound, Texas. We said, fill out this form for a contest to win a free $150 session and it caught fire. We had 197 moms fill out this form, and this is what our Facebook post looked like. Just a couple little pointers. Never post a link out on Facebook because Facebook doesn't like that. They want people to stay on Facebook and see all the advertisements, obviously. That's how they make money. Next one, upload a screenshot. You know, it looks like this is a link out, but this is actually just a screenshot we added up. And next is look for the wow. If you get 88 comments, that's pretty good. We want to move this to an actual event. So here's how we did the contest first to gain some phone numbers for text marketing through Buzzy Text. And here's the, uh, the comment that's actually down there. It said, read the comment below on how to enter. So how to go organically viral. 
says, please leave a comment below after you enter the contest and tag two moms that deserve a free holiday session and share the love. And here's the link to enter. So here's the some more mini sessions we set up with a little campfire. And the biggest thing for this mini session that made it successful, we set up an experience for the families so they could come out, be safe with the pandemic going on and do roasting marshmallows for 15 minutes. And we took their pictures. It was fun for the dads, fun for the kids. Everybody had a good time. We got some, some pretty pictures. So from this campaign, I spent uh, $50 on Facebook and then $5 on the text marketing that we used. It was Buzzy Text. Uh, just Google them if you're interested. And we brought in $33,000 off 134 sessions. So a good average, $245 for a mini session. And we met a lot of happy families in our zip code. And we're going to keep building on that relationship as we keep going year in and year, year out. And proof is in the pudding, just to show that I'm a speaker that speaks the truth. Here's all the sessions we shot. So within 13 days, we shot 10 sessions a night. And this is uh, the proof right there. Number four, framing and composition. Right now I'm on a 50 city tour of the US helping photographers in each city, 10 photographers max outdoors. Uh, I bring the pro photo gear and the strobes. We set up some models to show up and wear the so trendy accessory gowns. Uh, it's SEW trendy accessories. You got to check out their dresses. And I'll be sure to mention when I see a couple dresses. Anything flying with beautiful colors, that's a so trendy gown. And we love their gowns. One thing I'm noticing from the attendees, they're just like I was my first few years in business. I shot everything vertical, very tight, crop, and bullseye composition. I didn't really know any better. I didn't know to zoom out and shoot landscape and back up a little bit and include the environment into my shot. So here's what we're shooting nowadays for our clients. This is a client from Dallas, Texas. They flew me out to Washington, the state of Washington, we went to Olympic National Park. And for two days, I photographed this couple. First day was engagement session, which, which is uh, regular clothes. Day two was their wedding gown and tux. And both days, Roy, the groom, was just skipping stones and having a good time. So for the very last shot, I said, Roy, just go over there and skip some stones. He thought I was just photographing the bride, which we have a single light setup that was stuck into the sand. And then I photoshopped the light source out later. I instructed the bride just to look out like she was looking for Roy. I told Roy to skip some stones, which you can see right there. Out of 4,000 images, what do you think their favorite image was? It was this one. I called it Skipping Stones. I even set a title to it for him. Why do you think they like this so much? Because as the bride said, this is us. I'm constantly looking for Roy. And Roy's always being the funny guy goofing around. I have to reel him back in. So this is their story. It's their conversation piece. When their friends come over, now they see a pretty shot of a national park and not just a, a grip and grin, vertical, tight crop, bullseye composition. So this is how we're selling wall art. We're including our clients into a piece of art. Here's another image. If you're gonna shoot bullseye composition, make it kind of fun. I love a three by one ratio. Our clients love it as well. You know, putting the client up into the sky where they're not just bullseye and tight crop. Including the city is always fun. Help tell the story and the placement, including uh, monuments as well. It's great to do. 15th of a second time exposure. So we could add a little movement into the umbrella. St. Martin wedding with the bride under 747. One of my bucket list shots. I've always wanted to shoot a bridal session with a 747. And I finally got to do that. And no Photoshop. This is all shot in camera. So just different compositions, you know, more extreme composition, placing the subject within the bottom right place in the aircraft is the subdominant element that actually kind of takes up and takes over from the bride. This might now be the dominant element. Prada Marfa, I love including uh, uh, art pieces like this. This is an art installation piece in Valentine, Texas, and just fun to shoot on. I've been out there twice now for a photo session. My grandfather used to live out here, and before he passed away, he said, Jonathan, I want you to photograph one of your beautiful bridal sessions here one day. So I've done that a couple times now and every time I'm thinking about him because he introduced me to art. He's the first person that gave me a camera and the confidence to go out and, uh, and do what I wanted to do. And this is my daughter in Iceland. We took a trip when she was seven years old. It was supposed to be a two day trip and it ended up being a 12 day trip. I made a mistake and went to the wrong side of the island during a storm of the century that got us locked on that side of the island. So we had to drive all the way around on very thick ice uh, for 10 more days to get back to the airport. But because of that, we got to see this little black church that's famous. It's painted with black tar, so it doesn't erode from the, the heavy storms on the side of the island. And she walks up to this little cross 
and uh, she knows the story of my granny that helped raise me. Uh, my granny passed away two months before our first daughter Brinkley was born. That's seen in this picture, and she asked me, "Is this your granny?" And I told her, "No, sweetie, that's not, that's not my granny, but that's probably someone else's granny." And she goes, "Can I pray for someone else's granny?" And I go, "Of course," as I'm tearing up. I go, "But let me get the camera and a strobe first. And I ran over and, and shot this shot. And it was just one shot. It took five seconds, and uh, it's a great memory. This is hanging up in her bedroom now on her wall, so she remembers that trip. So incorporating subdominant elements." Uh, different compositions is nice, and the subdominant element, of course, being the church and the cross, more crosses, and a moon in the mountains. All right, number three, use at least one off-camera flash. This is one thing I've noticed in our industry. A lot of people are photographing available light, which is great. It's a beautiful look, but it's nice to mix it up and have a strobe to light up your subject sometimes. So if you're going to have one strobe, I recommend the Profoto B10 Plus 500 watt second and then attach an OCF beauty dish. It brings the power to 333 watt second. So you wanna have the bigger strobe to push more power to soften the light. That's what I tell people. So this is a great start. Here's a session we shot Thanksgiving for one of our Dallas families. We photographed their wedding and now we've been photographing their family for the past uh, 10 years. And here's a one light setup. And then we light the other side and Photoshop, I take the light out. And then this is their 24 by 36 wall portrait that they have hanging in their house. One light setup, this is at a workshop. Nobody wanted to go out there, so I carried the model out there, put her on a rock, lit her up myself, and then we finished it like this. So just that one light to make something really dramatic to drop the exposure of the backdrop and put light so the exposure is correct on the subject. This is kind of fun to use a one light setup, 90 degrees off camera right. And as you see, we have the sun back here acting as a kicker, and you'll see in the finished shot that kicker actually lights up her hair. So if you're gonna use a strobe, it's kind of fun to use it extreme off camera right or left, turn your client's face into the light and also use the sun as a second light source. Here's the image, shot about 15 images of this. This is my favorite, shot left, shot right. Photo merge these in Lightroom and get something like that. We're looking for that pretty Rembrandt light. And you can see that hair light from the sun is just beautiful. If you don't have the sun, you can mimic this. Let's go back, set up another strobe with a gel on it back here out of the shot and then have that come in as the kicker. I would probably put it over here, camera left, 135 degrees off camera. And you're probably asking yourself, why am I shooting three images in photo merging? It's because we sell large wall art and I don't wanna take this image and crop it, which I could easily do and make a pretty image. I wanna add pixels to the left and right. That way we have a very large image that's crisp. If we print this on acrylic, it's gonna look beautiful and it's not gonna be soft. Another image, single light source, looks great. Extreme off camera right, 80 degrees. And this is on a snoot. Trying to control the light as much as possible. You'll see I missed just a little bit, but the client's not gonna notice that. And I can clean this up in Photoshop if I need to. One light source off camera left, behind the bride with a OCF beauty dish on there. And I love the beauty dish because it's 24 inch and that light will wrap around and fill the shadow side as well. So the light source is actually acting as the main light the fill light and also the kicker because we have 24 inches of light pumping through at full power. You can see the spread up here just a little bit, which is nice to help separate. If you're not good at photo finishing, check out Jonathan Penny. We've been using him for years. Love his work. This is one of his finishes. Uh, I sent him the raw file, said, can you clean this up, make it more timeless looking and uh, put a little uh, finish on it to darken a vignette. And he did that. This got a 96 in competition. Single light source, where's the light source coming from? This is kind of fun, I call this silly magic light. I've been trying to coin that for years and it's not really taking on, so we'll just call it magic light. So again, we got the sun back here as the kicker. This is her veil, dyed black. One of our past brides that went into a coma for three months when she woke up, her husband uh, had left her. So this was rebirth session for her and this is called Until Death Do Us Part. And we framed this up in our gallery as a 50 by 25 canvas to show people you can frame your art and put it on your walls. All right, flip the Sunny 16, single single light source. I love doing this. I'm shooting with the Canon mirrorless R right now and I have the 28 to 70 2.0 lens, so I can shoot F2. So instead of shooting Sunny 16, which would be F16, 200th of a second, ISO 100, I'm gonna flip it and go F2, 4,000th of a second, single light source low, aiming up high to light up her eye sockets. And what's that do? We get shallow depth of field in camera. So I love this lens because 
It gives me that really beautiful look. I don't have to do this in Photoshop so I can save the time. Here's a little video for you guys from the Salt Flats. All right, on three. One, two, three. Perfect. Perfect. All right, I've got the camera on the ground. And you'll notice the light source. I have the main light in the same direction as the sun. So why am I doing that? Most people, I was trained in college to fill the shadows with the strobe, right? I'm actually adding more light so I can shoot this at f22, 200th of a second, ISO 50. And then I have a kicker back here. I like to cross light. And the kicker is mainly for the dress panels. Also, the dark hair will show up a little bit. And this is just a, an umbrella that's broken down just as a, a prop. So again, I pick my favorite shot and I love putting the camera on the ground to get the client up into the sky and also get all that great crunchy detail of the salt right there. Get my shot, you can see this is shot 15. Shot 16, I pan left and shoot. I don't refocus. I want that same depth of field to be consistent with each image. Pan right, you see I have a little clip of each dress so that Lightroom can clip on. And there we go. And this is Lightroom. You can see it messed up a little bit right there. So we got to watch out for that, but we can correct that pretty easily. So easy to do. I have a ton of pixels and now I can print this very large. All right. Once you master a one light setup, move to two. So you've seen a couple of my favorite lighting setups. Uh, the last one was 45 degrees off camera, right? 135 cross lit. There it is once again. So you can see cross lit and I'm lighting the bright side of the face. Here's another favorite. This is 90-90. And I love putting the beauty dish in front and the Magnum on the back, 90-90. A little uh, pro photo hack. Put a Magnum on the back of your strobe. That way, just in case it does fall over, it's not going to ruin your strobe. It's just going to bend up your Magnum a little bit. That saved us a lot of times when the wind will gust up. There is the image finished. Two light setup. And you can see this is just done in camera. There's not a lot of Photoshop work to this. You know, that's the actual shot. And then I take a plate shot with the light source and the holders out of the shot, erase the lights, and there it is finished. Two light setup. We're 45 degrees off camera left for our main light, and then 135 right for the kicker. So same lighting setup as the one at the salt flats. Loving that. And then move on to three light setup and do some gels and like I like to say, MacGyver it. Have fun with it and uh, play around. You know, if I have something that's green, I'll throw on some green gels and light it up with a green gel. Same with red or blue. And then I put a single light source on her face and do a little movement just to make it fun. Three light setup, Orlando, 180 degrees behind, because I couldn't put it over here, 135 and 45. I call this double drama. If you go 45 degrees this way and then 45 degrees up high, now you're getting, getting double drama on the light source as the main light. And there's the finished image. You just got to bring that chin up so it lights the sockets of the eyes. And I love doing the sunny 16, sunny 22 approach to get that starburst effect in camera. So this is the shot straight out of camera. You can see the sun was moving a little bit. So I just moved it back. No big deal. This again is that so trendy accessory gown. And all I did down here is just liquefy just to cover it up a bit. All right, five golden nuggets for photographers. Number two, offer products, not just digitals. This is huge. If you don't want to be a starving artist, you got to have some nice products to offer. Again, this is our gallery space mainly just to show products. This is from Bay Photo. This is a G Clay 40 by 40. And you can see up close this beautiful torn watercolor paper with a Barnwood frame. Love this. Uh, here's our Queensberry albums that we love so much and our clients do too. And here's some 20 by 20 canvases framed with a white washed Barnwood frame, which are beautiful. So I have this up strategically. 140 by 40 is the same cost as 420 by 20s. So what do you think I'm going to sell to our clients? Am I going to try to tap them out with 140 by 40? No, I'm going to try to book four sessions. Let's say for maternity, I'll book the maternity session, newborn session, six month sitting session, and then 12 month family session with the baby. So now I'm selling four sessions, four experiences with us for the same price as one session. So we've learned over the years, don't tap out your clients. Really just try to get them to book more sessions up front. That way you can uh, keep seeing them throughout the year. You want to be their go-to photographer. Imagine if you tap them out with a large wall portrait from Trinity, the baby's born, they're 
they're like, we don't want to spend that much money again. They go use somebody else. You'll never see them again. It's happened to us. All right, this is our Whopper product. We talked a little bit about this uh, beforehand. We want to have a Whopper product. This is our Whopper that we put up probably 12 years ago. It's a 60 by 20 acrylic. We never expected to sell one at $2.50 a square inch. That comes out to $3,000. But what we found was people loved it so much because it was unique, they found a way to buy it. We're like, oh my gosh. So we've sold hundreds of these 60 by 20s throughout the years just because we have it to show. So what do you do if you sell your Whopper product? You make a bigger one. So now we have a 96 by 32 above our door. Uh, I think I have a slide of it later that I can show you. We don't expect to sell it, but if we do, hey, it's a great day. All right, a little golden nugget for you guys if you photograph pets or newborns. When my wife photographs a newborn session, I'll go up to the baby and measure the baby, and I'll call back and say, the baby is 15 inches. Why am I doing that? So when the parents come over for the previous session, I'll mock this up for them and say, hey, if you purchase a 60 by 20, I've made the baby exactly 15 inches life-size when we photographed your, your newborn so that every time you walk by with your newborn in your arms, you can see how much she's grown. This works. People get emotional, they're like, oh, that's such a great idea. If $3,000 is too much, we can easily crop this as a 20 by 20 and keep the baby 15 inches, and we can work it in Photoshop to keep that baby the same size so we can accommodate their budget. Products, albums, we love selling albums. They sell themselves. I don't have to be a salesperson. I can just be an artist and a photographer. I lay out the products in front of people. They say, how much is this? I say this one is 125 a page, the smaller size is 95 a page, the Whopper album is 225 a page. So we have a good, better, best philosophy that we work for our albums. And we love Queensberry albums because they have all the products we need to do good, better, best. And they have a duo album, which is beautiful. If you can see here, this is the same design. And the duo does a combination of flush mount and matte, it, which these are hand laid in there on fine art paper and it's just gorgeous. It's the only album company in the world that we found that does this. So this is how we sell. We say this is 125 a page, this is 225 a page, minimum 20 pages. As you can see, the bigger 18 by 10 book, you have more space, we can fit more images if you want, or you can leave it more fine art like this. So they have the choice. So a lot of people will have this included in their wedding package with us and then they'll upgrade to this because it's such a, a bigger, more beautiful album. Whopper product, this is our duo. Uh, we sold a $12,000 album just by having this sample. A guy walks in with a disc of images from his wedding in Mexico and says, hey, my friends photographed my wedding with a cell phone. Our photographer didn't show up. Can you take these cell phone images and make them beautiful? I said, yep. I sent all 300 images to Jonathan Penny. He made some black and white. He touched up the colors to make them more beautiful. Sold a 50-page Queensberry album, 18 by 10, just because we had the sample. And I didn't even shoot the wedding. That's the best part. So if you do the math, 50 pages times 225 a page, and then he bought three uh, duplicate flush mount albums, minis for the parents at 750 each. So that was a pretty good holiday season. And again, if I didn't have this to show, I would not have sold that. I would have sold the smaller book probably. So if you show it, you can sell it. If you'd like to start with Queensberry, I have a special for you guys. Text QB to 1-888-669-0902 to receive an auto reply with more information on Queensberry, and I will gift you with 50% off your first sample album. Don't just get a flush mount, get a flush mount and a duo just like I showed you. Have a match so you can show your clients exactly the difference with the same images per page. And Queensberry will design this for you, which is really nice and it saves us a ton of time. All right, number one, just be different. Sounds easy enough, but you know what can you do in your career to be different from the competition? This is what we did at a bridal show once. We printed out a thousand t-shirts for future trophy wife, and they had to come in and take a picture with us. We had a thousand out of 2,000 brides walking around with our t-shirt on. I, I'll never forget, the other 34 photographers would come up and say, you guys, we hate you, but just kidding, we love you. <laughs> and we just kind of laughed it off because, you know, we look like the competition, but really, we can only book 35 weddings a year. That was our max back then, now it's 12, so. We said, hey, don't hate us too much because we can refer all these weddings to you. And we made really good friends with all the photographers at the show and also the vendors at the show. We got their attention just by being a little different. Next one, be different. Don't just print one image on a card. Print six, eight, or ten different images and then have the information on the back be the same and drag people into your booth. Uh, if you're doing craft fairs or balloon fests or bridal shows, this is great. Drag them in and say, hey, we're just curious. What's your favorite image? We're taking a poll. 95% of the brides would pick this. 
Nobody picked this one, Message in a Bottle. Highest scoring print at WPPI five years ago with a 97 and won all sorts of awards, but brides don't care for it because it's too dramatic. They don't think they can fit that, that mold in their wedding day. 1% would pick this card. If they picked up this card, the fine art card with the little bride running in the dunes, that was my bride. And only five to 10 brides would pick this up a show, but I would get their number, get their name and say, hey, I'm gonna call you tomorrow, is that okay? I wanna to talk to you about your wedding because that's my favorite image too. And we'd book these weddings. So why are people, why are brides picking this up? Because it's fresh. They like the windows, there's a little puppy in it. They like the little storytelling. But again, we're going for the brides that want the fine art. Uh, an album that we put into a bridal show to drag in moms that have fancy purses, and it worked. And if you could figure out a way to be different and drag people into your booth without bugging them and throwing cards in their bag, that's a great way to start a business relationship. A little camera that I own, just shooting down into this camera and being different, and clients love this. They actually uh, ask to make sure I don't forget to bring this camera because they want to they wanna be photographed with it. Uh, promotions and marketing, be different. Instead of just marketing mini sessions and trying to book 10, do a contest and try to try to book 50. We did this a couple years ago and we're in the middle of doing this right now. And we're booking 50 sessions at $99 for the contest and they get one digital file for the social media. We'll take those 50 favorite images, put them on our Facebook and popularity contest, whoever gets the most votes or likes, they win $500 credit towards us. And with our cost of goods, that only costs us 50 bucks to run a huge contest that's gonna bring in uh, thousands of dollars for our business. So call it a contest. Don't just call it a mini session. One, two, three, go. Three-light setup. As I'm traveling the country, I'm asking all 10 attendees in every single city, I said, how many times do you think a photographer has come to this exact location with a beautiful red So Trendy accessory gown and tossed it up in the air and lit it up with three strobes? And they all say, never. I go, that's exactly right. It's probably never happened. So if you want to stand out in your city and you want to be different, bring three strobes. Yeah, it's going to cost you some money, but if you're invested into your, your business and you're doing this for a, a full-time career like we are, it's an investment and it makes your images stand out and you get something like that. So just a wooded area in Houston and I'm, I'm trying to do anything to be different and show attendees how to do the same thing for their business. A session for this couple in this castle in France. Uh, they were getting married and they went out and found these outfits. I was in town for a workshop and they said, hey, if we find some outfits, will you shoot something of us? Because we've never had a portrait done. And these are all of his ancestors in these paintings. They actually lived in this castle before him. So with that story being told, I said, okay, I need to make sure that I light these ancestors up. So this is an 11 light setup with some Photoshop work, light painting, and just making something beautiful and different. And it's like his ancestors are, are looking in with approval. Same castle, 37 light setup. Uh, just challenged myself to be different and make something I've never done as a composite. I went around for four hours lighting all the windows, the inside, the candelabras. Uh, there's no lights on the outside of the castle, so I gelled these with up lights and spent some time to make this neat little composite. And there's all the images. If you want to be different with me, come, uh, come out to our workshop. I'm on a 50 city tour this year. Go to salephotography.com, it's just our last name, S-A-L-L-E-E -E, photography.com. I always do some international workshops every year, and then I'm doing a 50 city tour this year, and we're having a good time. It's outdoors, 10 photographers max. I bring the pro photo gear and the strobes and transmitters and light shaping tools. I have some models show up for us and put on some of those beautiful So Trendy accessory gowns, which I have 20 different colors with me, so it's a lot of fun. And we make some art together, and we learn off-camera lighting, we learn posing, and we learn some marketing tricks as well. Uh, Scotland, France, New Zealand, and Santorini is always a beautiful workshop. I've done, that, I've done that a couple times now. So hope to see you at a workshop very soon. One more thing and then my presentation's over. We're doing a camp for photographers this year called Camp Fire. If you want to text Camp Fire to 1-888-669-0902, it's going to give you an auto reply with information. And also, if you just want to chat with me, text that number and say hello. It's always me at 7 a.m. on the computer replying back to text. Uh, that's our, our buzzy text system that we love. It's great for communication where it's both ways. You text me, I text you back, and we can have a conversation. So hope to see you at Campfire. It's near Austin, Texas. Check out the information. We're going to have some great speakers. 
and it's a very, very low price for three nights, includes all accommodations, food, and uh, we're gonna have a great time just being together and learning together. So hope to see you there. Thank you again for tuning in to my presentation. Thank you VNH and thank you Lassie Hard Drives and Seagate for sponsoring this. And I hope you guys picked up some great golden nuggets. Take care. BH presents the Depth of Field Awards 2021. The Elopement Award, sponsored by Paybu. Featuring a $500 BH gift card. And the winner is. The adventure begins by Eric Frank. Congratulations. At B&H, we found a way for you to save the tax. Have to have the latest Sony camera and save the tax? You got it. Need the new MacBook Pro? It's yours. How about a supersonic high-def telescope? We got you. Meet Payboo. You pay the tax, we pay you back just like that. B&H. Raphael Concepcion, otherwise known as RC, is an award-winning photographer, podcast host, educator, author, and digital post-production specialist and adjunct professor at the Newhouse School for Visual Communications at Syracuse University. An Adobe Certified Instructor in Photoshop, Illustrator, and Lightroom, RC has over 20 years of experience in creative IT and e-commerce industries, spends his days developing creative content for corporate clients, educational institutions, and students looking to expand their creative horizons, as well as depth of field. RC is also a highly sought after public speaker. And I've had the pleasure of meeting RC at many conferences over the years. He embodies professionalism and imaging and is a pioneer of sorts in the field. RC is sponsored by Microsoft Surface today. And let's welcome RC to the stage at depth of field while he shows how to do perfect workflow in the field as we are locked out of our studios and producing our work in the world around us. Hi, my name is RC Concepcion. I am a photographer, director, author, Adobe expert, storyteller, and I teach at Syracuse University. Workflow is extremely important. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is get you out there and making more pictures. So the choices that you make from the cameras and the devices and the techniques that you use are usually just set up so that you can work as fast as possible. And this class is going to get you doing just that. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that I think that's important is that you leverage a lot of the stuff that you have from your camera standpoint. I'll show you something real quick. So on your camera, whenever you use this, most modern cameras will have this. So I would recommend that you take a look. But if you look right here, inside of this camera, I'm using this is the Fuji X-T3. Most modern cameras will have the ability to set a rating. If you look inside of a menu, you'll find a section inside of there that will allow you to set a rating. Once you do that, you can click on the rating section and you can add a star rating locally on the picture and click OK. Now, why is that important? A lot of the times when you are on the scene and you're making pictures and you're doing all that stuff, sometimes you have a really good idea of what you're looking at and you're like, that's perfect. 
That's exactly what I wanted. You may as well take advantage of your ability to know that at that moment in time. You don't want to come back and have 2,000 pictures that you need to go through and then be like, well, which one of these is the picture that I'm looking for? So making that judgment right at the point will take that process substantially. And I think that that's the key with what we're working with here. So very simple. Check your camera if it has a rating. If it does, make sure that you're using that right at the point of capture. Now, once we have that set, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to grab my card and I'm going to ingest my card. And what I have here is I'm using the Surface Book 3 from Microsoft. Now, one of the things that I like about this is that it has a built-in SD card reader right on the side. So I can go ahead and take this card and insert that card right inside of my device. Going inside of Lightroom now, it automatically brings up all of the images that I'm working with here. So there's a couple of things that you can do right inside of Lightroom to be able to make this easier for you as well. You'll notice that right now by default is setting it into the pictures directory. I'm a big fan of choosing my desktop, right? I place everything on my desktop and then I call and whittle everything out from there. The next thing that I do is I usually put everything inside of a subfolder and I'll give this a shoot name. So let's just call this dog shoot. And this isn't really the one that I'm going to be working with for now, but I'll go ahead and type that in here, dog shoot XT3. And now I have that all set. Another thing that I think is important, I almost always like putting everything into one individual folder. Right? I think that that's important. So it's put into the desktop, it's put into one folder, that's pretty much good to go. Things that you should keep in mind. Now, inside of here under file handling, you'll notice that you have build previews and they're set for embedded in sidecar, minimal and standard and one-to-one. -one. If you need to be able to work on stuff faster, you can always just set yourself up for minimal and that's good to go. So minimal will allow you to be able to import faster, one-to-one -one will render those bigger previews and then during the culling process, it makes it a lot faster for you there. Knowing those two differences I think is key. Now that I have that set, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna go to file renaming and I'm gonna set my renaming of the files. Inside of here, I almost always like creating a custom template for naming my files. I don't like the fact that it does it one, two, three. I like using 001, 002. And I also like using individual names for the shoots. Then I also want a series. So there's three things that I wanna be able to do that by default you're not gonna have inside of file renaming. But let me show you this. Inside of your template, notice that there's a bunch of different options that are here. I can select edit from the list and inside of here, you have the option to change these tokens. So what I can do is I can just delete all of the stuff that's here in the list. Now, from here, I want to be able to put in a custom name, right? And I also want to put in a date. So maybe what I'll do is here under the additional, there's a section here called date and it has month, day, year, year, month, date, all these different options that are available. I'm going to use this one for year, month, date. And I'm going to put in a dash. And then I'm going to put in a descriptive text for this. So I'm just going to use my custom text field. Insert that. Hit a dash. From there, I'm going to go ahead and put in a sequence. And the sequence number that I don't want is a, not a single digit, but I'm going to use a three digit. So now it's going to be the date, something that I put in that's custom, and then dash 001, dash 002. This is perfect. So for me, what I'll do is I'll come over here and I'm gonna save this as a new preset. And I'm gonna call it RC import preset and click on create. Now that I have that set, I can click on done and notice that there's the RC import preset and I can come in here and under this, I can put in a custom name and I can call this card shoot. And notice that it adds that right there to that list easy enough. Things that are very, very important, I think, to do. Now, during the apply during import, there's a section here called develop settings and there's a section here called metadata. Make sure that you put in your contact information and metadata information and creator information right off the bat. I'll go ahead and go under the metadata presets and notice that there's nothing that's there. I'm gonna select edit presets from the list. Now inside of here, 
we can go ahead and put in all of the information that we want. And the information that I would tell you would be this information here, your creator information. I don't have to put in an address, city, state, but I do recommend that you put in your email. You put in your website, obviously you want people to be able to find you. And then right from inside of here, there is some other information that you would put in, like I would put in copyright. 2021 copyright status. I would set it to copyright and then inside of usage, I like to just put in something like all rights reserved email rc at about rc.com for more for licensing info. And then I'll put in the copyright info. I usually put in my website again. So that's information that you want to be able to do quickly. You don't want to do it after the fact. You don't want to do it when you're exporting. Just take care of all of that stuff now. Makes it a lot easier. So once you have that set, I want to save that preset in the future. I don't want to have to do this over and over again. So I'm going to click right here and I'm going to set that setting as a new preset. And I'm going to call this 2021 copyright. Now that I have that set, I'll go ahead and click on create and then click on done. So now all of that information is set. And if you had any specific keywords that you wanted to add to this, this would be a great place for you to put that in as well. But now that we have that done, I can go ahead and click on import from the list and it'll take all of this information and it'll import it right inside of Lightroom. Now there's times where you would have images at different locations and you can transfer these over to this machine. I like using USB-C drives and I like them to be solid state. So I'm gonna use the USB-C connector that's on the right hand side of the Surface Book 3. That'll go ahead and it'll open that up. And notice that right here I have a folder called Fuji Cuba. I'm gonna grab this, I'm gonna drag this over to the desktop. What I wanna be able to do is just work through all of those images and get a process so that I can get the very best images out of the take as fast as possible. And that has everything to do with your ability to be able to set up collection sets and collections right inside of Lightroom. So right from inside of here, we have all of the images that we set up previously for the import. And very important, you'll notice that the images that we flagged as five star images all already appear there. See, there and there. Makes your job pretty easy. Now, I wanna do a couple of different things here. I'm just gonna right click here and I'm gonna select solo mode so that I only see one panel at a time. I'm gonna show you something real quick that I think is gonna be very important for you. Whenever you have a shoot, there's images that you know you're gonna to wanna to keep and there's images that you're gonna to wanna to get rid of, right? So you wanna be able to kind of sort those out as fast as possible and then go back and take a look at those pictures very quickly. So let me give you a quick workflow tip here. A lot of the time for every shoot that I do, I create a collection set. And inside of there, I create a series of collections that then I can use to be able to sort my images out. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna create a collection set. And I would think you should call this a dummy collection set. Now, from here, I'm gonna click on create. Notice there's a dummy collection set right there. Now, from here, I can right click and I'm gonna create a collection. And I would create a collection called all images make sure that it's inside the collection set and I don't want to include any selected photos. I'm going to make another one and I'm going to call this rejected images. I'm going to make another one right inside of here and all I'm doing is just right clicking right inside of there and I'm going to call this picked images. I'm going to make another one called to edit. And then from here, make one more and I'm going to call it edited pictures or I can I'm going to call this final pictures and I have that set so now I have all of these different collection sets how does that apply to what I've done here well take a look at this I have all of these dummy collection sets now this is a good workflow thing right I want to be able to separate all these things out so right now during the import process, I have previous images of 44. The moment that I put in the Cuba pictures, that's gonna change, right? So I'm not gonna have one spot where I could see everything. So it's a good idea for you to organize yourself very early here. So right now I have this dummy collection set. Now I have this sample card shoot that I brought in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just gonna click on this and I'm gonna make a collection set and I'm gonna call it uh, XT3 shoot. 
right? And I don't have to make anything else for that. Click on create. So now I have one here. I don't wanna have to do these over and over and over again. So watch this. Single click on the first one, shift click on the last one, highlights all of them. If you're on a Mac, hold on the option key and drag, or if you're on a PC, hold on the control key and drag. In no time at all, it's made a set of collections and you don't have to type those in over and over and over and over and over. It makes it a lot easier. So now I can go back in here under my previous import and I can take a look at these pictures, right? I have a couple of portrait shots and then I have some sample shots that I did through here and I can move these around. But right off the bat, I already know that I have some pictures that I've done as five star shots. So I can go into the attribute section and I can say, well, show me all of the five star shots. Not bad. Do a command and control A, and then from inside of here, I can open up the collections. I'm just gonna right click and uncheck solo mode so that I can see both of these now. And I'll grab these and I'll go to, to edit. Now I can turn this off and I can go through the process of marking these pictures are picked as rejected. And that brings me to the next part of the workflow. Right inside of here, we have a section where we talk about previous import. It's a good idea for right at this point for you to just stop and take a look at the pictures and say to yourself, well, is this a picture that I would need for consideration or is this picture completely off, right? Once you make those selections, you can then go back and start making those selections a little bit more fine tuned. So do this now before you take a look at anything else because it makes it a lot easier for you to find the best pictures quickly, right? What if you only need four pictures? You don't wanna have to start going through and hunting and searching through the entire process. You could probably do that a lot faster during the culling part of the process. That's what this is. Get rid of the stuff that's bad, keep the stuff that's good. So from in here, I'm gonna double click. I'm gonna look at my first picture and what I'll do is I'll do a shift tab to get rid of the interface. And all I want to do is just use four keyboard shortcuts. X is going to mark a picture that's rejected. P is going to mark a picture that's picked. And then the left and the right arrow keys will move me left and right of the images. I can hit the letter L to dim the interface. I can hit the letter L again to turn off the interface. And now I can go, well, is this a picture that I want? No, clearly it's a picture of a person. Hit the letter X. If it doesn't advance, go all the way to the very top in this one section here and under the photo, you should have an option here called auto advance. Now when I hit the letter X, move to the next one. Is this the one that I want? No. Is this the one that I want? No. Is that what I want? No. Is that what I want? No. Go through this process. Nope, not the pictures that I want, not the pictures that I want, not the picture that I want, not the picture that I want. Yeah, maybe, hit the pick, I don't know. If you don't know, if you have to stop for half a second, hit the right arrow, go to the next one. Nah, yeah, I'll keep it. Yes, I'll keep it. I'm not sure. Right arrow, skip it. Nope, don't want it. Nope, don't want it. I'm not sure, skip it. And you wanna do this this fast. Pick, mm, not sure, skip it, definitely not. Nope, nope, nope. Yeah, that's good. Nope. Nope. Now, hit the letter G to go to the grid mode. Hit the letter L to turn on the lights. Shift tab to bring up the interface. You're back to normal. But what you've done here is you've immediately gotten rid of all of the stuff that you know is supposed to be bad. And you've gotten some images that you're like, I want to consider later. So that is the first iteration of this call. Now, there are a whole bunch of pictures that you've skipped. That's what we want to take a look at next. So under the attribute section, inside of here, I know that I've done those five stars and here I've seen all of the pictures that I picked, click it, turn it off. Here's the pictures that I've rejected. Those are rejected, click it, turn it off. But I want to take a look at the pictures that I did not mark for review because those are the pictures that I would have to take a look at next in this next iteration or the next series of culling. But you can go through these pictures faster because you've already done this once before. So you have enough context to take a look at these pictures. Now I'm gonna do the same thing. Shift tab, double click, hit the letter L to dim the lights, hit the letter L to turn it off, and I can go, well, do I like this? No. 
Do I like this? Yes, I do. Nope. Yes. And you go through this process. What I would say is you want to make sure that you're spending this time going through this because what happens is a lot of the times on your workflow standpoint, people spend an inordinate amount of time going, is it that one or that one? That one or that one, right? It's like an eye test and you don't want to do that. Once you get to a gray screen, shift tab, bring back your interface, hit the letter L, brings everything back up and you're at zero. No photo selected. That has everything to do with the fact that you've taken all of these pictures and you've assigned them a rating of either rejected or picked. Hit the backslash arrow on your keyboard and that brings up this flag and see you have no photos filled, picked here. I'm gonna uncheck that, grab my rejected, select all, throw those into my rejected, and then when there's no flag available, do a select all, bring these right inside of here. So now immediately, I know that I have all my pictures. I know that I have all my pic pictures. I know that I have the pictures that I've rejected. I know I have the pictures that I want to edit. Not a problem. So that's a process that you want to be able to do here. Now, watch this. What I want to do now is I want to be able to import those pictures from Cuba. So I'm going to import these. And in this instance, I want to go onto my desktop. And inside of the desktop, I have all of those pictures. I don't have to create a new folder for them. I don't have to create a new collection. But the good part about this is that once I have these set, I can add my copyright information right from inside of here. I can click on import. And now all of that information comes in and is stamped with all of the information that I want from a copyright. That's a big help. Now, for the purposes of what we're doing here, I've gone ahead and I've imported the Cuba images and I grabbed all of the dummy collections that I had inside of here and I moved them into a collection set called Cuba GFX images. Now, remember to do that, single click on the first one, shift click on the last one. If you're on a Mac, hold on the option key and drag, or if you're on a PC, hold on the control key and drag. So now I have a series of images and I have the images that I want to work with to edit. Now, if you take a look at this first picture here, I'm gonna hit the letter D to go into the develop module. You'll notice that I've already done some editing to this. So there's some stuff here, right? If I go ahead and I just reset this and go to the before, that's what it looked like before. I'm gonna do an undo. And now I've added some more information. I don't wanna to have to do this over and over to all of the images that I have in the list. So if I single click on the next one that's in the series, notice that there's no changes. I can make it a lot easier for myself because I know all of these images are similar by just going over here to the previous button. That previous button will take all of the stuff that you've done previously, click on that, and it applies all those settings really quickly. But here's one step further. Once you have all of the changes that you want from there, just hold on the shift key and click on the last of the images in the series that you wanna be able to correct You'll notice that right now, instead of seeing previous, you'll see sync. Click on that. It brings up a pop-up window that shows you, all right, well, what are the things that you want to be able to sync? I could either check none and have nothing synced, or I can check the individual things that I want synced. So for me, I want to make sure that I have process version and all of the information in the basic tone. Clicking on the synchronize button, all of those images now, if you look down the list, have automatically been corrected. It takes all of the settings from one, copies all those developed settings to all of the other ones, and now you're working so much faster. Now, let's go ahead and move into Photoshop. More often than not, if you wanna be able to do really, really minute changes, Photoshop's gonna be the program that you're gonna work with. Let's go ahead and take a look at one of these pictures. I'm gonna grab this one right here from the list, and I wanna take that one into Photoshop. Now that I have the image inside of Photoshop, let's go ahead and start doing some editing. Almost always, all of the editing that I'm doing for color and tone and things like that, I would do inside of a layer mask. So I'm gonna use adjustment layers with those layer masks. I'll give you a quick way to do that. Right here, I have the layers panel set up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pull this out so that we can see it a little bit better. Now that I have that all set, I'll make it a little bit bigger here. And let's just say that I wanna start working with some brightness of the picture. To do that, I'm gonna click on the black and white cookie right there, and I'm gonna select curves from the list. Now, it looks like nothing happened here, but what it did is it took an effect. There's the effect right here, and you can see it in the properties panel here as well. 
and there's a mask that's applied across the entire thing. So if I were to go to my properties, I'm gonna pull my properties out so you can see it better. And inside of here, if I were to click on the center part and drag it down, notice that the entire image becomes darker. So that's the adjustment that I've made across the entire picture. Now from here, what I wanna do is I wanna be able to take that mask and invert it. So the easiest way for me to be able to invert it is to highlight the mask and I'm gonna to go to image, I'm gonna to go to adjustments, and I'm gonna to go to invert or command and control I. Now I have the option to be able to brush in whatever it is that I want with this. And you can brush in with your pad, but oftentimes I think it's a lot better to be able to use the same gestures that you would use with a brush. And that's where I think using a pen is something that's extremely helpful. So let's go ahead and just make this a lot easier for myself to do this. I'm just gonna grab here and I'm gonna move my palette back over to this one section and I'm gonna move my properties panel right up here. I wanna be able to see both of these. So now I have my mask here is set to black and I have my brush selected by hitting the keyboard shortcut B and I have a color of white. Now I'll go ahead and I'll use my pen instead. So inside of here, notice I can come over and I can just click right here and I can increase my brush size and I can go ahead and I can paint into a specific area to add some darkness to the picture. All right. I can take this a step further by using the option key on the keyboard and I can do a right click and then just increase and decrease the size of the brush as I'm working with it, right? If you're on a Mac, I would hold on the actual control key and the alt key and then drag to the left and to the right. So that will allow you to be able to increase and decrease that brush size. So now using this, I can go in here and I can make this a little darker, bring this in right here. And now you have a lot more control of how you want that to work. I'm gonna say, well, I want that part right there. So that's looking pretty good. Let's just say that I wanna do something else. Let's just say that I wanna be able to make something brighter. Well, inside of here, I'll go ahead and I'll click on this and I'm just gonna use my curve section here and I'm gonna grab this and make this brighter. Control I will go ahead and invert it and now I can say, well, in these sections right here, let's grab this, make this a little brighter here, leave that a little brighter here. I want that one part brighter here and I can just go through this and edit right on the fly. And the good part about this is that now using the pen makes it a lot easier for me to be able to do this and I can do this anywhere. So here's one last trick that I want you to know. Let's just say that these areas that I have here under these curves, I like a little bit darker, but I want them to be a little bit more saturated. Well, from inside of here, I can go ahead and click on this and I can add vibrance. Now I'm gonna grab my vibrance and I'm gonna make my vibrance quite a bit, but I only want that in the sections that I've already darkened, right? Or at least I wanna be able to use that as a head start. So this is what you can do. Notice that right here you have vibrance and then you have a mask right in that area. The mask by default is already covering everything. You don't wanna to have to redo a lot of that work. So now I'll go ahead and go hold on the option key, click on that mask and just drag it right on top of here. Once you drag it there, it says replace layer mask. Because I'm holding on the Alt key, I can just click on yes, and it takes a copy and it puts a copy right there. So all of the effects that you had in this one section are now in this one area, and you can go inside of here. I'm gonna hit the letter D to make sure that I get my default foreground and background. I'm gonna swatch to black, and then I can go in here and start moving this around. So the pen allows you a great amount of control. Two things that I think that you should add to this. In this one section right here, you have the option to take that pen and you can adjust the pressure for opacity as well as having it build up almost kind of like an airbrush. So that'll take the tool that you have in your hand and you can really go in here and you can start working and going, all right, well, I really wanna pull some more information out of this one section here, all right? This is something that you would normally wait until you get home to be able to do, but because you have a pen and you have something that's touch sensitive, you can get all your edits done right on the field, which I think is a really big thing. Now that I have that done, I can do a Command S for saving this, and then I can close it and return back into Lightroom. We're back inside of Lightroom, and there's my edited version. I'll take my edited version, and I'm gonna move it into my final pictures. And now I have an entire set of pictures here inside of my final that are ready to go.
Now, one of the other things that I like about this is that you can work on location with all of this kind of stuff, but you could take it even a step further. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to press this button right here, which is going to allow me to be able to detach the entire monitor from this. I can get and I can take this off and turn this around and put this like this. And now that we have it detached and removed, we have a tablet experience where now it's a little bit different. Right? You can come inside of here and you can go, all right, well, this is an image that I want to work with. This is an image that I want to work with. And at any point in time, I can go, all right, well, this picture right here, I want to be able to do something with that. And right from inside of here, I can start working the exact same way that I did before, adding those curves, bringing those down. Once I have that there, I'm just going to go to my adjustments. I'm going to go to my invert. And now using this same brush, now you're working directly on it to be able to do some stuff. So that's the change that I wanted to do there. Chances are I want to be able to put in some sort of photo filter and really slowly make some changes for this picture. The way that and I can do this pretty much anywhere. Again, save all this information. Now I'm back inside of Lightroom and can continue to work from there. What's even better still is I can come right over here detach this even further and pull this out and I have an entirely different experience altogether because now I can just use this just as a tablet and this could be a great place for me to just go out and this entire thing I can now take and present to clients with a completely different interface. So I think that this kind of flexibility is very important and I hope that these tips and tricks will make your work faster. Thank you very much for watching.